Oh, bless you. Thank you, dear brother in battle. That was wonderful. Honestly, I appreciated it immensely, and I hope everyone else does as well. Uh, I want people to get to know the people that I'm working with uh, so much better, and I want people to know them as people, uh, because, of course, uh, uh, our man, uh, Pavel Pravara, uh, he is the uh, individual without whom this would not be happening. Uh, so I definitely uh, want people to get to know him, which is, of course, something that uh, other affiliates in the past have refused to do, which is expose themselves to the public in any way, shape, or form. And, of course, always relied on um, myself to essentially uh, be their front person. And this was because they were uh, highly suspect people and they had very negative backgrounds. Uh, there is, of course, a uh, – anyhow um, – um, okay, cool. Our, our man, Daniel Arola, uh, our other brother in battle, who I absolutely must have on in the very near future. Uh, he's someone who um, is going to be watching uh, Full Metal Alchemist now. And of course, that's recommended. Many of these anime are. I will actually be touching uh, inescapably uh, my own personal influence on uh, much that has go been going on for decades in manga and anime when I speak to a post that was published by Peter Moon. And uh, it, it's something that uh, it just brings up an enormous amount of just backlogged information that I essentially am going to be forced to regurgitate tonight only out of a sense of obligation. And uh, it's uh, important to get out of the way that tonight is International Holocaustos or Holocaust uh, Memorial Day. And uh, this, of course, is something that uh, is taken advantage of by the uh, Jewish population worldwide, uh, not simply in Israel, where this is a major event. And uh, they, of course, drag in the entire world diplomatically into their Holocaust Memorial Day. And uh, in Britain, of course, where such things are uh, just massive, uh, what you have is, of course, massive surveys being conducted to make certain and everybody is in lockstep about the Holocaust. And of course, uh, uh, many people are not. And uh, this is something that is very unsatisfactory to both the British and American governments uh, that uh, one out of 20 people in both England and America do not believe the Holocaust happened. Uh, one out of 12 people believe that the Holocaust was quote unquote exaggerated. Uh, and, of course, uh, the uh, Jewish uh, community in the United States uh, and in England and worldwide uh, in the Jewish diaspora, I would hope, appreciate the fact that I have been fighting Holocaust denial uh, for, for uh, ever since I've uh, basically outed myself as a public informant. And uh, but of course, it's not like uh, I get any uh, uh, any acknowledgement or any appreciation for it <laughs> from the Jewish community whatsoever. And uh, probably there is uh, the um, feeling towards myself uh, in, in, in much of that community of resentment that I um, expose the fact that the Holocaust was actually far more uh, encompassing than the uh, Jewish population uh, makes it out to be via, of course, their narrative, which is to dismiss uh, the other six million, the other half, uh, whom by their own sense of exclusiv exclusivity are deemed not to be real, really Jewish. Uh, and that, of course, I find utterly repugnant, uh, the fact that uh, Jewish people feel that uh, you're Jewish only if you um, inherit your Jewishness through the matrilineal line, uh, and therefore um, everyone else who is just born who's uh, of some level of Jewish ethnicity is, however, not part of the Jewish culture, not part of the accepted Jewish community. It is, uh, I'm certain they have some kind of name for that. I'm certain they even have a derogatory name for that. Uh, I'm not interested enough in Jewish culture to find out what these, what these terms are. And uh, I bring up the fact that 12 million Jews died in the Holocaust. This is by Nazi records. This is by National Socialistish records, by Third Reich documentation. Uh, and it is something that the National Socialistish, uh, that the uh, Nazis of the Third Reich, the NSDAP, the National Socialistish uh, Deutsche Arbeiterpartie, the National Socialist German 
Workers' Party, was quite proud of as an accomplishment was making uh, Europe Judenrein. This is why I titled, and this shall be the title when we publish the archives of this episode, this is why I titled this episode Mission Accomplished. Uh, so uh, the National Socialist mission on the surface world was entirely accomplished. That war was won. Uh, which was the eradication of European Jewry. Uh, the Americans uh, make it sound like they lost the war. There was absolutely nothing the Americans, the Soviets, or any of the Allies could do to stop the Nazis from killing every motherfucking Jew in Europe. Okay, And I use that term to emphasize uh, the National Socialist feeling uh, towards the Jewish community. Now, those that survived, were the collaborators who went on to build Israel. And uh, these are people who owe their very national existence to Nazi Germany, to the Third Reich, and of course are still juicing uh, post-war Germany, the German people, uh, for a uh, crime, quote-unquote, that they never committed. Uh, they are entirely innocent of it because it was a national socialist action, which was covert and kept from the public. This is a fact. The overwhelming amount of Germans had no idea what was going on in concentration camps that had converted to extermination camps. Most of those were outside of the boundaries of Germany uh, at any rate. Certainly Germany as it exists today, or certainly core Germany. Uh, these were overwhelmingly in Poland and Eastern Europe, uh, set up under Reinhard Heydrich, specifically so German people would not see or have access uh, to these facilities, the extermination camps. The concentration camps, on the other hand, the labor camps, which were not death camps, did work people to death, and they worked them to death in very large numbers, and uh, very massively so, uh, as the war progressed. The German people who lived those near those facilities uh, had their own problems to worry about with massive bombing, with uh, feeding their families uh, in a life of day-to-day uh, -day deprivation. Uh, their, uh, their cares were for their own. Uh, they did not have the uh, intellectual or emotional energy to invest in what was going on in uh, facilities that were in area which had nothing to do with themselves any more than Americans cared about, of course, Japanese being interned or various other people being interned around them, any more than British cared about Dutch people being interned, Boers, African, uh, Dutch Afrikaners uh, during the Boer Wars uh, under Winston Churchill, or cared about the 100 million Asian Indians who died during uh, Winston Churchill's uh, forced starvation of Asian India in his scorched earth policy against uh, the Asian Indians in uh, Eastern Asian India uh, on the eastern half of the subcontinent uh, supporting the Japanese during the uh, Japanese invasion of Asian India, which is a, uh, a historical fact of which no single fucking American that I've ever met, including academics or teachers of military history at military academies, ever even goddamn knew. So if you speak to British people about World War II, and I've gone over this in the past ad nauseum, as I'm going to have to go over so many things tonight that I've gone over in the past ad fucking nauseum, uh, I've gone over the fact that if you speak to British people and you talk to them about the World War, the Second World War, as pertains to the Japanese Empire. Almost not a single Brit is going to think very much about the Pacific Ocean. It will be very, very peripheral to their memories as a culture of World War II involving the Japanese. Their memories will be of CBI. And Americans will say, what the fuck is that? Because Americans don't know shit. So CBI, motherfuckers, is China, Burma, India. That's an acronym. Uh, the only people who will know about it are people studying in depth, academically, into World War II, who will discover this acronym when researching a man who no motherfucking common American has ever heard of, Vinegar Joe Stilwell, General Stilwell of the United States. There is an entire book Highly recommended by Barbara Tushman or Tuckman. I've never discovered nor care how to pronounce the term. Surname spelled T-U-C-H-M-A-N. 
Barbara Tuchman wrote The Guns of August, which everybody knows who has any peripheral understanding of popular history, a book about World War I. She also wrote a book called Vinegar Joe Stillwell and the American Experience in China, or Stillwell and the American Experience in China. A uh, highly accessible book, very legible, very readable. Uh, read it uh, front to back. Get yourself some fucking education. And uh, that will give you some more in-depth understanding of politics in China. It's probably the only motherfucking book you'll ever fucking find on <laughs> a war in China. Uh, of course, you'll find others, but they will not be popularly accessible. You won't be able to buy them for 10 cents and uh, pay 5 to $25 on shipping, uh, as normally happens with these uh, rip-off affairs. So uh, all of that, of course, uh, will give you some understanding of the China theater. And you still won't know about the Japanese invasion of India by reading that book. <laughs> so the only people who know about it are the Brits. And to them, their version of Leningrad and Stalingrad, Stalingrad and Leningrad will be the more popular uh, term, uh, would be Kohima and Impal which are two cities in ancient India, one spelled K-O-H-I-M-A in the anglicization, the other spelled I-M-P-H-A-L in the anglicization. And Kohima and Impal are the Stalingrad and Leningrad of World War II for the British in the Asia-Pacific theater of war. Now, they use the term Asia-Pacific they have been working very hard with Asian India, which dominates the Commonwealth of English speaking nations to create the geopolitical term, something stupid like Asia Pacific India these days to try and include the Indian Ocean into American geopolitical considerations. They couldn't have done this at a worse possible time. Uh, we have a functional illiterate and I'm not using that casually. Donald John fucking Trump cannot read. This has been proven. He has been handed documents to read in public. And he cannot read them. He cannot motherfucking read. He is functionally illiterate. This is not an exaggeration. This is not an imposition. This is fact. You have a functionally illiterate in the White House now. Uh, he has no idea. Of, of these terms, uh, cannot popularize them, unlike uh, Barack Hussein Obama, who, of course, had an attorney's background and as a litigator uh, could, of course, use terms like pivot Asia and uh, popularize them. And even a white trash mafioso like William Jefferson Clinton could utter sound bites with great conviction and enough charisma uh, to sell them. He was a natural born salesman. He could sell ice boxes to Eskimos, as they used to say. That's a very racist comment. I shouldn't even say that. <laughs> uh, but uh, this is what they used to say about people who were persuasive. Clinton had that. He had that. Uh, okay, this, this is individual Trump has nothing. The only people he can appeal to are white trash pieces of shit, are colored coons who are trying to suck white ass. So uh, this, is, this is what you've got right now. Uh, it, it does all come back to that at the moment. I do have to cover briefly some debriefing on current affairs in that regard. But um, when you take a look at the British, they think of World War II as the war in India going into the war in Burma. And they think of Burma as their Vietnam prior Vietnam, prior Malaysia, uh, even more so than Malaysia, they look on Burma with a memory of pain. It pains them to remember Burma. But that was their World War II against the Japanese. All took place in Burma while they were trying to fight back against the Japanese empire and reclaim uh, that part of India to reincorporate into the Raj. And they failed miserably. After the atomic bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, the British were in full fucking retreat. They were handed their ass by the Japanese. And they were burying entire wings of super expensive, brand spanking new Spitfires, not even assembled. 
literally shipped in theater, disassembled, and in grease wrap. That in, in their shipping crates were never even open. They had to bury entire wings of those motherfuckers to keep the Japanese from capturing them because the Japanese were on full frontal advance in Southeast Asia after winning all of China and defeating the Americans in China and winning the fucking war. Which all brings us back to what I have to get back to because of an asinine post from our good friend Peter Moon. And uh, so all of that gives you some hint of how little you know. This is what the British would think of World War II. Americans know nothing of this theater of war because it was such a disaster, such a catastrophe, such a total loss. The Americans attempted to bomb Japan out of India. It was called Operation Matterhorn. You can look this shit up. Operation Matterhorn. Look it up. It crashed and burned. They were entirely unable to reach the Japanese home islands out of India. Destroyed by Japanese anti-aircraft fire and interceptors all along the Chinese theater of command. Uh, they were able to reach, at times, barely, greater Manchuria to bomb the Manchurian Empire, the Imperium. Never got to the Korean Peninsula, either from India or from the Pacific, to bomb the Japanese manufacturing plants for atomic bombs at Konan Complex in northern Korea. And that's, uh, of course, known as Hongnam in the uh, Korean language. Japanese anglicization from the Japanese language would be spelled K-O-N-A-N, Konan Complex, the largest industrial complex in all Asia. Three rivers were dammed to provide hydroelectric energy to that complex. The Yalu River, the Chosen River. I don't even consciously remember the name of the third river. They provided enough electricity to Conan Complex alone, which was in constant use for their manufacturing of uranium bombs. Uranium was seething. It was coming out of the ground in Northern Korea. North Korea's major industrial activity is mining. Mostly what the North Koreans mine, aside from coal and other primitive like uh, elements that they use for heating, etc. Most of what they mine is uranium, so they can build atomic bombs. Japanese did that before them, opened up all the mines the North Koreans are still using, built the uranium bombs, which the North Koreans have been building until this point in history, based on World War II Japanese era technology, using World War II Japanese nuclear processing plants to refine the plutonium into fissile materials. So that's why the North Koreans are always bomb blowing up World War II era bombs. Now, recently, of course, they've upgraded to some extent. All of it's speculative. No one knows what the fuck is going on in North Korea. Uh, but in general, they have tried uh, to do such wonderful things as uh, blow their own volcanoes. They have a sacred volcano in North Korea that they've tried to get to erupt by the use of nuclear weapons. And uh, so they can go into that some other time. Would have gone into that years ago on Revolution Radio had it not been for the politics uh, preventing me from even going into it under a certain uh, asinine agent of controlled opposition named Mike Ringley. So uh, all of that, of course, brings us uh, to more immediately uh, after getting that out of the way, uh, whatever launched me onto that uh, particular tirade, it's quite relevant to everything I have to discuss tonight. Uh, and tonight is going to be a treat for people who are new listeners, for people who have no idea of the historical reality, which I've been exposing for years. For myself, this is going to be a painfully long slog through everything I've been covered and exposed years ago. And it's utterly a waste of time in so many respects and yet absolutely necessary in so many other respects. It's something that had to be done. Uh, and I thank Peter Moon for forcing it upon us. I will, of course, publicly ask him uh, to never do it again. <laughs> and, uh, we'll get into that as the transmission progresses. Now, a shout out to people who we genuinely like now that we're getting to the bottom of the hour. 
Solar Return of Sarah Shields. Uh, hug and a kiss to the grandma and Sarah Shields. I did a birthday e-card for her. Uh, had a wonderful response from oh so many people. Uh, one of them, uh, the grand madam, Carolyn Cotier, shout out to her. She said of that particular uh, solar return e-card to Sarah Shields, as dedicated unto the grand madam uh, Sarah Shields. She said, oh, this is one of my favorites. I love this one. That's per Carolyn Cotier. Uh, and I bring her up with a shout out and mwah, hugs and kisses to her as well, because we will be tending to her uh, subjects that she brought up uh, about vampirism later in this narrative. I'm sorry, I have to giggle there for a second because of something I'm not going to bring up <laughs> that I was discussing with Pavel uh, prior our coming live, prior our going live. Uh, mm. At any rate, with uh, what was done by our um, dear friend Carolyn, which she brought up the vampire subject, I will be addressing that. And, of course, I want to um, give a shout-out as well to um, Shade Black, who asked uh, that I have Justin White on again soon, and we discuss uh, feminine uh, issues uh, in terms of the um, social equation. I will be speaking to him personally soon, sometime this week, and we will schedule that. Uh, in the meantime, uh, another shout-out to be provided is to the Grand Madame Ramona Halitha Henry. I hope she's had an opportunity to review uh, my private messages in Facebook. And uh, so far, it seems like she hasn't, uh, but she has established the Gold Star Post. Uh, so she's done that for us, and that's deeply appreciated. So I want everyone to take advantage of that. Look for the gold star that says the sound is loud and clear. And uh, then you can uh, take a look at uh, various links that she shares, which serve as references for what I bring up during the program. Uh, now, aside from that, I want to give a shout out uh, to other people who have been kind enough uh, to provide us notifications on our quality of sound uh, and that, of course, would be a young man who's showed up after a number of years, uh, Brando Young. Uh, and uh, so a shout out and hugs to our dear brother in battle, Brando Young. Uh, a shout out to, of course, Daniel Arola, who's always one of the first uh, in line. Uh, and to, of course, our lovely uh, young lady, uh, Ramona Halitha Henry. She's, uh, she's doing well. Uh, bringing up various links already. So she's in action. She's in the groove. Uh, aside from that, other people that come to mind are always uh, people who get here right uh, on on the, the start of the button. Uh, Diana Rishan, uh, Lena Shea, and uh, mwah, mwah, kisses to both young ladies. Aside from that, uh, we're getting Sammy Romero, our uh, brother in battle, coming in. Also, the adult actress Mariah Mills, mwah, lovely lady who shared a link. God bless her. Uh, and of course, uh, Sarah Shields is listening. And uh, with that, of course, what I'm going to do is uh, take a moment to actually, uh, because I'm getting overheated in my sweatshirt, uh, surprisingly enough, we're at a warm enough temperature, what I'm going to do is change my t-shirt. So give me just a second here while I make some rustling noises and uh, take my earbuds off, which always feels odd while I'm on air live. And then what I'm going to do is bring people into a review of current events, which are inescapable. And uh, they, of course, start, but do not end, thank God with Donald Trump. So, uh, Robert Mueller has uh, got Roger Stone. Uh, and at this point, um, all I can say is, you know, uh, big fucking deal. <laughs> We've got the shutdown entering its final chapter. The Russia probe has snared another Trump advisor with a WikiLeaks connection. You know, at this point, Everybody who's been listening to me for any period of time now knows this is all completely anticlimactic. None of us can understand how any of this uh, is even news. Uh, this is something I've been stating for years, literally years <laughs> at this point, two years now. 
I've been going into this and it's taken two fucking years to get to this point. Okay, this is obscene. This is obscene. Uh, at this point, uh, I hate to say it, it's almost like Robert Mueller's on Trump's side, really, uh, with the time he's taken uh, to do this. I understand the man is an extraordinarily methodical investigator. He has made certain everything he's had is uh, airtight, uh, sealed uh, hermetically, uh, so that this will be a case that has uh, the impact that it needs to have. Uh, still, at this point, with the length of time that it has taken, it is, uh, there's almost no point at this point <laughs> to the investigation. Uh, I will, of course, probably not tonight, um, as I said, sometime soon, uh, go into why uh, at this point with the um, Democratic uh, lead we have to start impeaching Trump, uh, even though impeachment will likely take two years, uh, the very process will rein in uh, Trump and uh, and he needs to be cornered and contained and quarantined like the mad, vicious rabbit animal that he is. Uh, so um, as for the WikiLeaks connection, of course, uh, everything was exposed by me decades ago. Why this is even being reported now as news is, is beyond me. So Trump got defeated in his stare down with no money for his wall. Uh, the Ever since his party's loss in November's midterm elections, the dominant storyline in Washington has been walls closing in on uh, the Putinista puppet president, Donald Trump. And this week ended with the walls tightening on two fronts, the government uh, Trump down and the Russia investigation. On Thursday last week, the Senate rejected the plan Donald Trump had offered as his compromise to end the Trump down. Uh, a Democratic alternative got more votes in the Republican-controlled chamber, uh, which is in itself speaks volumes. Uh, on Friday last week, Trump's longtime advisor, Roger Stone, was arrested in the Russia probe, both actions occurring against the background of a small but significant drop in Trump's already low standing with the public. And uh, all of this underscores uh, the Putinista puppet president's parlous political position. That's a lot of P's that are all alliterative. I hope you admire my ability to put that together in my second language of English. Now, this brings us to Trump down, uh, what hopefully is the final challenge <laughs> of uh, this federal government shutdown uh, that is entirely the fault of one Russian puppet. The Senate defeat of both Trump's proposal and the Democratic alternative came as no surprise to anyone. But the vote count mattered nonetheless. The fact that six Republican senators broke ranks to vote for the Democratic plan sent a very clear message to the Russian White House. Republican senators reinforced that message behind closed doors in a meeting with Vice President Mike Pence in which they chastised the administration and insisted the time was now long overdue to bring an end to the Trump down, which entered the start of its sixth week last week. Now, Friday morning brought a sharp amplification of that message as a shortage of air traffic controllers who are all working without pay forced the FAA, the Federal Aviation Administration, to close LaGuardia Airport in New York City to incoming planes and to slow traffic across the entire northeast of the Atlantic seaboard. Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell and Minority Leader Chuck Schumer met on Thursday to start negotiations, their first public talks on the issue, and on Capitol Hill, legislators seemed to believe the stalemate was nearing its final phase, even at that time. McConnell, in particular, has made a point until now of keeping his hands off the shutdown. He publicly said in December what he had privately told White House officials all along. Shutdowns never work and only inflict political damage and had worked with some success to keep himself and his Republican Senate colleagues out of the public line of fire just by keeping their heads down and hiding in their holes in the wall like the rats that they are while they let the Putinista puppet take all the fire. Once the Putinista puppet, the wicker man, was ablaze, 
Then McConnell came out of his hidey hole. He's bolt in the wall. And Bandit McConnell's public involvement wants uh, egressing his bolt hole. In talks, indicated he believed a negotiated solution was finally achievable. And the White House statement that Trump would consider a short-term measure to reopen government agencies, which would allow some 800,000 federal workers to get back pay, provided further evidence. Although Trump was still holding out for a down payment on his Russian border wall. And as always, the unknown variable, the joker in the deck, which is all he fucking is in the most impotent sense was Trump. Any settlement required Trump to back down from his insistence that he would not sign a government money bill unless it included funds for his Russian wall. Now, Democrats wouldn't give him that, although they were willing to provide more money for border security, some of which would go to more border barriers. And Trump had already laid the grounds for his retreat, saying, I have other alternatives if I have to which was an allusion, obviously, to declaring a unlimited state of national emergency because of the border and attempting to use that as a way to not only shift money from other government programs to pay for building barriers while using the military in what would be considered a mobilized war effort but to also install himself as dictator for life and install his family as a political hierarchy to rule over America as a dynasty in perpetuity. Now, I expose that, of course, on my own transmissions, which they listen to religiously. And because I exposed all of his legal powers, cited the laws which he could use in the various measures, He had to back down. Now, if you say, oh, you're giving yourself too much credit, Douglas Dietrich, then ask yourself, who the fuck else ever brought this up on anything you were ever listening to? Alternative media or conventional. And you won't be naming any names. Now, whether any such move as initiated by Trump would have survived a court challenge is theoretically unknown. It most certainly would have passed because of his Pat court, now known as the Kavanaugh court, colloquially. But the court would have at least whatever decision was rendered allowed Trump to back away from the current stare down without admitting defeat. That is impossible now. Because whatever rhetorical formulation Trump employs at this point, the fact of defeat be impossible to avoid. As McConnell predicted, the shutdown has not worked. The Republicans as a party were against it, but Trump is not working for them. He is working for Vladimir Putin. His job is to destroy the United States. Donald John Trump's job is to kill you through the NRA, literally physically kill you, you dumb motherfucker, or anyone you love through mass shootings via NRA terrorists because the NRA is an international terrorist organization that works for motherfucking Russia. It is their vanguard in the United States to kill you. So Trump is to, his entire objective is to either kill you or anyone you love through the NRA Directly or indirectly, he has set his Kavanaugh court now to attack gun laws in New York City to turn that into a free fire zone. Not even going to bother to cover that tonight. Get that in another transmission in the near future. Or, and he's going to destroy the United States and or with any other method he can use. Aside from killing you directly, he's going to destroy your infrastructure so that nothing will function and you will die by starvation. Say if you're on SNAP or a supplemental nutritional assistance program or anything involving the federal government on which millions of lives depend. 
from providing power and electricity to disaster relief. All of that was impacted severely by the Trump down. All of this in the name of motherfucking Russia to bring your quality of life down to the Russian level of quality of life. And the Russian level of quality of life takes you out of the sewer of shit that you're swimming in in the United States and takes you down into the septic tank with the motherfucking Russians where they live in horror, hell, hopelessness, and despair for eternity. If that's the kind of life you want because you worship the Russians as the master race, you deserve it. When we win this civil war, which you started, if you're a motherfucking Republican or some goddamn independent who supports them, you will be deported to motherfucking Russia, to greater Manchuria where they need more manpower than they could ever possibly provide. And where there's entire empty cities built by the motherfucking communist Chinese that are just waiting for you to occupy. Now, Democrats, in the face of this foreign threat and foreign insurgency, supported by white trash collaborators and their colored coon cadres, in the face of this wartime threat, the Democrats have maintained an impressive degree of unity despite all White House expectations that they would desert the position taken by House Speaker Nancy Pelosi. The longer the Trump down has gone on, the more the public has seen it as a serious problem and has very rightly and correctly blamed Trump for it. Again, contradicting what White House officials had predicted. Early in the week, Trump attacked Pelosi, saying she was as acting irrationally. By midweek, she had forced chicken shit Trump to publicly back down over giving his State of the Union speech, a highly public and symbolically potent humiliation. She emasculated him, though there wasn't much to emasculate, whatever dick she clipped off. Mostly it was just a bunch of pubic hair that came out with the clippings. I don't know if a dick was even to be found amidst that patch. And Trump standing with voters has suffered. Resultantly, once they realized this pussy known as Donald Trump, this human cunt, this mangina, doesn't have a penis. So when the shutdown began, the Real Clear Politics average of polls, Real Clear Politics is an actual agency, RCP, their polls showed the public with a negative view of Trump's job performance, 43% approving, 52% disapproving. By the end of last week, Trump's standing had dropped to 41% approving and 56 disapproving. That's not a huge shift. Americans' views of Trump are so firmly entrenched that his numbers never move a lot. But it puts him back near his all-time low and puts his standing below where it was on election day in November when his party lost 40 seats in the fucking House. So... Exactly how the standoff will be resolved, aside from what we already know, remains unclear. But as government workers brace for a second missed paycheck back on Friday when they were bracing for that, the end seemed at least to be coming into sight. And that brings us to Russia, the next chapter, because the end isn't here yet for the Mueller investigation. Mueller may be close to wrapping up and submitting a final report, as has been widely reported, or at least rumored. That's all we can say at this point concerning that very turgid subject. But Friday's arrest of Roger Stone, the longtime Trump advisor and self-declared dirty trickster, showed there's more business to complete before submitting a final report can even happen. The charges against Roger Stone had been repeatedly forecast by the defendant himself, among others. So the accusation that Stone lied to investigators about his communications with WikiLeaks has come as no surprise. What has stood out in the indictment were statements showing that Mueller's investigators had evidence of high-level Trump campaign interest in WikiLeaks and its publication of emails that Russian agents had stolen from Democratic campaign files as part of an international campaign of espionage and terrorism 
fully backed by the motherfucking treasonous Republican Party, a party that needs to be outlawed as the Communist Party is outlawed, an enemy party, a enemy insurgency. Now, the indictment said that a senior Trump campaign official was directed to contact Stone about any additional releases by WikiLeaks without identifying either that senior official or who directed him. That's not in and of itself evidence of criminal conduct, but it ties the campaign directly to WikiLeaks. By doing that, it puts the spotlight back on what Democrats have long seen as a central part of this case, whether Trump's aides directly or indirectly played a part in Russia's efforts to harm Hillary Clinton's campaign by hacking her files and employing WikiLeaks to release embarrassing emails. Stone's arrest was the second major eruption of news on the investigative front last week. On Wednesday, Trump's former attorney and longtime fixer, Michael Cohen, announced he was postponing his scheduled testimony before the House Oversight Committee. He blamed threats from Donald Trump himself and his attorney, Rudy Giuliani, directed at his own family, the family of Michael Cohen, all operating at a mafia level of threats to loved ones. House Democratic leaders responded with suggestions that they might issue subpoenas to Cohen and with warnings to Trump not to try to intimidate witnesses. By the way, witness intimidation is and of itself a crime, and Trump needs to go to jail for that. Imprisonment. Imprisonment. <laughs> Lock him up. Chant it. 2,000 motherfucking times like the retard Republicans do about Hillary Clinton. Chant it. Lock him up. Meantime, Trump's former campaign chairman, Paul Manafort was back in court yeah, Friday, day before yesterday, for a hearing on prosecutors' accusations that he had lied to them after accepting a plea bargain agreement. If a judge agrees this was the case, Manafort could face a harsher sentence. And as a former United States military general who was paid by the motherfucking Russians to speak on their propaganda television, he deserves as harsh a sentence as possible. So, mm, taking in some tea there, across the Atlantic, Brexit is up for a vote, again, exactly two months before the United Kingdom be due to leave the European Union. Parliament be expected to vote Tuesday on Prime Minister Theresa May's fallback plan for the departure. Queen Elizabeth II called on Britons to seek common ground as fears spread of food shortages if there's no deal. To which I say to the motherfucking Brits, I hope you fucking starve. My belly's full. I get my home delivered meals, which I earned after a lifetime of care provision. I hope you motherfuckers starve, just like you made the Asian Indians starve in World War II. And matched Joseph Stalin's killing record. Fuck you. Burn in hell. Starve to death. I want to see it. I want to see your ribs showing through your skin. And laugh. <laughs> so there we have it. Uh, for the motherfucking Brits. And the China-US trade war takes a spotlight. China's top trade negotiation. Comes to Washington, District of Columbia. On Wednesday this week for a 48-hour meeting aimed at reaching a trade truce. It's also the deadline for the United States to seek the formal extradition of Meng Wenzhou, chief financial officer of the Chinese technologies giant Huawei. Everyone sees through Meng's arrest in Canada as a political move by the Trump administration to get leverage in the trade feud. Which, of course, speaking of trade, economics, and the world, it brings to my mind the Davos deliberations. It's a pity there were fewer influential world leaders than in previous years at Davos last week at the World Economic Forum. And not only because so many of the risks that are top of mind right now for delegates 
being political in nature. The official theme of this year's forum was Globalization 4.0, focusing on the fourth industrial revolution and how the world will respond to mass job losses triggered by automation and artificial intelligence. Surely the private sector must share in the burden, but the shortage of participation by governments in the debate at Davos felt inexcusable to myself, given the stakes. Livelihoods beyond the line, and the ripple effects on families and communities won't be slowed by empty talk about the need to reskill the labor force. The Davos set learned this the last time around when an inadequate response to the labor market effects of global trade paved the way for the elitist reactionary wave that prompted much soul searching among Davos regulars. Of course, Expecting the world's problems to be solved in a few days at a ski resort is asking a lot. But for all of the stick that Davos gets, there are few times and places when so many executives and policymakers be crammed in the same conference center. If nothing else, the consensus that emerges from the speeches, meetings, and schmoozing throughout the week can nudge things in a certain direction once everyone goes home and gets back to work. Every country will choose its own level of involvement in smoothing out the effects of the disruption. But arguably, none of them be close to even starting to get prepared. They aren't even preparing to be prepared. Even governments that manage to provide quality services to the young, with schooling, for example, or to the old, like public pensions, tend to have much less experience helping people manage major life transitions during those stages in between. On the positive side, the absence of the Asian Indian Modi of the French president, Macron of the Canadian Trudeau, and the Putinista puppet, Donald Trump, meant that Davos wasn't the circus it was yesteryear, back in 2018 or 2017. Security lines instead moved quickly, and the promenade that runs through town was relatively clear of traffic. But the economic security of millions of people remains at risk, and the road ahead will not be so easily navigated as were the highways and byways of Switzerland last week. Now I'm going to give a shout out to Salman Sheikh, our Muslim brother in battle. I pray he be listening. Dear friend and brother, he's a man who puts his neck out there on the line and I'm going to be ripping apart someone from his overall region of the world. Now, Salman Sheikh is Pakistani in nationality. I don't know whether he was born in the United States or whether he immigrated. I don't really care. He's a good man either way. Now, when it comes to his area of the world, Whatever one says about Pakistan, whatever happens in Pakistan impacts the world because Pakistan is a mover and a shaker in the sense of the narcotics trade, which comprises the overwhelming majority of the world economy. You can put everything together on planet Earth inclusive, the petroleum industry. And the economies come up to but a fraction of the illegal underground empire of the drug trade and the recreational narcotics economy. We float high on drugs worldwide. And a big part of that is processed 
heroin sourcing out of Pakistan, processed within Pakistan itself from the opium out of Afghanistan, which for all intents and purposes, the Pakistanis have invaded and occupied for decades. So that's the golden triangle of the new global war, as was the golden triangle of North Vietnam, Laos and Cambodia, actually Laos and China, really, uh, and northern Thailand, Cambodia being lower on the map of the Southeast Asian Peninsula. So it was Laos and Vietnam and uh, communist China, basically, in which the Golden Triangle was predominantly centered, bleeding into Thailand. And that's where we used to get raw opium processed into high-grade heroin through Laos, which many analysts argue was the real turning point, the real pivotal area of the Vietnam conflict. So when it comes to that region of the world, with the American withdrawal from Southeast Asia, the entire narcotics economy of planet Earth relocated to the Afghanistan-Pakistan region, what the Americans call Afpakia. Pakistan, of course, was once much larger than it is today. With the breakup of the British Raj after the Japanese victory in World War II, then what you had was a Pakistan that used to include Bangladesh. Bangladesh comprised what was then known as, uh, I believe it was, uh, oh, fuck, the directions begin to confuse me once we get into the Indian region. I think it was called East Pakistan, and the Pakistan we know today was known as West Pakistan. What happened was the Bangladeshi people revolted in what was essentially a communist revolt and threw off the rule or the administration of Pakistan in the West and established what became known as Bangladesh. Important to remember when you speak of Bangladeshi, you use that term. Bengali is a legitimate term, but it uh, signifies or references an ethnicity, whereas Bangladeshi references a nationality. So what happened was that our dear friend Peter Moon, shout out to he at this point, came up with a post which I'm going to ask him never to do anything like this again because it just forces me to cover ground. I've already covered. I don't know why people even bother to do this. Uh, I certainly have brought up the fact that other friends have done so. Shout out to both of them as they come to mind. One of them was uh, Jessica Castillo Carey. Um, mm, shout out to that lovely lady. Um, works at a um, a. a, a shall we say, a marketplace uh, for, uh, for, for basically sexual aid objects uh, that help people with their intimate pursuits in uh, intimate entertainment, um, adult uh, uh, tools for uh, sexual intercourse, uh, adult toys. Um, she's a sex educatrix, uh, and um, she asked me about uh, developing uh, caste stratification in San Francisco. Uh, I've covered that before. I'll happily cover it again in the near future. Our good friend, a shout out to he and hugs to our native Canadian brother, uh, an American Indian uh, north of the border in the nation of Canada, uh, named uh, Devon Bulldog, uh, who uh, did confirm to me his uh, Native American ancestry of the First Nations of Canada. And uh, he brought to my attention through a tag, uh, it, Communist China, saber rattling as always about invading Taiwan uh, something that I again have covered in the past and will happily cover again in the near future about the uh, difficulties the challenges they will face uh, in any such event and of course uh, that brings us back to Peter Moon it was his birthday the other day so happy birthday Peter Moon look I love him dearly he is a brother in battle he's a good friend of ours 
Uh, he has his own connections with both the paranormal and uh, military intelligence. Uh, he's far more connected than he even consciously realizes. And uh, what he did uh, is just basically something that um, we'll take advantage of to provide a re-emphasis on the historical narrative. But he published a post that is essentially meaningless and has nothing to do with anything. And I really have no fucking interest in because it's entirely irrelevant. So the post he published with a tag to myself was Douglas Dwayne Dietrich thought you might like to comment on this one. Well, you thought wrong. <laughs> really, really. And from Fox News. So he published a post from motherfucking Fox News, the propaganda arm of motherfucking Russia. What Fox News is, is Russia today in the United States. Okay? Don't go to Fox News for anything. If you go to Fox News for anything other than to emphasize how bad it is about Donald Trump, because it's getting so bad, even they have to admit to that in various reports. Other than for something like that, there is no point in even tuning to Fox News. There's nothing there. So what they did was they put a stupid article up about secret Pentagon projects reveal government looked into UFOs, wormholes, and other bizarre anomalies. What the fuck is here? That I would want to comment on that I haven't said a million times. <laughs> like, what the fuck? So they wrote, as the intro, the truth is declassified to an extent. It's always to an extent. It's meaningless. So some of the more interesting projects include invisibility cloaking, traversable wormholes, stargates, and negative energy, warp drive, dark energy and the manipulation of extra dimensions, and an introduction to the statistical Drake equation. Okay, what the fuck is here that you wouldn't expect? So they investigated all this that I've gone into for over a decade by now. There is nothing more to say other than, okay, so they said we looked into We know they looked into this. <laughs> What the fuck have I been telling you for a decade? There's nothing to say about this. Let me just read the first sentence. Newly declassified documents from the Pentagon reveal the Department of Defense funded projects that investigated UFOs, wormholes, alternate dimensions, and a host of other subjects that are off the topic of conspiracy theorists. No shit. Oh, man. I never would have guessed. Oh, my God. This is so enlightening. My world is shaken to the core. Oh, my God. My belief systems uh, they're shattered. I, I'm just, oh my God. It's just totally irrelevant. It's meaningless. No, I don't want an answer to it. No, but I'm going to have to because of what this is, is simply fly paper for people to attack myself based on an asinine tag from Peter Moose. So do me a favor, Peter. Do me a favor, anyone. This is not just towards Peter. This is to any one of you. When you see some stupid shit like this, and you feel it's at all relevant to me or that I would all at all be interested in this. I'm not hostile to your sending it to me in a private message. Just send it to me in a private message. And if I feel it's relevant, I'll bring it up and I'll thank you. I'll credit you on air. Otherwise, there's nothing constructive with tagging me with this shit. It's really just a form of harassment because all it does is it forces me to contend with the motherfucking idiots who want to use me to promote themselves. As is the case with some motherfucker out of Bangladesh. Now, I will do him that favor and provide him more publicity than he has ever had in his life or will ever again get in his life. Only because I'll address his stupidity. So, there's an idiot named Mahin Ahmed in Bangladesh, who has decided to take it upon himself with infinite condescension to show himself to be an intellectually superior bloke. But of course, he comes from what many in the West would consider an irrational perspective, that of basically a Muslim 
righteousness attacking Western Luciferianism. Now, there's different ways to pronounce this. There's Luciferism and there's Luciferianism. And they're both actually different ideologies. But of course, what this idiot wrote in a published post on his Facebook timeline, by the way, he was a quote unquote friend of mine on Facebook and a follower. He's, <clears throat> he's blocked now. But at any rate, this motherfucking idiot wrote on his timeline, oh, this is so deep. This is just so deep that, you know, puts me to sleep. This is his bumper sticker. He published a post, his own quote. We have to change the status quo, a.k.a. Luciferian slavery. Okay. Like, um, does that mean that the Luciferians are enslaved and you want to free them? <laughs> or does that mean... I'm assuming that they're enslaving the rest of us. So the Luciferians have enslaved us. And of course, his friends in Bangladesh have answered. He's got 34 followers, which because he's Bangladeshi, I'm assuming every single one of them is a uh, motherfucking relative, an actual blood relation in his extended family, and they probably all live in the same home. So this motherfucker's got friends who answer him. One of them says... Let's build a counter-hegemony at first. Okay, a counter-hegemony of what? Of Muslims? Or Muslims and Christians? Or could you be more specific? Of course, all of this is just meaningless. It's just, just, just truly blather. This is blather. <laughs> and then another friend of his. By the way, if you want to know the names of these people, Kazi Riyasat Alve, and another one, Sumaya Rahman, uh, says, How come they got it all White all systems. Yes, there's white people rule the world. Oh, yes, that's, you know, like they did in the Raj, and then they cut you guys loose, and then you guys had a communist revolution, and now you've got a green field with a red sun on it that you got from the Japanese who freed you in the first fucking place, and that's how you said, well, we don't want the white man ruling us anymore. So thanks to the Japanese winning the war, you've got your fucking independence. Uh, and what are you doing with it? You know, talking shit like this. So finally, the paragraph from the idiot uh, Mahid Ahmed, musician of sort, got a huge following with 34 followers, said, I was talking about so many... By the way, this is all written in Bengali. <laughs> it's, it's written in Sanskrit, okay? It, actually, it's written in very similar to the Vedic language of the Asian Indians, okay? That's, that's what it's written in my, you know, to be academic about this, to be pedantic. He says, I was talking about so many days that Bangladesh is the one who runs. It's even though it's okay, but it's not the ultimate boss. By the way, this is not, this is not something that's put through, uh, you know, um, what do they call it? That stupid uh, translate Bing. It's not put through Bing. This is the way the guy writes. <laughs> the amount of murder that is being kidnapped in Bangladesh is that we are now under direct supervision of Nick Illuminatira. Illuminatira. In fact, not just now, it was always the thing, but now the tax collection is a great resource in the eyes of Bangladesh Illuminatira because these people think of the resource like a cow goat, a cash cow. Uh, if you read the article below, he's, oh, he's got an article, oh, he's reading, you will understand that there is a devil slash Lucifer worship in the world. To get rid of their hands, it's hard for you to guess which level you have to come out of the ma in da controla. There's no real translation for the mind, da controla. It's basically a kind of theological system of imprisonment, very similar to the wheel of samsara of the Buddhists. So uh, anyhow, the article that he pinned is in English. It's entitled The Religion and Structure of the Illuminati, and it sources from reptiliandimension.wordpress.com. Oh, my God. Oh, there can't be a better source than reptilian dimension top wordpress.com. I mean, that's the shit. I mean, if, oh, uh, yes. So here we are. Uh, just a little paragraph from that reptilian dimension dot wordpress.com. The individual, aka reptilian dimension. Oh, this is where he gets his aka from. He's also known as, uh, and, uh, the order of the Illuminati, which is made up of various occult groups, is ruled by the Jesuit order and papal nobility bloodlines. The below chart illustrates the inner core of the Illuminati, which is Satanism and Luciferianism. These are very distinct ideologies, by the way. 
And uh, he this is conflating the twain. That would be like saying that Christianity is ruled by Catholics and Protestants, which one could declare is the case in the West, and yet they're at each other's throats. They don't really co-rule. It's not a codominium. They hate each other. They throw bombs at each other. That's like the Satanists and the Luciferians. So just to give everybody a little indication of how ignorant this drivel is. The organizations connected to the inner core all lead to hardcore Satanism as one progresses through it. The leaders of the groups connected to the inner core are all hardcore Satanists. Okay, you, you know, so you might say, well, isn't this what you're saying, Douglas? Hasn't this been what you're saying? Okay, so this is where this guy is coming from. And no, it hasn't been what I've been saying. Because what I've been saying is not that the world is ruled by the Illuminati. The Illuminati are the good guys. The Satanists are involved with the Freemasons. The Freemasons are American. The Illuminati are European. Originally Bavarian, to be specific. So what drags me into this sewer shit is, of course, the fact that Mahin Ahmed took advantage of this flypaper set up by Peter Moon to get himself stuck. And he wrote with basically the infinite condescension of the pseudo intellectual trying to pretend he's something he's not. He wrote, DDD believes Roswell wasn't an alien crash, right? And Peter Moon said, it's not about belief. Of course, Peter Moon is right. Of course, Peter Moon is rational. He's arguing with an idiot. There's no fucking point. If you jump into the pig waller with the pig, the pig has fun, but you just get covered in mud. And you can wrestle with the pig, and you can even pin the pig. And what do you get by that, aside from getting dirty, whereas the pig's enjoyed itself thoroughly? So, I mean, it's, there's no winning in a situation like this. It's utterly ridiculous to engage. And so Mahin responds to Peter Moon with multiple versions of so-called truth out there. It's difficult for someone like myself to discern since we don't have firsthand experience. Even if there's some proof or evidence or witness testimony, it's still not easy to really pinpoint exactly what transpired. People can remote view events, but even that is doubted by others. Oh, yeah. Can't imagine why. <laughs> so I feel that a bit of belief factor is part of the equation in my honest opinion. Okay, this is where we get into solipsism. And that's an entire philosophy that leads to nowhere but self-destruction because what you're saying is there's no solid reality and it's whatever we believe. Of course, if you shoot yourself in the foot, then you feel the pain and you're suddenly back into physical reality. So that's what our man Peter tries to do by shooting Mahi Nakhmed in the foot, really shoots himself in the foot because there's no point in arguing with an idiot. It just brings you down to their level. And he basically set up something on Bing. Roswell Douglas Dietrich Bing. I've never seen it. Didn't even check out the link. Whatever's out there. Anyhow. Then Mahin Ahmed responds. So it's just super dirigibles? Oh yeah, just super dirigibles. Yeah, wow. DDD obviously has tremendous knowledge on Aquino. Somehow his hypothesis. Now, the very offense here. This is where war gets started. This is the bullshit line. This is not a hypothesis. This is fact. All of these facts can be looked up. <laughs> you can look up all of the very surroundings that provide you the circumstantial evidence for everything that's been presented by myself. Now, his hypothesis regarding the Roswell incident doesn't quite fit in with the chain of events and psyops occurring in history. While America is controlled by Satanists and Luciferians, the DOMES, that's an acronym for deep underground military bases, but here it can apply to Ahmed too, do exist. And the deep state is working with ETs. He says ETS with no apostrophe. So, you know, like it's Eastern Temporal Standard or something. But he means extraterrestrials. So the deep state is working with ETs. Now he states this. He states this as fact. <laughs> Just like that. Just like that. And we're supposed to accept that. 
That's not belief. That's fact. Yes. Extraterrestrials are working with the deep state in secret space projects and breakaway civilizations. Okay. This was originally exposed by myself as a public informant. The people who originally ran with it were Richard Hoagland and Richard Dolan. Richard Dolan, of course, is promoted aggressively by Michael Aquino. Richard Dolan is a Satanist. When I exposed his membership in the Temple of Set to his wife, Karen Dolan, who had for years published his books, made him what he is, she divorced him immediately to protect her two daughters. Her two daughters. No longer his. That's how serious that situation was. Karen Dolan was present when Richard Dolan attacked myself and got his ass kicked on stage. You can see that in a Daniel Arola video, Dietrich destroys Dolan. Dolan's wife burst into tears, not because Hubby was defeated, but because he had attacked me when we had all dined together the night before. And, of course, I had tried to provide help for the fact that his parents needed care provision. So I was providing advice on care provision for his parents, and he attacked myself the next day. Now, this was done, as can be seen, on the full video, which is on the Maggot channel. You just look up Maggot, Douglas Dietrich, Richard Dolan, Ambush, or you can look up the, um, what did they call it? Uh, they call it like a where the presenters present. Um, it's the uh, UFO conference. Uh, I, I forget the terms they used to use for these stupid conferences. You can find it on the Mega channel in, of course, the archives. And, of course, let me go and get the archives where they're listed. Find out how uh, you can access them at John Warrington's uh, little maggot tiny URL, which is nothing little about it, of course. It's massive. So the archives are located at tinyurl.com forward slash shows DD. And if you look through that, you'll find, of course, the uh, speakers panel. And the speakers panel was, of course, hosted uh, or um, overseen by no one other than um, our, our boy from uh, the old Revolution Radio days. Uh, fuck, what was his name? Sean David Morton. And uh, poor Sean David Morton. He um, is in jail now. But he did a very good professional job of hosting that speaker's panel. And you can see in the maggot video uh, that you have shills in the audience. They are painfully obvious as such. White men who stand up and they ask very pointed questions attacking myself, which Richard Dolan takes as his cue to attack myself. There is no logical reason for these questions. They are strictly attacks. And, uh, and, and you can see that when you review the video yourself. At any rate, uh, it was uh, afterwards Dolan began to talk. Having spoken with myself and hearing these terms for the first time in his life, he had never written such terms before, never employed such terms before in any of his publications until after that speaker's panel that year. Then he began to use the term secret space project, breakaway civilizations. So all of this begins to be regurgitated from an actual practicing Satanist, an actual Aquino butt boy, regurgitated by some idiot in Bangladesh in his paragraph here, all stated as if it's pure fact that we have to accept, that we have to accept, as opposed to, quote unquote, belief. So then he says, if there wasn't an actual ET craft, he says, et, there's no it's supposed to be capitalized so you can see what he's saying, but of course he uses all, all lowercase. If there wasn't an actual F-craft crashed at Roswell in 1947, then the whole hype really loses power as a psyop done with Chinese trinkets being blown up to be an alien crash by the likes of Aquino, which in the end gets people riled up about ET disclosure in American bases. So I don't quite understand the rationale behind drumming up such falsities, to be honest. After all, one of the biggest secrets that the Satanists are trying to hide is that they communicate with demons and ETs who happen to have the agenda of keeping Earth humanity perpetually as mind-controlled debt slaves. Debt, debt slaves. You know, the, the, the money. It matters to the aliens because they use the money, right? That's that They're so concerned with your fucking credit. Your credit score matters to the aliens. 
<laughs> also, it doesn't quite explain why originally the newspaper reported it as an Indian crash. And the next day, it was changed to weather balloon. The pieces don't quite fit, if you ask me. Curse it up because you're a fucking idiot. And you're regurgitating a bunch of shit from everyone else's narrative. And it has nothing to do with anything I said. And then you change it to Chinese trinkets, you fucking motherfucker. As opposed to Japanese. Yeah, he changes it. Somehow, he changes it to Chinese. <laughs> How the fuck does one do that? Fucking Bangladeshi. Can't even tell the fucking Chinese from the Japanese. This is where we're at. Okay. So at this point, there are several things to go into here. Uh, basically, uh, the first thing that we have to do is waste a bunch of time that I'd rather not waste. And I'm not going to waste too much. But I've got to waste enough. We're going to give people a general perspective on what's going on here. The first thing that the person does is he goes from the solipsist perspective of everything involving belief. Then he wants you to believe what Michael Aquino has told you about the extraterrestrials and all the people behind him and all the people who back him up, whether it's Richard Branson of Virgin Airways and Spaceways, who's the same motherfucker who flies Corey Good around all over the world for free to talk about blue avians, which were exposed, of course, by Brandon Young and myself years ago, back in the bad old days of Revolution Radio working with the controlled opposition. And even then, we were exposing the blue avians. Well, the guy who speaks blue avians is Corey Good. He's given free flights all around by Virgin Airlines, owned by Richard Branson, which stole everything I had when I went to Australia in the ambush set up by Nexus Magazine, of course. And as much as I keep saying about the Australian people were wonderful, I love the Australian people in general. There's certainly uh, the overwhelming majority of Australians. I never had a single negative incident with anyone Australian while I was in Australia. I'll never go there again <laughs> because of having everything stolen uh, by, of course, Virgin Australia. And uh, so that's uh, uh, that's... You know, there you have that, the end of that. Uh, and uh, so in terms of that, that was done in my case. And of course, uh, the other guy, Corey Good, you can look up his YouTube videos and there are hundreds of thousands of hits. You can look that up with, of course, all the Aqu Aquino satanic crowd, whether it's Joseph Patrick Farrell, uh, Corey Good, uh, Richard Dolan. And they're getting hundreds of thousands of hits because they have full media backing and they're constantly on Coast to Coast AM. And this is because people know about them. It's not because they have anything to say. And this person regurgitates everything they say. So then he doesn't understand what I'm saying in context of that. And then he spices it up with the same Michael Aquino regurgitation on Satanism. And yes, it's Michael Aquino who speaks about Satanism running your world more than anyone else because he throws out this shit to connect it with the Illuminati and gets you hating the Illuminati of Europe because they're connected with the Third Reich. And, of course, his enemy is the Third Reich. We are still legally at war with the Third Reich. He works with American intelligence. And, of course, he's operating on wartime alliance with the Soviet Union, which is now Russia, which is still legally at war with Japan. World War II has never ended. So World War II is still ongoing, and he's still fighting World War II with a propaganda war. And that, in effect, dumb, ignorant Third Worlders like this asinine motherfucker who then has absolutely no idea of where to start how to process anything i expose and then winds up trying to one-up me and expose himself as this great intellectual who talks about beliefs and then forces his belief down the throat of everyone else which is exactly what the satanists indoctrinate him in so what he's doing is he's equating the demons and the extraterrestrials now as i've exposed before there are relic populations. There are no extraterrestrials. So to him, he's not even on the right track. He's on a track of fantasy. So the whole fantasy track that all of these people are on were the extraterrestrials. And the burden of evidence is on themselves. Where are the extraterrestrials? One of the first wonderful artifacts of any advanced civilization that's been around long enough to even consider space travel will be to begin building a shell from materials it collects within its own solar system and from other solar systems if it's an interstellar regional power of any sort. It will collect materials to build a Dyson sphere 
this has no connection with Dyson, the man who builds the vacuum cleaners. A Dyson sphere is based on the physicist, Mr. Dyson, Freeman Dyson, who conceptualized the fact that a Dyson sphere would be built around a sun, any one sun, that they inhabit the solar system thereof, to collect energy so that the energy is just not all wasted into space. That way they can power their galactic level civilization. It's the first thing to look for because it's the logical thing to do. There are no Dyson spheres. We're looking everywhere and there's no Dyson spheres. But that's stupid to look for them anyway because we don't even have any radio signals. Because at some point, they would use radio before they graduate it to any other level of technology, they would use radio. They would use light waves to communicate. We don't see any communications in light waves. We don't see any communications from anybody. Space is empty. We're the only ones here, us and the relic populations of the same solar system. So the whole ET concept, which I've deconstructed dozens of times, this man conflates with demons. Because extraterrestrials from another star system, the first thing they want to do is, of course, communicate with demons and cavort with them. So what he's saying is that all extraterrestrials are somehow diabolic, that they are as civilizations, as interstellar civilizations, satanic. And therefore, we live in a satanic galaxy where the satanic aliens are cooperating with the devils and demons as we understand them from our cosmology, because that's the filter he's looking at this through. And they're all somehow got us enslaved via a monetary system. Because what they really want in the end, all that development of high technology, all that travel across the interstellar galaxy, it's all to the end point of collecting cash. Collecting fat fucking cash. Cash. Like digits of transfer electronic digits of transfer for a bunch of primitives on planet earth i mean it makes total sense right i mean like really you've got infinite fucking energy you can travel the stars and oh my god what do we do oh no let's let's go to planet earth and let's get some fucking money because now we're broke and, and we got to get the earthlings to pay for this shit but now that we got debt enslaved oh my god but that that guy mahi nachman he's got it all figured out i mean we're totally fucked because cause this Muslim motherfucker out of Bangladesh, he's just got it. He's got it down thanks to the fact that he read Reptilian Universe. And he, he's got it down now. He's got it all exposed. He knows what's going on. I mean, this is the level of self-indulgent stupidity that we have on a global basis. This is a, these are Americans overseas. These are overseas Americans. This is at that level of stupidity. The majority of the world. Is stupid. And they exist in third world places like this. This is a shithole nation, Bangladesh, combined with the United States. I mean, you know, the guys, white trash pieces of shit, Bangladeshi motherfuckers like this, brothers under the skin. I mean, this is at the same level. This is, this is Bangladeshi trash. This is bengali trash <laughs> that is coming at you with this level of stupidity i mean this is i mean okay all right breathe Douglas. breathe um so let's try and give you some facts and um it's going to require a little bit of a divergence a large divergence into philosophy because what this man is actually coming from is a philosophical perspective and it starts with trying to attack my expositions of fact as a belief system. Because that's the first attack that people do is say it's a belief system. And that way you can deconstruct a belief system. You can't deconstruct fact. Mm. So, and by the way, because they can't argue with the facts, this is why all of my detractors attack myself as an individual. They attack me personally, they attack my personal history, and they try to catch anything I say or do as some kind of falsehood or a lie, because that way they hope to detract from my expositions. They cannot argue with anything I expose, other than to deny it, deny and reject it. And the end result is, what they're left with 
is attacking myself. So all of the original responses to myself when I first became a public informant was reject and attack based on their own contrafactual anti-narrative, their World War II propaganda theology. And uh, what they're left with is, since all of that failed miserably, and the historical narrative of fact that I presented was irrefutable and undeniable, then they were left essentially attacking myself. So let's get a bit into some of this philosophy. Now, the New York Times bestselling author named Jim Mars, white trash piece of shit, who I was far too kind to while he was alive, became a propagandist for Scientology. That should close the argument right there on anything concerning his personality. This individual would oft argue that the Third Reich had somehow won the war by becoming the reptilians that Mahin Ahmed so bases his entire reality on. That the Third Reich is somehow running the United States economically, that they run all of our credit, all of our trade, because, of course, that's why, you know, uh, you've got so many Jews who are occupying uh, New York City, the financial capital of the world, and Los Angeles, the media capital of planet Earth, last time I checked. And, you know, all the Jews, uh, if you look up a map of uh, where Jews are, it's very difficult to find maps like that. You can find population or demographic maps for concentrations of any demographic, black, white, Asian, uh, in various ethnicities like Irish, Asian Indian, uh, you'll find demographic maps of these people all over the United States. If you look up Jews on a demographic map in the United States, it's very, very difficult to find a demographic map of where Jews are in the United States. Well, because they're, they're essentially not anywhere. Uh, you can go through the rest of the United States, you're going to find Jews everywhere, but they're like a single Jewish person will be in the middle of uh, bumfuck Pahrump, Nevada or something like that. A single Jewish person will be somewhere in, uh, you know, the middle of uh, Peoria, Illinois. Um, but where Jews are as a concentrated po population are in New York and Los Angeles, uh, the financial and media capitals of planet Earth. And they've got two subsatellites, uh, the Hidden Holocaust, uh, where all Jews go to die, Miami, Florida. Uh, that's on the Atlantic seaboard. And uh, the satellite uh, city-statelet of uh, Los Angeles, uh, where the Jews go to film their car chases for Hollywood, is San Francisco, because it's a city built on uh, hills, and therefore it makes for visual speed when you're filming car chases. So uh, the Jews have a large uh, community here. This is one of the few places in the world uh outside of israel uh and very few other places uh that you're going to find a large concentration of jews who will be open about being jewish and uh and maintain some actual sense of cultural uh manifestation of jewishness though so, uh, there are of course jewish community centers everywhere like the synagogue that got shot up in pittsburgh of course you have a large jewish community there they're not so large that they stand out very well at all to actually colorize a county on a demographic map as they would be in New York, uh, Los Angeles, Miami, and San Francisco. So those four places are essentially where um, the overwhelming majority of Jews are in, um, in, in the United States. And uh, the majority of Jews are pretty much outside of Israel, other than, of course, for concentrations of populations in places like uh, Yevri in uh, Greater Manchuria, the buffer state between Manchuria and uh, Russia. And, of course, uh, the capital there is Birobijan, uh, Yiddish-speaking Jews, so few in population, a few hundred thousand, if that, that it doesn't really show up on maps other than as what it is, an autonomous oblast, uh, and, but originally a statelet established by the Japanese. And then Stalin invaded it, and then Americans claim Stalin created it. Now, he propagandized that he did, but he did not. Now, uh, aside from that, you've got places in India uh, towards Bangladesh, right in the area of Bangladesh, ironically enough, that have a large population of Jews. Uh, but, of course, according to this idiot, Mahin Ahmed, it's not the Jews that run the world. And I don't say that either, to tell you the truth, though they have a large uh, impact on it. 
a disastrous and catastrophic impact at that, a genocidal impact throughout history. Uh, they're the bane of humanity. Yes, yes, I will say that. <laughs> Uh, but other than that, uh, they are um, they don't really run the world. Uh, if they do, they do a terribly poor job of it. Uh, but they do their best to. They would like to. They strive to. But they really don't. Um, but he says it's the Catholics and the pap, the Pope and the, you know, of course, the. Uh, uh, so with that, he's chosen the Jesuits as they are, uh, you know, their worldwide network of enforcers. In this man's uh, deranged vision of Mahin Ahmed. So uh, when you're operating at that level of insanity, uh, that's as ridiculous as the Judeophobes who are on the level of the synagogue shooter that tore up the Tree of Life synagogue in Pittsburgh. They we're at that level of insanity at this point. A monofocal idiot that doesn't take into account uh, the realities of geopolitics, uh, nation states with any sense of sovereignty. Uh, or whatnot. So in place of the reptilians, what Jim Mars offered you was the Nazis. So what he offered you was a fourth Reich of the rich because, you know, the Nazis are running all of your credit system, uh, all of your economics. That's why you have so many Jews in power, in finance and the media. It makes perfect sense, right? I mean, according to Jim Mars, all the Jews are in New York having an enormous impact on world finance. And in Los Angeles, having an enormous impact on world media because the Nazis love them so much. Because the Nazis just can't get enough of motherfucking Jews producing movies like Inglorious Bastards, where they burn all of the Nazi elite alive because the Nazis rule the world. That, that we see that, right? Does that make sense? No, it doesn't make sense. No, because because it's a bunch of white trash pieces of shit peddling shit to other white trash pieces of shit that makes Jim Mars a New York Times bestselling author. Thank God he's dead. I hope it was painful. And I hope he saw the flames of hell and opened his eyes wide in terror before he dived in and dove into them. I mean, which is exactly where he deserves. I mean, this is the level because he's fed nothing but shit to people. Fed nothing but he's opened up people's brains. He's pumped shit in that empty space between their ears and guided them away from God. So, yes, Jim Mars is a man who deserves to burn in hell. <laughs> so that's his version. That's as stupid as Mahi Ahmed and his reptilian Roman Catholic Jesuits running the world. And that's what brings us to, of course, what we need to talk about with the philo philosophical standpoint from where Mahi Ahmed is coming from, which is, of course, the philosophical standpoint of solipsism. So to understand the true impact of solipsism, it's impossible to even begin to contextualize why solipsism is so profoundly destructive. The creation of your reality as you choose to see fit, the idea that you can choose your reality, that you can pick and choose and put together whatever you want because nothing is really real. All of that, which disappears as soon as you shoot yourself in the foot or someone else shoots you, then you suddenly are locked in the physical reality of embodiment, which you cannot escape other than by death or if you're an ascendant master by some level of astral projection or out of body manifestation. But none of you are ever going to get there. <laughs> Statistically, maybe some of you out there may reach that point. I know I never will, and I'm not seeking it. And if you do reach that point, think of all the others who did, and there's very few of them that have done anything to help the rest of humanity along. So the question would be why you would want to reach that point, because what does that do for the rest of us that you can demanifest yourself out of your corporeal mortal coil? It doesn't normally help any of us. Certainly Christ didn't bother to do that very much as part of his ministry. So it's not necessarily the Christian thing to do because it does very little to impact the world around you. Historically, that's certainly evident. So uh, unless you do that, you're stuck in embodiment, your undeniable, irresistible mortal coil. And as a result, uh, the solipsism is antithetical to that reality. The idea that you can create your own reality, you can pick and choose your beliefs, like a little Jim Mars here, a little Richard Dolan there, a little Douglas Dietrich, you know, it doesn't work like that. 
you, you, it doesn't work. So what that is, is called solipsism. It's creating your own reality because there's no baseline reality. There is baseline reality, which means someone is right and someone is wrong. So when someone comes along and says, like our man, Mr. Pavel Travala was stating about the Japanese anime, they talk about physics, they talk about conceptual physics, they talk about conceptual neurological connections to uh, mobile suits, uh, these macro robotic uh body frames uh that uh people can use for combat uh you can watch you know a new cartoon with michael jordan uh, voicing one of the characters uh produced by the illustrators at rooster's teeth that is called genlock and that's streaming you know as we speak and that gives you many of these japanese concepts uh americanized uh, to an admirable extent they've, they've done a good job with it and uh that of course speaks about what i've been speaking about for years what we're ultimately coming to and all of that of course is based on physical realities um if you don't obey those physical realities you can't get any of this conceptualization materialized or realized in order to make it manifest you have to acknowledge physical realities like our nervous system physically you have to acknowledge physical realities like gravity you have to acknowledge all these physical realities so when you're dealing with these realities it's not a question of picking and choosing something is either going to work or it's not if you say i think that birds have feathers or i observe they have feathers and they fly then feathers must be the key to flight and then you glue feathers you tar and feather your car you glue feathers all over it so your, your car is totally covered in feathers and you drive it off a cliff expecting to fly you're going to die so that's pseudoscience it's not based on physical reality it's based on assumptions so what the overwhelming majority of you are doing on the ideological level, on the idea of your narrative, on the idea of compositing your narrative, is you're fabricating, literally fabricating, because it's a fabrication, meaning it's a falsehood, you are fabricating a narrative based on what you take from predominantly, overwhelmingly, practicing Satanists. Like, yes, the motherfucker who died and hopefully is burning in hell now, the Scientological propagandist, Mr. Mars. So you've got that Satanist combined with Richard Dolan and the entire alternative media, which, of course, is satanic. This is why I got on Coast to Coast AM was because I had the satanic passwords. When I provided that, then our man, the top Satanist himself, George Noy, got me on Coast to Coast AM immediately until Michael Aquino found out, freaked out and shut the entire operation down now. George Noy was already realizing he had made a mistake and had turned me over to what he considered the big loser, the guy who was doing the weekends, that John B. Wells. And I put John B. Wells' ratings through the roof. I created his career, launched his career, and afterwards, when he was finally fired from Coast to Coast for interviewing myself multiple times, he was able to start his own caravan to midnight based on the audience I had gathered him. So here you have that son of a bitch doing what he did. All of this based on connections to Satanism. So Satanists do run an enormous amount of your media. Most of it telling you that the Satanists are the Illuminati, the very people who are fighting the Satanists who are the Freemasons. So you're pointing in the wrong direction. You're looking at the wrong enemy. You're trying to fight the good guys. And then you conflate them with the Roman Catholic Church, which could be construed based on historical abuses as the largest and most long-lived criminal organization in history, in oh so many ways, and yet at the same time is undeniably a foundation of civilization as we know it, without which we would not have what we benefit from today. So the idea for such organizations is reform not destruction but whatever else the roman catholic church may be criminal corrupt this is what happens to police departments and organizations they work with informers they work with criminals 
ultimately, in many ways, they become criminal themselves. That's the nature of the beast. Reformation is needed, not destruction. You cannot exist without a police force. No matter how corrupt it is, the objective has to be reformation. It may take tearing it apart from the top down, but it has to be reorganized while operative because you cannot exist even for a moment without it. So this brings us back to the philosophy of what brings us to this self-destructive perspective on the world. And, of course, the symbolic language of Western metaphysics is Kabbalah. The Kabbalah, the schemata thereof, being unconventionally somewhat analogous unto the printed integrated circuit board of a digital television set that enables you to understand the cosmos. Not the physical universe, but the metaphysical cosmos. Originally a system mapped out in the Hebrew mysticism, embodying ideas dating back millennia, and relatively recently appropriated and expanded upon by genteel tradition via the medieval mystics and renaissance magicians half a millennium ago as the working model of the multiverse, the multiple universes. Indeed, it's solely within Hakabala, which transliterates as the reception, thereby the integrated circuit for a digital television transmission system being entirely apropos. It's from the reception, the Kabbalah, that we derive genuine convergence of any true Judeo-Christianity, a term otherwise as laughably oxymoronic as Islamofascism, because postmodern Islamist fundamentalism is not but reactionary medievalism, whereas fascism is a Romanostatic meaning a Roman statist ideology of corporate mobilization by the state. The corporations do not run the state. That's capitalism. In fascism, the state runs the corporations, like in Japan, Korea, and Taiwan. These are functionally, economically fascist nations. All of that is inseparable from industrial modernization. So the concept of Islamofascism would mean an industrialized Islam. We have not seen an example of that yet in history. As a state manifest, it has not historically yet existed. It's also as oxymoronic to use the term Judeo-Christianity otherwise as you would something in a portmanteau like Christo-Satanism. <laughs> no. Extraneous to mysticism, the Semitic monolatry of Judaism and the Semitic submission of Al-Islam, both of these are Semitic religions, they bear far more ethno-religious confluence to each other than conventional Jewish faith does with Trinitarian Christianity. Yet, Kabbalah brings it together. See, well, the keystone of traditional Yahudut, our Judaism, is that God is one, sans divine incarnation. It means there's God, there's no God in the human body in traditional Jewry or Judaism. Jewry being the ethnos, Judaism being the religion. So there, God is one, no divine incarnation. And yet, Christendom was capable of integrating Hakabala's reverence of God as a compound unity. This is because the Yahudi, or the Jewish mystics, were popularly taken among the population able to read in Christendom. Our original concept of Europe was not as we understand it today. As I've said before, just as Japan is a subcontinental super archipelago of very large islands comprising more land area than either the United Kingdom or United Germany or France. Europe is a subcontinental, a subcontinent like India, 
a Southeast Asian subcontinent comprising in its totality of region, Bangladesh and Pakistan, along with Afghanistan, Tibet and India. So to Europe is another subcontinent. It's a subcontinental super peninsula, a core peninsula being Germany and everything around it. All that Europe is, is Germany with three peninsulas coming out of Germany. The Iberian Peninsula of predominantly Spain, the Italian Peninsula, and the Balkan Peninsula. And if you go north, another peninsula emerges out of Europe, out of Germany, and that's the Scandinavian Peninsula with the other Mediterranean, the Baltic Sea in the north. Germany is the core of all Europe. Europe itself is a subcontinent, a super peninsula, but a subcontinent. It's a peninsula of peninsulas. It is geographically part of Asia. It is a subcontinent of Eurasia, the supercontinent of Eurasia, Africa, and therefore is correctly geographically Northeast Asia. So at a time when Europe still thought of themselves as Northeast Asians, ethnically Caucasian, ethnically white, but part of this supercontinent, the closest concept we had to what became Europe was Christendom. And Christendom was capable of integrating Hakabala's reverence of God as a compound unity because those who were able to read knew that the Jewish mystics were cryptically espousing a triune God, a bodily incarnation of the deity and a vicariously atoning Messiah. Because HaKabalah teaches that the human body be an outward expression of the indwelling soul and that all material things are manifestations of spiritual realities extruding into our universe, a bodily incarnation of God revealing himself in our world being Christological interpretation of HaKabalistic representation of God's ultimate nature of three-in-oneness. Which brings us to the crown of creation. Now, before I go into the crown of creation, HaKabalah is Tao, it's the way. Tao is simply the Chinese word for the way. HaKabalah is the Tao of perceiving, more properly receiving reality based upon subjective experiential interpretations of the world, life, death, creation, meaning, purpose, etc., that can adapt itself to any religious system. Just as Christ said he was in all religions, all true religions, all godly religions, Hakabalah can be utilized by any of those religions. And it was because of that that a brilliant man named Albert Einstein was able to conceive of the singular equation of mass energy equivalence, E equals MC squared immediately recognizable worldwide among the physical circles of science by way of weaponization per implied release of energy as potentially manifest via a physics bomb of atomic fission and thus to Hakabala, which itself inspired the theories of precedent general relativity and subsequent special relativity was contemporaneously recognized among contemporary Anglo-American magical circles of the diabolatrous, the satanic, as a system of equations implying weaponization and its potential via release of entropic entities for a metaphysics mechanism, an anti-life force bomb. But Whereas the Einsteinian intersection with Hakabalah be culturally given as the tradition of received wisdom, which Hakabalah means, the native theology and cosmology of Yahudu, Judea, the distinctive characteristics of the Judean ethnos, the interface between any such received wisdom is what brings us to its abuses. Now, in terms of understanding how it can be abused, that's the only way you're going to understand how dangerous the philosophy of solipsism is and why it has nothing to do with any personal arrogance on my part that I tell you 
it's either my way or the low way. You're either going to go my way or no way at all, because historically, nothing else will function. You're going to either operate via physics, via a mechanics based on workable physics to get something done, or you're not going to work at all. Now, of course, physics changes only in the sense that it's expanded upon. Very seldom in paradigmatic reality do you get change of paradigms such as the Copernican Revolution. The Copernican Revolution stands out as the archetypal change of paradigm that everyone turns to when they're looking towards a scientific revolution. That is the exception, not the rule. When it comes to going to the moon, which, of course, the United States did. When you go to the moon, the only difference is the United States wasn't there first. They stood on the shoulders of giants, the Japanese and the Germans. Now, I've explained the history of this before. As exposed by certain people subversively through the act of fiction, like Jewish authors, as Kurt Vonnegut Jr., had to expose the reality of the Dresden firebombing before anyone in the West would ever publish a nonfiction book about it through a work of satire called Slaughterhouse Five. So, too, did the brilliant man who wrote The Planet of the Apes. That individual wrote the book The Garden on the Moon, and he was the man who was exposing via a novel the historical reality of Japan first landing on the moon. And that was Pierre Boulle, who had been a prisoner of war of the Japanese. And he was a French spy. He was very acquainted with what the Russians were doing to breed a subhuman race of pan troglodytes, combined, hybridized with humanity to create a perfect Soviet population in Stalin's eyes. That inspired him to write The Planet of the Apes. And then he wrote The Garden on the Moon to expose the reality of the Japanese getting there first in a kamikaze mission to pave the way for a station, a garden, which would prove to be the agricultural core, the foundation of the Reich's colony on the moon. All of this happened before the Americans briefly went there and never went back into space bodily ever again to any distant body or any nearby body for that matter, other than the secret space program in which there was Enormous conflict with the Thousand Year Reich in exile, and of course, the Soviet Union, at a time that led to the destruction of the American and Soviet space programs, and the Reichs reigning supreme in near space. All of this is a hidden history involving breakaway civilization and secret space programs exposed by Douglas Dietrich taken up by other people and then propagandized so it's entirely incomprehensible and nobody knows what the fuck is going on. They just regurgitate these terms and they're meaningless. They use it with the same ignorance that they would use a term like Kabbalah without any understanding of why you have to understand it in order to understand how dangerous philosophies like solipsism are today. So when we speak of the Godhead, the triune Godhead, where Judaism and Christianity merge in Trinitarian Union. We go to the centrality of Kabbalistic doctrine, a diagrammatic glyph consisting of 10 circles representative of sphere, the spheres, conjoined by a number of path lines into a distinctive pattern designed to aid the teaching of metaphysical philosophy. Kabbalists deem each sphere a saphira, a godly emanation, in plurality, sapheros, or emanations from God, in infinitive, sephiroth, or divine enumerate, within a holistic, a holy system of sephiroth, or enumeration, et hashayim, the tree of life. Each sephira, a blossom upon hetz, the tree, represents an aspect of existence and or magical consciousness cascading down from the topmost sephira, kether, the crown, through various conceptual emanations, each one progressively more dense, 
until finally manifestation of the physical universe of Malkuth, the material kingdom. As well, each Sephirah, divine emanation, represents an archetypal idea, a Platonic realm of creation, each identified with a Hebraic derivative name of Kiana or Kana Yahweh, Latinized as Hakana, but jealous in the Hebrew, Yahweh, Yahweh, Jehovah, per the most universally circulated and traditionally tetragrammatonic theonym or name of God. So each sphere of our jealous God be ruled by a specific Hebrew archangel and each be related unto a list of magical correspondences that help the path-working magician recognize when he or she reaches the correct sephirah or sphere. And the sephiroth also correspond to the traditional philosophical planets of the system of planetary magic that astrologers may work their ways with. These nine planets of our solar system. Now, the normative goal of path-working Kabbalistic magic until the 20th century, was to journey from Sephira to Sephira, learning from each and traversing the paths between in an ongoing quest for enlightenment, knowledge, and power. Personal empowerment via V Kabbalah, of course, is still accessible to theoretically anyone. And at Findisical, the turn of the 20th century, we saw a desecration of Kabbalistic mechanics. By way, such receptivity of gnosis or knowledge was ultimately integral, limited deployment of WCDs, weapons of cosmic destruction. When Iraqi forces afield went from the fourth largest army in the world to the second largest army of Iraq in a span of 100 hours via the forsaken warcraft of Michael Aquino in his last service to the Constitutional Republic of these United States in uniform. I can speak of that in another transmission. But for now, we need to concentrate on the schematics of divinity. In Radiance of Halo about the crown of Kether, off be conveyed concentric rings, the veils of the unmanifest. In Kabbalistic cosmology, the great unmanifest contested out of itself, the sphere of Kether, whilst remaining in itself unchanged. Thus, Kether represents the original positive manifestation of our universe, but not the universe itself. That doubtful honor goeth unto the bottom sphere of the diagrammatic tree, Malkuth, whereon acts out fulfillment and kingship, where we strive for power as mortals in our coil of embodiment. Now the Hebrew Kabbalists superimposed a generalized classification scheme that I will simplify for our purposes over the detailed schematic of the ten Sephiroth to describe the arrangement of reality by division into at least four basic levels of being. The Olemos, the concealed worlds, as these four levels be known. At the bottom level be Asia, the lower material world of action manifest, matter being but retarded motion. Next comest Yetzirah, the astral world of formation. Then Beraya, the creative mental world of Yeshmiayin, or creatio ex nihilo, creation out of nothing. And finally, Atzaluth, the archetypal world of Einsof, the endless one the proper name for the hidden aspect of God transcendent in pure essence, neither male nor female, literally that which be boundless without end, the infinite divine, the endless light which surrounds the void, emanated spheres or realms of light effulgent and infinitely bright. The ten-dimensional sphere of Sephiroth coalesce within these four planes as the tree of life, beneath which be the tree of death, which we have to get to, to understand the danger of solipsism. But first, what mystics aim for in the norm 
is the use of the four layered olemos or concealed worlds to comprehend the Sephiroth as various groupings of relative dimensions. The layers of Atzaluth, Beraya, and Yetzirah each contain three of the Sephiroth. Asia holds but one Sephiroth, the material realm of worldly Malkuth, the Asiatic kingdom at the bottom of Etz Hashaim, the tree of life. And for millennia, laypersons have confused the Hebrew Asia with the Eleniki or Greek peoples, Asia, derivative from Askia or a place without shadows, originally a reference to southern Anatolia. So, mystics' narratives of intradimensional travels in Asia were misunderstood or mistranslated as Asia, reinforcing prejudices of Asians as lower aliens and or as submoral beings, projecting in turn misperceptions of Asiatic dimensional beings as being intrinsically Asiatic in manifestations and mannerisms. Which is why when you take a look at some post-apocalyptic game like Fallout and all of the variants for extraterrestrials, they are Asians. Yellow, slanted-eyed, pug-nosed, thin-lipped, Asians. Now, working our way up from racist ignorance, Asia be the material world of action. It contains the universes that run by the principles of natural law. The angels of Asia function on the active level throughout our terrestrial cosmos. Inhabitants of the Asiatic plane may use magic, but their worlds do not run by magic. The next plane of existence above us, the plane of Yetzirah, does run by magic. On these dimensions, symbols and beliefs control matter and energy. An astral plane links the myriad dimensions of Asia and Yetzirah, such being why mystics reference Yetzirah as the astral world. Many postmodern mystics have come to believe that humanity's machines generate an astral realm of their own. And this operative realm of machine consciousness is not to be confused with conventional cyberspace in any way, shape, or form. The level above that be the worlds of Beraya, completely spiritual. The upper planes embody concepts, states of mind, abstract aspects of reality such as time, death, or number. They are not comprised of matter at all. Here be the realms of the gods, conceptual entities, the truly cosmic beings dwell on these dimensions. Theoretically, anyone can reach the planes of Asia and Yetzera by magic. The planes of Beraya be different. Passing through the veil of highest division on the astral plane takes wisdom, and no mortal be exempt, no matter how great their power. Those who fail the test of wisdom are hurled back to the realms of matter or succumb to dangerous monomanias, as did Michael Aquino. And no corporeal being who succeeds perceives the burialic planes as they truly are. Human visitors perceive these realms as material because human senses and minds cannot perceive pure spirit. And yet it be here, the burialic plane of numbers, that provide us the key to entering the virtual realm of computer-networked cyberspace by magic. Sans identification codes or passwords and uninhibited by electronic firewalls. Now, because I'm exposing the realities of our world, we're getting a longer than usual disruption in the stream over the last 30 seconds. I'm told this by our executive producer. I'm hoping that Mr. Pravara is still recording so that all of this will be heard in archival narrative for those who cannot hear myself now. So I'm going to take advantage of this minor interruption. I am told everything just reconnected. Everything is recorded. I thank him for that. And of course, 
uh, our dear lady, Holly Kaditis Kiefer, blessed be her soul, kiss unto her, says that uh, among the ignorant and unknowing dupes of mass Satanism be the heaping helping of David Icke, uh, as I've addressed many times in the past. And our dear brother in battle, Mr. Daniel Arola, has put up a meme about solipsism, blessed be. And of course, we're getting our usual links provided by the Grand Madim, Ramona Halitha Henry. I'm glad to take this moment to acknowledge those out there among us. A shout out to Frugaji Goyim Johnson, who's changed his name a few times. Michaela Anastasia, mm-hmm. kiss me under her. And, uh, of course, uh, anyone else who is joining us. So we are uh, going to continue in just a moment. I'm just taking a brief overlook at all of the lovely links provided by the Grand Madame Ramona Halitha Henry, who's been working nonstop and providing uh, Kabbalistic uh, glyphs, uh, charts uh, that people can uh, access while we be uh, on air. Now, other than that, I'm going to return now to uh, the discussion at hand. Uh, and, of course, thank everyone uh, for their patience uh, with everything that I am discussing. And I want to, uh, again, uh, thank our executive producer, Mr. Pavel Pravara, for keeping me up to date on everything as it functions. I'm going to take advantage of this moment to get a drink of water. And uh, I'll be back to speaking in just a second, but I'm right here. Mm. Now, note that beyond the cosmo-conceptual olem, or concealed world in the singular, of Beraya on the diagrammatic canopy of Etz Hashaim, the Tree of Life, Kabbalists, or receptionists, receivers, sometimes draw a dotted line labeled Tvim, the abyss, literally underlining the essentially abstract nature of exceeding sphere. Here on the abyss between the lower levels of reality and that of the most highest, the three spheres atop the tree of life, the triunity of God. The division line before that series of spaces, or sphere, that division of the abyss, before anyone would ever reach that level, underlines the essentially abstract nature of those exceeding sphere. Because that line on the diagram of the tree of life outlines the edge of space, time, and even separation into distinct entities. It's the vast gulf the ancients pictured as a huge expanse of desert. Crossing the abyss is considered the highest achievement of an adept and essential to transcending maya or illusion. Anyone who attempts and fails to cross the vim, the abyss, be annihilated, body and soul, or warps into something monstrous beyond recognition. Those who succeed pass into absolute. And across that abyssal barrier, the Olim, the concealed world of absolute, contains the triune Sephiroth of the ultimate aspects of reality, beyond spatio-temporal division into discrete entities, yet each considered a single plane by mystics. Only the most powerful and enlightened mystics can even perceive absoluthic planes and visions, let alone travel there into physically, or rather metaphysically. So such having been said, let's start at the top with this crown of creation that led in its abuse to the atomic bomb. The ancients held Kether was almost as far beyond human understanding as the great unmanifest itself. 
But while by definition the great unmanifest could never be understood at all by a finite mind, the possibility of understanding something about Kether remains open to us once the mind has been properly prepared and expanded. In an attempt to promote such expansion, various titles and descriptions are associated with the Kethersphere. Most of them embody paradoxes. Kether be the first manifestation, yet remains somehow beyond time. Kether be formless, yet contains within itself all forms and the possibility of form. Kether be a total abstraction, but be simultaneously the ultimate positive reality. Kether be the totality of everything, its prime association being unity, and encompasses every last particle of matter and energy in the cosmos. But it be something more as well, it manifests in its totality in everything, macroscopic and microscopic. So these conceptualizations remained obscured within religio-philosophical contexts of hermeticism, as in hermetically sealed, inaccessible to mundane exploitation and or weaponization, until Albert Einstein rationalized his people's ages old in tradition of Kabbalah as a subjective, non-falsifiable belief system upon which to extrapolate the general theory of relativity, one of the two pillars of modern physics alongside quantum mechanics. And on perceiving such symmetrics through the paradigm of physical logic, wherein they became instantaneously clarified with multitude of paradoxes resolved, he had but to parenthetically substitute the term space-time continuum for the term Kether, and all the veils fell away. While contemporary historical revisionism acknowledges Einstein's theories were not at all well received by the conservative scientific establishment for decades, entirely occluded from history are the reasons as to why, preeminent among them being that the world-bluffing Jewish physicist source his original insights whilst mulling over a mystical and esoteric system of observing and interpreting the universe and mankind whilst seeking to reveal the true relationship between God, man, and that universe created by the one for the other. So it's an anti-theistic, an anti-godly stance on the part of reactionary scientists that prevented the advancement of physics for a generation. But within Einstein's understanding of our universe, which is now our own, the Kether continuum be the first manifestation, as logically it must be in our universe, it remains beyond time as it encompasses all time. The continuum is, of course, formless, but until the continuum exists, no form be possible. It's an abstraction, but the bedrock of reality. It unites everything we know or can possibly know about matter and energy, but integrates the extra dimension of time. Furthermore, the theoretical nature of the space-time continuum may be detected from examination of molecular as well as macrocosmic events. Below Kether on Etz, the tree, within Atsaluthic otherworldliness, be two further sphere named Shokma, which be wisdom, and Bina, which be understanding. Kether, Shokma, and Bina are oft treated as a single unit, the supernal triangle. Tradition, which is a term synonymous with Kabbalah, has it that, while apparently distinct, Shokma and Bina are, in a very special sense, merely aspects of Kether. Qualitatively, Kether has always been held to contain every other sphere on its, the space-time continuum containing all manifestations, or the tree of life. But Kether contains Shokma and Bina in a different sense 
considered separately, these sphere cannot manifest apart from one another, but in manifesting together they become, once again, Kether. When Albert Einstein equated space with Bina and time with Shokma, the difficulties inherent per perennially obscured terminologies resolved themselves immediately. Bina and Shokma are known to Kabbalists as the Great Supernal Mother and the Great Supernal Father. They call Bina, or understanding, the dark sea of being. It'd be passive, feminine, potency. An infinite reservoir of power for creation or destruction. In the Tao, we Synoviets, people of the Sinitic culture system, knew this as Yin. The active and evident father, Shokma, or wisdom, is called the bright sea of forms. It contains every possible archetype of objects, actions, ideas, structures, or any other category one could name. It be rendered obvious in hindsight how Einstein interpreted these titles as space and time, with Shokma being the yang as understood in the Tao of the Sinitic traditions. So, mystic tomes say the light of Shokma shines on the dark waves of Bina, or the light of Yang shines on the dark waves of Yin. Form combines with substance, and the sparkling reflections off those waves form the multiple universes, our multiverse. Even the distinction between form and substance breaks down when Father Time and the cosmic womb space reconjoin in the crown space of Kethersphera, the most inaccessible of the planes, the ultimate realm of indivisible being. Kether is also called the prima mobile, the mundane shell, or the aleph, the first letter of the Hebrew language and Phoenician alphabets, which properly has no sound of its own, but usually has a vowel associated with it. It's literally unspeakable. Everything becomes one in the Kether. Someone who reaches Kether will see everything, in fact, will be everything, the entire multiversal expanse of time, space, and dimensions. Reaching Kether's sphere itself is not a feat for a mystic, because anyone who could attain Kether would not be a mystic anymore. They would be God, supreme being of the multiverse. What is more, to those on the lower levels of reality, they would always have been God, because Kether stands outside time. Ergo, or therefore everyone else who ever has or ever will reach Kether is God as well and always has been. To incept one's cosmology with the development of the space-time continuum itself is a more sophisticated approach than that of most modern scientists. Einstein's Kabbalistic theories led to the Big Bang model of spontaneous universal generation. The primal atom explodes, the particles expand outwards, the stars come into being. But the Kabbalists before him thought differently as part of their training. Rather than outlining a step-by-step -step development, their tree of life represents conditions necessary for physical manifestation. We say one thing came before the other, but all we really mean is that certain conditions were necessary for matter to form, wherein such delicate differentiation do we approach the penultimate motivation for risking spiritual extinguishment and crossing the dotted abyssal line on the Kabbalistic glyph from the lower seventh fairy into Atzaluth above? For the Atzaluthic Olaim includes a fourth element secreted dead center, the desert of Dim, the lost non sephira of Da'ath's knowledge by leap of faith. The interfacial link between the sphere of Shokmatic wisdom and the sphere of Binaltic understanding balanced between timeless Atzaluth and the realms below, an interdimensional juxtaposition so potent in potential as to be intentionally excluded from majority of graphic Kabbalistic representations. It's not on the map. Some you will find a dotted suggestion of it. But mostly, it's never represented because it's too dangerous for the uninitiated to even know of. Knowledge is power. 
awareness is danger. Foremost among the leading scientists in classical antiquity, one of the greatest mathematicians of all time, the ancient Eleniki, our Greek physicist, engineer, inventor, and astronomer, Archimedes of Syracuse. He was an individual who said, Give me a lever long enough and a place to stand, and I will move the earth. Das be that place on which to stand and move the universe on intercosmic scale. From Das, a mystic can call on the limitless power of Bina, shape it with the archetypes of Shokma, and cast their creation into the realms of time. Only the mystic's intelligence, patience, and skill limits what they can create from a flower to a galaxy. And what is more, as Das exists outside time, the mystic can insert their new creation at any point in history, past, present, or future. Das nature renders it understandably one of the greatest secrets in sorcerer's lore, and secreted it should be. As Das is to a sathera, as a black hole be to a star. The gateway of Das be the opening of a pathway through the abyss itself, a sephirothic wormhole, allowing dissension to the netherworlds of Genom, Giena, access to the antiverses of Sitra Akra, the other side, the antithesis of the holistic, it is the unholy, the domains of Diabolos, Diabolos, the devils. Sorcerers know of this fifth phase, Olemic, or worldly level, through the Kabbalistic schematic, rarely ever acknowledged by open practitioners, not on most Kabbalah diagrams, not on the map, on a bi-dimensional planner field of representation as applied throughout the ages, yet overwhelmingly excluded from popular Kabbalah graphics. Below the tree of life hangs entrails, polyped by the ten klipoth, the klipot, literally husks, shells, or peels, from the singular klipa or husk. The representation of impure or evil spiritual forces. This dangling extestinal tract mulches beneath Asia as Timit or Tijmit in the proper Hebraic. I speak it with the guttural sound of the Babylonian that was used by Michael Aquino. So in the more proper Hebraic, Tishmit, the tree of death, be from which polyps the clipothic shells, clipotic, exist as shattered sphere of evil and disease, containing ancient dimensions whose energies decayed into forms inimical to all positive forms of life and existence. The clipot they're themselves infertile and lifeless with no independent existence, vacuous apparitions sustained in their seeming vitality and existence only by the very divine light they have captured, humanity's damned. By way of clipot, evil has no life of its own, as the very source of evil be both intrinsically connected to and yet parasitic in relation to the divine light. As the absoluthic Orlam holds the fountainhead of all existence. The clipotic netherverse holds the drain down which all existence eventually runs to nullification. Each sephira has its correspondent clipo, and the planetary correspondences are identical for both, while somewhat anticlimactic on discussion of the space-time continuum as I've already articulated, we might equally well wonder at how ancient Kabbalists knew of other planets and even other solar systems. For there be clear indications in a number of Hebraic tradition writings that they did. 
all the way to beyond the naked eye planets into planets later discovered the Georgian world named after King George till its name was changed to Uranus the world of Neptune the planet Pluto now deemed a dwarf planet known to the ancients if they're not referencing Pluto they're referencing what we would call planet X the trans-Neptunian world we're still searching for the subsequent view of medieval cavalis of Christendom was that the clipo festoon and inverted debts or an upside down tree pendant below Malkuth or our material world as a malignant root system beneath all et hashayim all the tree of life as such tijmit or tree of death bearing poisonous fruit of the klipot as it does has traditionally been perceived as the lowest depth of the Asiatic and was to be avoided as a cosmic composture of gross materiality and carrion spirits. The cosmos cesspit fertilizing our tree of life above. Ingressed or entered most directly through the gateway of death, which I've described as that black hole hidden in that abyss never shown on most conventional glyphs of Kabbalah. The Klipotic universe is traversed via the 22 sewers of Sethen. Satan, underlying and correspondent unto the 22 paths upon Etz Hashayim, the tree of life. As the paths of wisdom connect the radiant Sephiroth on the tree of life, the sewers of Sethen tunnel the tumorous worlds of the Klipot festooning the tree of death. The netherverse of the sewers is infested with disease, horror, and danger, as well as swarming with demons and Kliports, which be other indigenous infernal denizens. The grimoires or grammars, the spell books describe demon lords riding beasts akin to equines, canis, or crocodilinia. In disambiguation from the comparatively impotent souls of the damned, which comprise their food source. Such be the ecology of toxic processing in the sewers below our universes. At the absolute limit of negative existence, non existence, lurks the nullity, itself unknowable, for there be nothing to know. As anyone who attained Kether would become one with the creator and creation alike, anyone who descended into the null would disassemble into unbeing and suffer annihilation forever in no time. Meaning, no time as in timelessness. Therefore, no limit to their disintegration and their endless suffering. No mystic, not even the most erratical of Kabbalists, has ever explored more than a few dimensions in Tijmet. Seeking knowledge of the Klipot is both morally and physically dangerous. Mystics who study the Tree of Death tend, unsurprisingly, to die in brutally spectacular fashion, or at the least develop a sick fascination with destruction and oblivion, like Michael Aquino. Such madmen have since established themselves the priesthood of America's arsenal of democracy contemporarily leading our kind and even our cosmos beyond perdition. And therefore, when you take a look at your philosophy, when you look at where you're going in the Klipotic world, then you find yourself in annihilation. Annihilation in its etymological root as a term means brought into nihilism, nihilism, or nothingness. All at the bottom of which 
at the absolute limit of this negative existence, anti-existence, lurks the solipsist, the decreator, the anti-god. The closest any being can come to the solipsist is an entity called Prometheus, the crowd of gods. Prometheus, be a churning, chaotic fusion of long defunct cosmic entities. It mindlessly sucks in anything that comes near, like a supernatural black hole. Anything eaten by Quimetiel be gone forever. All of this is the ultimate destination of those who say reality is what you make it. The solipsists. The philosophy of solipsism that I can pick and choose leads to this. And that's what leads us to the concept of scientific revolutions. When people think in popular terms, in terms of mass ignorance, they all fall back on the concept of the Copernican revolution. Now, the Copernican revolution was a revolution that should never have happened because it was entirely unnecessary because the ancient Kabbalists knew there were nine worlds knew that these worlds were bound to the sun. And yet, when we lost that knowledge, when we severed ourselves from God, we became ignorant of the worlds and had to rediscover them using material tools, which to cite them. All of this was a rediscovery of that we always knew. So when we worked on restructuring our universe with this so-called paradigmatic revolution, we were simply rediscovering something that should never have been lost. And because we were only now rediscovering it, we declared ourselves as having attained a new level of progress when we were simply trying to recapture what was secretly preserved by arcane occultists in order to maintain that little bit of humanity that kept our candles burning in the field of knowledge. When we think now on physics, we have to work backwards in order to make things work. When America finally landed itself on the moon, they did exactly what the Axis did. They had to use Newtonian mechanics. They didn't use Einsteinian physics to get to the moon because Einsteinian physics takes us to other dimensions, takes us into space and time. So when you're simply going to our binary planetary body, our siamized twin, the moon, Celine Diana by its classical name, then what you're using is a more primitive level of physics, Newtonian mechanics, in order to get there. And for that very reason, you're going backwards. That's how simplistic this exercise of traveling to the moon is. So we went backwards in physics in order to get to the moon. No matter who gets there, we're using Newtonian mechanics. We're not traveling to other stars. We don't need to break the speed of light. And yet, when it comes to Einsteinian physics, which succeeded the Newtonian, People are waiting for the next revolution. But unlike the Copernican system, which was simply a rejection of ignorance for that knowledge, which should never have been lost about our physical universe, 
what happens in each and every scientific revolution be but expansion of the old knowledge. So the quantum revolution to come, even more so than what's already manifest, that physics but expands upon Einstein. It doesn't replace it. It doesn't overturn it any more than Einsteinian physics rendered Newtonian physics impossible or outdated or inapplicable. All Newtonian mechanics is still applicable in technology or applied science. So when it comes to the Newtonian mechanics that we can still use anytime we wish to get back to the moon, so too will Einsteinian physics always be with us. There's no overturning of that paradigm. It will simply be expanded upon, improved upon, as we move into the greater universe and traverse the stars. So in order for us to succeed and ultimately reach the stars, we have to use physics that work. We have to use the quantum technologies that are applicable based on that which is standing upon the foundations, the shoulders of the giants of Einstein and Newton. Those men are immortal and they, nor their paradigms, will ever die. But as we move on the shoulders of those giants to expand into our universe, no one will be basing new technologies on any form of solipsism. And yet, when it comes to social engineering, those of you who wish to re-engineer our world at the social level of political experience, supposedly for the better, where we're not exploiting ourselves and most certainly not exploiting children. Those of you who want to defeat, dismantle the pedopathocracy, the Satanists which rule this Malkuthian universe, this physical world, you all choose solipsism. Oh, Douglas Dietrich says this, but I'm going to put together a little bit of David Icke, of Jim Mars, of Richard Dolan, and all these other Satanists, with the only non-Satanist, Douglas Dietrich, to come up with my version, my narrative, my fabrication. And this solipsism takes you both intellectually and spiritually into the nullity, the vacuum, the vortex of the anti-god below at the bottom of the sewer of shit beneath the tree of death the fountainhood of nullity and nothingness of nullification of nihilism it takes you toward annihilation so you become the willing agent of the cosmo developers the cosmic desecrators because Guillaume that tree of death at root to use entendre be not separate from the divine at all from our perspective Kabbalistic or no God bears two sides as currency and coinage or paper all are essentially one as above and or below on the trees of life and death. What we experience as evil is as divine as what we experience as good. With the kalpas, the aeons, recycle the failings of man through the catabolism of his pains. Among so many other matters, HaKabbalah teaches the soul's pre-existence. Parasitically dependent upon the light of God, evil cannot exist sans the cosmic ecology of holiness. Our universe be finally balanced on a razor's edge of divine symmetry. If certain natural forces varied in their values by the tiniest fractions, not even stars could exist. In fact, in an infinite number of other possible universes, those values are different and stars do not exist. 
rendering it literally physically impossible for life to exist. In aeons before humanity, beings of mind-shattering power roamed the planes of these lifeless universes. The most secreted lore of Kabbalism obliquely enumerates these entities, the kings of Edom. Beings from unstable worlds God created and destroyed before our own terrestrial cosmos marked the pinnacle of his creation. Parables from ancient oracles and the ravings of mystics driven mad by studying the kings suggest these entities sourced from dimensions collapsed into oblivion, kalpas are gone. Age after age they move from one plane to another, becoming ever more powerful. For billions of years no other power stood against them, for none was there to stand among the chasms between divinity and desolation. Not one in a billion barren worlds might suffer a king of Edom's visit in a trillion years, but where kings of Edom came, they and their servitor spawn wrought utter dissimulation of what matter was encountered. For such sundered matters bearing elemental awarenesses, as spoken of in Tao Zhui, the school of the way, the horror of disillusion must have been inconceivable. Only mysterious hints survive in mystic lore, but it be understood that when our earthly universe was incepted, the kings were weakened by the cleaving of radiance throughout the multiversal blacknesses and eventually bound in hidden, empty prison dimensions on worlds of desolation. But the creator of humanity, an image of divinity, allowed free will. In the last century of the last millennium, freely applied will to usurp the throne of creation has opened the gates into anti-reality, a lethal violation of natural laws that could potentially destroy God himself as manifest in our embodiment by annihilation of our species. In the new science of relativity, with its foreboding hints that human logic is of very limited use among the vicissitudes of these universes, spawned two notable developments in the 1930s. One was immediate research into weaponization of the atom by the combined axis of nations, which I have articulated in detail both on air and in writ columns as producing the axis standardized ordinance Little Boy Uranium Shell. The other development was establishment of an Edomite lore program with objectives to weaponize Kamala's universal metaphysical schematic by the United States, initiated simultaneous plutonium bomb production, per like anti-theistic American rationale, anti-godly. Said project pursued in alchemical belief, the plutonium bomb's deployment would disintegrate the primordial matter of the world, thereby obviating extended efforts to evoke and bind the anti-gods for ultimate offensive against the creator and its champions, the Axis powers. And so it began that think tanks in Daos and Los Alamos ran non-Euclidean solutions through contemporaneously powerful computators to awaken the ancient ones and summon extra cosmic abominations. Whereas the necessary evils of war are recognizably human, the taint concomitant manipulation of that which man was not meant to know twists and malforms every thought and deed. Such insanity, of course, renders explicable the hidden truth behind allied lunacies as perpetrated throughout the Second World War, protracted through today. And a quantum leap into darkness has since taken place within the dimension of cyberspace by way of accessibility and disambiguation from centuries of bidimensional representation, wherein only symbolic inversion of Gernom, Gerna, beneath the universal model was extant. Modeled via modern supercomputer processing lies a dark reverse mirror image of the Sephirothic tree of life and death behind its Hashayim, a realm of anti-life since designated simply Rasha, the unholy, extraneous to God and his creation and protracted programmatic coordination of an array of questionably acquired ancient tomes and pre-human artifacts of Edomite lore with a reconfigured harp, high-frequency activated auroral atmospheric resonance research projection program 
of globally networked ionospheric conductor array project sites, originally centered on Gakona, Alaska, has realized evocation as a super science. And, of course, the ultimate entropic bomb. Rather arsenal the arrow to which I hold the cosmic trigger which I stole from Michael Aquino's own Department of Defense project. The Vox Arca, the voice box. From which I can release that hell on Earth. So when I try to expose to you historic truth and you deny it, all you're aiding is the enemy. So when some idiot like Mahin Ahmed tries to turn it into a psyop and say, oh, well, why would they say it's aliens and then turn around and deny it the next day? It's so telling that none of these motherfuckers ever mention the fact that prior to the Roswell atrocity of 1947, in the heat of war itself, right at its very conception of proactive prosecution of hostilities on the global level, we had the Battle of Los Angeles. And in that Battle of Los Angeles, the headlines were printed 9 a.m. final on the Los Angeles Times. Los Angeles area raided. Jap Plains, Peril, Santa Monica, Seal Beach, El Segundo, Redondo, Long Beach, Hermosa, and Signal Hill. They're roaring out of a brilliant moonlit western sky. Japanese aircraft, flying both in large formation and singly, flew over Southern California early today. That, of course, being February 25th, Wednesday morning. 1942. And drew heavy barrages of anti-aircraft fire. The first ever to sound over United States continental soil against an enemy oriental invader. About 25 planes at 12,000 over Los Angeles. At 306, a balloon reported to be carrying a red flare was seen over Santa Monica. And, of course, reports were given of exactly where these planes were shot down. Per the story on page one in the Los Angeles Times, police reported a Jap airplane had been shot down near 185th and Vermont Avenue. Children ran out the next day to actually tear what they could from the wreckage as souvenirs. Some of them garnering bloody parachute harnesses to take home and prize as their proof that they had desecrated the body of a Japanese aeronaut in World War II, making them as combat experienced in their own way as any American soldier or Marine or sailor or airman on the front lines. And then how did it come about that this Battle of Los Angeles, in which Japanese men died, whose bodies were torn asunder in terms of their uniforms being stripped by children, white trash pieces of shit, the white savages in whose continent they had the misfortune to land, how is it suddenly our reports disappeared? And they became alien. That's the real psyop, you Bangladeshi trash piece of shit. You South Asian sewage dweller. You bumfucker in Bangladesh. That's the real story, Mahin Ahmed. So that when Japanese prisoners of war 
We're all Asians of various ethnicities, Taiwanese, Korean, Okinawan. They all served the Empire of Japan. Crashed with being forced to involuntarily fly their unconventional aircraft for the Americans to demonstrate their use. The Americans, of course, first reported it to be aliens from outer space. Changing the story later because, of course, no one could stick with that shit. Because people would say, well, then, where are the aliens? What could they do other than, that, other than say, it's a weather balloon? But already, the purpose had been served. And from then on, you would think of all Asian prisoners of war as extraterrestrials, you dumb Muslim motherfucker! So here we have the losers among the Mohammedans, just as we have them among the Christians, following a satanic propaganda campaign, and then trying to say... Douglas Dietrich operates from a system of belief, whereas the satanic shit they spew be fact. And that, of course, brings us at least out of that onto the reality that I worked with in terms of exposing that atrocity over a period of years. When the Japanese were informed of the fragments of the atrocity at Roswell that I had absconded with from the federal government, they invested tens of millions of dollars to build a Holocaust Memorial Museum for the Japanese and their allies who had died on American soil at American hands. The Aqua City Roswell Holocaust Memorial Museum. Millions of dollars, tens of millions invested. All of this was to house much of what I had turned over publicly for review. This is what led William Jefferson Clinton approached by all of the elderly war criminals in the American high command to retaliate, this is why he declared a hostile trade imposition upon the Japanese, which resulted in the Japanese divesting out of the United States and revesting in communist China. All of which resulted in the end of the American age of affluence and the beginning of our age of recession. All of this due to my expositions. William Jefferson Clinton the trade agreement he ratified between the United States and Japan signed into being in 1996 put an end to many of Japan's import quotas against American goods all of this on the advisement of a madman who claimed it would level the playing field a primary Democrat and financial sponsor of Hillary Rodham Clinton, a man named Donald John Trump. By that time, the Japanese had spent well over $50 million on the Hakui City Holocaust Memorial Museum based on the Roswell Atrocity in particular, on November 17th of 1995, Robert Dean, along with Colin Andrews in the United Kingdom, 
Robert Dean in the United States, they announced on Town Meeting, a televisual series hosted by Ken Schramm at the Hockwee City Museum would open in July of 1996, about a year prior to the half-century mark for the Roswell Commemorative Memorial Date. This was announced on November 17th of 1995. A tourist package was sold. Many of the parts, of course, that were sent to Art Bell, not by myself, but by Michael Aquino, were, of course, subjected to spectrographic analysis by Linda Moulton Howe on May 9th of 1996. He had received them on April 18th of that year. All of them proved, of course, to be terrestrial bits and pieces, the same kind of fragments of aircraft that I had stolen from the Department of Defense. Japanese aircraft parts, Japanese dirigible parts that were non-fabric. Of course, this proved it to be exactly what it was. Paint identified as Japanese airskin. All of this proves indisputably the Japanese were involved in the Roswell atrocity as victims, prisoners of war, never returned to Japan, which is why no one in Asia, either Korea or Vietnam, ever returned American prisoners from their own conflicts because so many of their troops had died here in the United States serving the Japanese empire, all speaking Japanese, just as white Canadians, white Americans, white Welshmen, white Irishmen, white Scots, all speak the English language, serving either allied or subject the crown of British Empire. In World War II, had they all been taken by a foreign culture, they could not be distinguished apart. So, too, the Americans didn't bother to distinguish Koreans from Vietnamese, from Taiwanese, from Okinawans, from Japanese. They all spoke the Japanese language. Whatever their ethnicities, they all died as servants of empire, servants against the Allied aggression of World War II. And because I exposed all that, generated the hostility across either side of the Pacific, then the belief system comes in. It started before my own exposure of what it truly was. When Aquino began to worry about it, when a Sergeant Melvin Brown, who had been on site at Roswell, began to speak of it when men first walked on the moon. And then what happened was that Sergeant Melvin Brown turned to his kids when he watched a man walk on the moon, landing there using Newtonian physics. He turned around to his kids and said, you know, I'm forced to think of what they said was aliens, but they were really Japs. He told his kids at Roswell, the so-called alien flight crew, which he spoke of as alien, as in foreigner, as all Japanese were documented as enemy aliens. Described them as small with large heads due to malnutrition and skin that was yellow, that turned orange as they'd been severely burned and they turned gray as they died and entered rigor mortis, hence the term grays. All of this report was taken by his children to be extraterrestrials. And so Michael Aquino's fellow Satanist who converted to the Church of Satan in San Francisco and then to Michael Aquino's Temple of Set, Stanton Friedman became the primary propagandist under Michael Aquino's direct orders to promote the extraterrestrial thesis the rest of his life. 
this scumbag, this piece of shit had worked with the United States government on nuclear flight, which simply meant putting a nuclear engine in an old B-29 and spreading radiation all over the United States. So much radiation, he didn't want to live here. So he moved to Canada to get away from the rad zone, the burn zone. And then later on, how did they speak of Roswell, an American professor in journalism, Frank Borzellani, surname spelled B-O-R-Z-E-L-L-A-N-I, wrote the book, Who Believes in Roswell? That's where we get the term belief. Who believes in Roswell? His master's thesis at Fordham University with an introduction written by the preeminent Satanist George Norrie. Who brings you all the pedos? Who peddle you your porn? Your fear porn of reptilians? Your fear porn of demons and reptilians and Nazis? Who all want your money for some reason? While you buy books from Jim Mars and George Norrie's butt buddies. You're buying books from them, but somehow it's the Nazis and the aliens and the demons who all want your money. But you're buying all the books from David Icke and all the other Satanists. Now, Who Believes in Roswell was a survey getting responses from over a thousand people to profile the Roswell cultist, the Roswell believer. The younger the person, the less they believe in Roswell as an alien phenomena. The older they are, the more likely they are to believe in Roswell because it's patriotic. Over 65 is the most likely. Under 14 is the least likely. It's consistent across the board. And, of course, who were the prominent believers? The Roswell cultists. Both Satanists, Stan Friedman and Tom Carey. And stupid Frank Borzelli, his conclusion was that you're more likely to believe the more propaganda that you've absorbed. He substituted age as a proxy for knowledge. He only proved that most people don't get wiser, they just get older. He was saying, oh, the people over 65 all believe in Roswell because they're the smarter ones. And yet, he proved himself that the higher your educational level the less you would ever believe in Roswell. Over a thousand people from 30 locales cross-referenced with who believes intelligent life in the Zinnir universe. Those who know, like Douglas Dietrich, there is no intelligent life outside of our universe in our regional area. Indeed, it's hard to find intelligent life here. Know that there is no Roswell. So, you have to have a conspiracy worldview. Those who believe we never went to the moon. Those who believe the world is flat. Those who believe there's never any historical event known as the Holocaust are three times as likely to believe in Roswell. Holocaust deniers, flat earthers, non-lunar landing believers, There is no middle way. It's all based on your politics and your religiosity. Those identified as very religious from the old school of reactionary Protestantism, the evangelicals, were the most likely to believe in Roswell. Those who believe in creationism and God in America were the most likely to believe there were aliens from outer space who made technological advances like microwave ovens and pacemakers possible. How's that for a contradictory belief system? A supernatural mindset leads you to the Roswell conspiracy from an alien, actual extraterrestrial perspective. The more reactionary, the more Roswellian you are. Because 65 years ago, you took things on a matter of faith. You believed what Uncle Sam told you. And the less educated you were, the more likely you were to believe. The majority of World War II veterans were high school dropouts. Of course they believed it was aliens. They couldn't even tell a Jap when they saw one. Or any Asian, any gook for that matter. To them, they were all might as well come from a different planet. The more liberal you are, the less likely you are to believe, especially if you're atheist or agnostic. 
you're least likely to believe in Roswell. So there is no middle way based entirely on politics, age, and lack of education. And of course, your, if you're a college graduate, a PhD, then you know Roswell didn't happen the way it's described as an alien interface. And of course, high school dropouts are the most likely to believe because they have no sense of discernment or critical thinking training. Those who believe in superstitions or psychic powers without evidence are most likely to believe. And the only people who believe in Roswell are Americans. They're far more likely to believe than foreigners. So how is it that an idiot like Mahid Ahmed in Bangladesh suddenly believes? Because he's a Satanist. There is no other conclusion to be drawn. How else would a foreigner who has not even a stake in such insanity believe such an asinine assertion? Because he's a Satanist. So you've been outed, Mahi Nakhmed. You are the Satanist. You are the Satanist who is promoting Satanic propaganda in South Asia. Therein, can we finally turn to another subject as a transitional one when we think of what happened when I exposed everything I did to the Japanese, brought them what they needed, the Americans lashed back, even the FBI went to investigate the Hakui City Memorial Museum. Because of what I had stolen from the federal government, it was considered U.S. government property. That would be like the Germans grabbing some artifact from the Holocaust and saying, oh, that's German property and trying to take it back from Israel. The Japanese hostility was understandable and their reaction was immediate. Divestiture in the American economy, revestiture in communist China. But on a personal level, the people I had been dealing with throughout that period of time, from 1995 through 1996, very heavily, were the people who were most responsible for popularizing the tourist packages to be sold to Cosmo Isle Hakui Museum. Hakui spelled H-A-K-U-I in the romanization. Cosmo Isle Hakui Museum, the tour package was sold predominantly through the same company that dealt with the publicity of this specific museum, this project, Teleport USA. And it was Mr. Tetsu Matsuo, name Romanized, M-A-T-S-U-O, first name Tetsu, T-E-T-S-U. He was a spokesman for Teleport USA who fielded it most of the communications in the United States. Teleport USA was headquartered in Los Angeles in terms of its American outlet. And of course, what happened was that he and his staff were the people I communicated with highly intensely for well over a year. They wanted to know everything about my background. I proved who I was, provided them all evidence, all the documents, which people constantly attack in the United States, were investigated by private investigators employed by the Japanese and found to be genuine and real and indisputable. And then they wanted to know about my experiences, supernatural, metaphysical, anything. So my experiential anecdotes personally related myself via contacts through Teleport USA back in the mid-1990s. Precepts, propositions, 
per the Hackway City Memorial Museum, originally dedicated to the Roswell atrocity, were destined to influence postmodern Japanime profoundly for decades to come. There are more manga, what Americans call graphic literature, graphic novels, comic books, properly rendered as storyboards, which in turn become the storyboards for animation or anime. There are more manga and anime that are detraconic than you can shake a stick at. Everything after that period in time that became recognized in the United States, up to and including Full Metal Alchemist, as mentioned by Pavel Edward Provada, our executive producer, is something he's just recently run across. You can see Colonel Mustang based on the Dietrichonic model as a personality profile. You can see it in Alucard. You can see it in Vampire Hunter D. Even taking his name from the Damphir. The hybrid vampire. Douglas Dietrich. And then finally you have Native Americans like Marty Man. Martin J. Janelle. In Canada. a member of the First Nations of Canada, who's pointed out that the law is on my side, that Proclamation 2714 shows the United States of America had to lay down arms and surrender. The United States of America cleaned up the atomic bombs all by American troops, not Japanese, so the Japanese wouldn't be exposed to the radiation. The Americans used their bodies to soak it all up from Hiroshima and Nagasaki, cleaning up the mess they made. The most obvious aspect of American surrender being the humbling of the United States of America at the Treaty of San Francisco. Game over, the United States of America. Going home in shame and lamentations. And yet you people are still in denial. Here we have a situation in which the Russians and the Japanese are still legally at war. Two headlines come to mind I can bring up right now. I've got them up before me on my computer screen. Putin wants a peace treaty with Japan before the end of this year. That was September 12th, 2018. The very next day, the headline Putin's olive branch fails to impress Japan. September 13th, 2018. Putin offered a few islands. The Japanese want them all. The Japanese had the opportunity with the collapse of the Soviet Union to instantaneously and overnight become the second largest navy on earth after the United States. Now, it's hard to judge the size of a fleet or a navy. There's various factors which can be interpreted. There's the concept of actual fleet size of the fleet and being. There's the concept of the assets of the fleet. What have you got to flow? What can it do? Hands down, the United States, due to the Reagan era expansion, has the largest navy in the world. All the navies in the world put together come up to less than half the size of the American navy, or uh, about half the size of the American fleet and being. Certainly that's been the way for a while. It's not size that counts. The Americans, of course, sail the seas of the world, claiming themselves the world's policemen. And what they base their fleets on are what are called attack carriers, which are, of course, these very large carriers that are meant to project an enormous amount of aerial power into a coastal region. They cannot project power deep inland. That's what you have long-range bombers for. That's the purview of the United States Air Force. When it comes to the Navy, they can only attack the coast fairly deep in 
to coastal regions, but not beyond, not into the heartland of any nation. They just don't have the capability to do that. You'd be amazed at how short the range is of a modern fighter bomber jet. Its range is practically null. It eats up so much fuel so fast it can stay in the air for hours and then it has to fly back or it's not flying back at all and you lose billions of dollars in a single asset. So America's big stick is very short. Now, the rest of the world, for the longest period of time, the second largest navy in the world, aside from that of the United States, was the French Navy. Because they were the only other navy that had an attack carrier, based on that definition. In another sense, it was the Soviet Navy. And the Soviet Navy had only one attack carrier. But it had the largest merchant fleet, second to that of Greece. But most of Greece's fleet was flying under foreign flag. So as a merchant fleet, the biggest was that of the Soviets, and then they had their naval fleet try and catch up and match it in numbers to defend the merchant fleet, their convoys overseas. And, of course, they did this with rocket carriers. Most Soviet ships carried rockets. The aircraft carriers did because they knew their aircraft carrier wasn't large enough to compete head-to-head -head with American carriers in some carrier battle royale. So the objective was to have the planes intercept American planes Whereas the Soviet carrier would attack the American carrier with rockets or any other ship. The Japanese carriers are built that way today. And they're listed as super destroyers. Their super destroyers are as big as World War II Japanese aircraft carriers. So if you take into account the number of these types of carriers which carry planes as a defensive armament, with an offensive armament being rockets. Whereas the Soviets had one, the Japanese have five. And they're building more. And so the Soviet carrier, its flagship, the Admiral Kuznetsov, is a floating Chernobyl. It's considered punishment detail for any sailor assigned, Donnie, because it's a shortening of your lifespan by at least 20 years. Because you'll be so exposed to radiation while you're on it, you're not going to come home without being impacted to such a point where you will be sterile. You'll never have children. And you're going to live for only a very short period of time once you're off that ship. That's the floating nightmare they've got that has to be dragged from one ocean to another by tugboats. Because the Nuclear reactor is only maintained to keep it from melting down. It doesn't propel the ship. The Soviets tried to sell this with the collapse of the Soviet Union and the creation of the Russian Commonwealth of Independent States. The body of oversight created to oversee the bankruptcy of the Soviet Union. They tried to sell the entire fleet, nuclear submarines, carrier and all, lock, stock and barrel to the Japanese, every single ship. With the collapse of the Soviet Union in 1991, the Japanese came to inspect the Soviet Navy and said, we don't want any of this shit. This stuff doesn't even float. We're better off just building our own Navy, rather expanding what we have with our own domestic technology, which will be far more advanced. You can kiss it goodbye. The Russians never forgave them. And that's why they continued the war after the Soviet collapse with Japan, though they ended it with the Thousand Year Reich in exile. Now, just recently, days ago, the president of the Empire of Japan, its prime minister, Shinzo Abe, went to visit Vladimir Putin in his home lair in Moscow. And he went in state of war. Japan is still legally at war with Russia, and the Prime Minister of Japan went into the heart of enemy territory under state of war and had no fear that he would not be coming home. That's how powerful the Japanese are compared to the Russians. 
they're in the position of strength, and yet the Russians still think they won the fucking war. Rather, their population does, because like Americans, they're brainwashed in a matrix of nonstop propaganda. How crazy is that? Can you imagine if you were still legally at war with the Third Reich on the surface world, Adolf Hitler came to visit the United States with no fear that he was going to go home unharmed without anyone attempting to take him hostage. That would show you, for all intents and purposes, you lost the fucking war. Well, that's what happened with Russia and Japan just the other day. And yet, you dumbass Russians out there still say, we won the war! You dumbass Americans are still out there saying, our great Russian allies won the war! We won the war! Your heads are all so far up your ass, you're no better than the Muslims you make fun of in fucking Bangladesh with an idiot like Mahi Nachmed who in no way, shape, or form embodies the Muslim norm because he's actually a Satanist. You're as satanically stupid as he is. And now, when we move from that level of psychosis, of mass self-deception, of voluntary insanity. A dear friend of ours, Shona Rene Bandau, hugging a kiss under they. G says unto me, please, Douglas, don't go the way of Sarian and the rest of the Rothschilds conspiracy informers and theorists like these guys. And points out Michael Sarian nowadays is demanding pay for what he says. And, uh, of course, Sean Rene Bandau, Sean Rene Bandau, I take her point quite well. She says, Sarian, really? I don't like how all your stuff is paid now. If this is information you think the world should know, it should be free. The truth shall be free to set you free. It should not be privy to only certain folks who can pay. Sounds like you are starting to follow the new trend of becoming the Rothschilds of conspiracy theorists and the rest of the world can go to hell. You are no better. I thought you were better than this. I was wrong. Good luck with your paid-only audience. Well, certainly, I'll take whatever help I can get financially. But there is no point in asking for money, honey, because most people aren't going to give it. (laughs) I'm lucky I've got a few people like Ramona Aletha Henry sponsoring myself now, as well as my Maki benefactress, Fabia Floriani, the ever fabulous Fabia Floriani. I don't know if uh, our man Ben Estenius is even still in the game anymore. I'll follow up with him some more this month. Uh, if he doesn't follow up with me, uh, we'll remove his commercials. I hope it doesn't come to that. But other than that, uh, I can't get anybody other than some wonderful people who have sent help, what help they can in the past. Uh, but of course, when people really need to help me, they need to send around a hundred dollars. Uh, and that has to be fairly regularly, like on a monthly level. That's what helps me survive a higher quality of life. But aside from that, uh, many people do help. Every penny helps. And there's wonderful human, uh, individuals, Stephen Myers, Salman Sheikh, uh, a number of people I'll be forgetting to mention, and I, I apologize profoundly for that, but people have sent me, you know, $20, $40, $50 here or there. Uh, uh, Mark Frack, God bless it. Uh, if you're listening, Mark Frack, love you, dear brother. Um, I, you know, people are helping whenever they can. Uh, our, our dear friend uh, uh, Sarah Shields helped me with $20 once, it, it, you know, it, 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 or more or beyond, maybe 40 maybe half a hundred. I don't remember exactly. The uh, people help when they can, that's, that's appreciated. And uh, please continue to do so or do so if you can, so long as it doesn't break you. Believe me, I, I need every, every penny of help I can get. Uh, but people who truly um, are helping regularly become sponsors. Uh, I try to thank them as much as possible. Uh, I love them personally whenever I can or in, in you know whatever time I can spare to speak to them. Uh, but we got to remember as well that uh, uh, obviously um, – uh, I, I have to maintain a higher quality of life than I would be able to do otherwise without help. 
And uh, it, it's no shame that I ask for money, and I do expect them from people who listen to me, and we shouldn't rely on those particular sponsors to make this possible for the rest of you. But at the same time, I understand exactly uh, what uh, this young lady is saying. So, uh, Shauna Renee Banda, you don't need to worry because I know better. I know people are not going to pay for what they can get for free, and, uh, and I'm always going to be there in that sense. Uh, but at the same time, uh, I don't understand where people come under the impression that somehow I'm destitute or desperate because I've never begged for money in the sense that some idiot like that New Zealander Kiwi, uh, fuck, what's that guy's name who's on uh, American Freedom Radio? I, I can't even remember the idiot's name. Uh, he begs for money constantly and it's wretched, it's pathetic, it's invasive of what's personal and private space uh and uh he, he's just awful and uh so if anybody remembers his name you can go ahead and tell me i i, I honestly don't remember his name <laughs> uh, uh eastwood Vinny, thank you thank you thank you i couldn't get that out without you that's from my uh executive producer pavel uh edward Provara. yeah Vinny eastwood yes that idiot yeah, Vinny Eastwood is an example of a desperate beggar. He is pathetic. Uh, he is a man who literally lives hand to mouth based on your donations. And uh, so uh, definitely I am, uh, you know, it's just disheartening uh, to look at somebody like that. It's not even worth living to live like that. So uh, he's someone who um, is someone I never want to be, and I would uh, never um, be like that and never have been like that. So that's what makes it so offensive, which brings us to the next part uh, where I have to enter several of the subjects that I'll take up the next uh, few hours. Uh, that's what brings us to Niall Parkinson, who I don't want to dwell on as an individual, but uh, I will bring up uh, what he sent to my uh, executive producer, Pavel Pravara, trying to seduce him away from producing for myself to produce for himself, Niall Parkinson. He was doing this while I was transmitting on bandwidth, while I was burning bandwidth, mind you. This son of a bitch, Niall Parkinson, was trying to seduce my executive producer to be his producer for his show, Dark Age Discussions, which is his weekly add-on to his Dark Age Design Studios uh, what used to be dark design, uh, it's dark, dark age design, and it's all about not the past dark age, but the future or the present, the dark age we're entering now, because, of course, now Parkinson is the Satanist. And, uh, you might say, oh, why would you say that? Oh, God, the hints are just, aside from his art, just like uh, the art that was uh, that Rose Dio was uh, obsessed with, much of it was produced by Niall Parkinson. Uh, the repulsive little devils. Uh, she showed us her icon, it's a Tara, uh, which announced herself and her alignment. Uh, this is what is produced by Niall Parkinson in Ireland. And uh, so here's this idiot who basically is trying to assault myself, attack myself while I'm burning bandwidth by sending a nonstop salvo, uh, just message after message, uh, dozens, if not hundreds. Scores of messages at the very least, but I'm told at least half a hundred, probably more like 200. Uh, while I was burning bandwidth to our man, uh, Pavel, uh, trying to get him to produce for him. And uh, then he has the uh, indecency to start attacking me via private messages to Pavel, which I've no doubt he publishes on his own forum or format, saying, Douglas is not the son of Hitler is not a vampire chewing on and murdering homeless people around San Francisco. Well, fuck, I would hope not. Is not half man, half machine. That is pure fantasy. His intention is to get him out of the shit financially. Now, he keeps mentioning this. I'm uh, in some financial hole, some financial shit hole that I've got to get myself out of desperately. The truth is, my biggest complaint, which I do want to take care of, is $2,000 in credit which forces me to pay $100 in interest a month. I'd love to stop doing that. 
Of course, no one's going to give me $2,000. We need $2,000, of course, for Pavel Pravara so he can get his server up and running. We need $2,000 to uh, maintain John Warrington, who invested that much in his computer system by which he maintains my archives. You know, each one of us needs two grand. And I could see this becoming a running joke the rest of my life. Uh, circumstances being what they are, our world is entering a spiral. And as a result, it's going to change radically. People are going to, of course, ask for some kind of advisement. This is where my Vulcan intervention will be manifest. And I can see even at that point, I'll still be holding my hand out saying, hey, has anyone got 2,000 books? I mean, that could possibly wind up on my tombstone, you know, where it'll say, while I'm six feet under, something like about that credit score. I mean, really, I could see that happening. So. You know, this is just going to be something that's ongoing throughout my life. That is not the deep, dark hole that this idiot is claiming that it is. After all, I could just stop paying and just declare myself bankrupt yet again. I might just do that. But other than that, that is not the deep, dark hole this son of a bitch is claiming that I'm in. So when uh, he keeps bringing that up, it really makes me wonder, okay, why is he assaulting my good name? Why is this individual assaulting my reputability? And it's, of course, look at what he assaults. Doris Dietrich is not the son of Hitler. I mean, this can bring us back to oh so much that does need to be covered in any number of transmissions but most certainly, we're going to go into a bit of that. We're going to go into a bit of, of course, a question that was asked by Pavel Provara himself, which is, of course, the time and date that uh, I was uh, assaulted, uh, so to speak, uh, by Michael Aquino, who believed this to be an assault on uh, my psyche, on uh, my sense of well-being, on uh, my sense of self that I was so that I am the son of Adolf Hitler. So when uh, we come up with that uh, reality, one of the things that we're discussing when we have the concept of Hitler relations is the historical reality of those I've already brought up. You can access this online these are not rumors. These are historical facts. The most predominant example of accessible Hitler relation that was adamant about being a Hitler relation was, of course, Adolf Hitler and uh, the son he had with a French teenage girl. And, of course, when you take a look at one example of that, you can find that, of course, in places like... Uh, Say, for instance, the Telegraph, Hitler had a son with a French teen. Adolf Hitler had a son with a French teenager while serving as a soldier during the First World War. According to all evidence, Jean-Marie Loret, who died in 1985, age 67, never met his father, but went on to fight Nazi forces during the Second World War. His extraordinary story has now been backed up by a range of evidence, both in France and Germany. Published in the latest edition of Paris's Le Pont magazine. Uh, basically, they also say later on, he wanted to claim the Hitler heritage in such a way which rendered him, I think, quite unpopular with his French neighbors. Uh, he basically, they say he did not speak French, but solely rant in German. Uh, then it's brought up again with, did Hitler follow a father or son? Uh, Master, I'm Hitler's son. Tell me what to do. One day I was cutting hay with other women when we saw a German soldier on the other side. Now, all of this is part of what, what I'm just finding online in general. These are not uh, sites that are uh, incomprehensible or of ill repute. Uh, so uh, in this case, of course, uh, it's a lineage you wouldn't wish on anyone. But one man who claimed to be Hitler's son is said to have eventually accepted it with pride. Uh, and so, you know, there are various articles on this that people can find, and I recommend you do so because they're examples of what we know to be true. 
And in terms of my case, it brings up several things that I have to address that other people do not even begin to uh, imagine or uh, try to imagine because they just don't live in the same reality. They don't live in uh, the reality of, as Pavel has said it, of my case, of growing up in a political family. And that's essentially what I am, is someone who has grown up in a political family, most specifically in the case of my late and sainted mother. So uh, when we're dealing with that, obviously I was maintained under observation for quite a long period of time. And in terms of uh, my uh, surveillance that I was constantly subjected to, there had to be a reason. I, in and of myself, without that background, would not re would not rate that level of surveillance. So why would they surveil me? Why would they keep me under such surveillance aside from the Hitler legacy? Of course, that's the only reason. But it's also a situation in which there are historical precedents. And the historical precedent be that of the children of Napoleon, who ultimately round up back in power in France, running the French Empire as an empire yet again, and taking France into a series of wars or conflicts that ultimately resulted in their exile back into England where the Napoleons strangely took their shelter. The Napoleonic uh, family and dynasty had a strange relationship with England because, of course, the original Napoleon Bonaparte was murdered by the English. And so once he was murdered by the English, then the English had kind of a sway over the rest of the family or the dynasty, offering them shelter while France itself remained in chaos, going through a series of governments and republics that was, um, shall we say, uh, unsettling to say the least. Uh, far more uh, complex and disastrous than what we see going on with uh, France today. So at that period of time, Britain took advantage of it and reinstated the Napoleonic emperor, the scion of the Napoleon that they had waged world war against. And this was done this time with the emperor dancing to Britain's tune, which is why the little Napoleon, la petite Napoleon, as he was known, Napoleon III, is never really remembered by anyone outside of France. And uh, is, of course, uh, when anyone says Napoleon, most Americans don't even know Napoleon had children that ultimately returned to power in France and that there could be a Napoleonic emperor in the future should situation provide opportunity because his line is still valid, still there. So what you had was the Napoleonic Wars not just going on in the life of one man, but continuing with his grandchildren. So in the case of the Hitler War, the world feared more than anything Adolf Hitler continuing his war on the surface world, reappearing on the surface world, or his children. That's why his children were sought out to be killed. The one man, the Frenchman, who was open and prideful of being Hitler's son was the man who suffered the most. And uh, ultimately was all his life dismissed, uh, attacked as a lunatic, as insane. People are going to attack myself as that anyway. So this is not something that in any way, shape or form detracts uh, from my reputation. My reputation is stellar professionally, it's stellar personally. People are always attacking my sanity and yet they can never 
disprove anything I say because it's based on historical fact, nor can they attack myself as a person because the only way they do so is by criminal acts like forging documentation, which I've proven to be the case irrefutably by government agents themselves proving such forceries are extant and in circulation on the internet. And the criminality of those forgeries is such that these people have gone into hiding or they've killed themselves. John Victor Lillier, Master Sergeant Green Berets killed himself. Richard K. Cole's gone into hiding and showing up only via the Satanist Rose Dio. Both of them, of course, cooperating as cultists at this point, openly satanic. And then when people try to attack what I describe historically or even geographically, that will bring us now into both Utterland and the subject of Hitler to dominate us for a good part of the remainder of this transmission. So here is this now Parkinson idiot. We'll come on to what he said about Hitler, respond to that, come into what uh, was asked by my. Uh, executive director respectfully but before that the thing that stands out most from this Niall Parkinson in his attacks on myself through my executive producer in private messages unto Pavel Niall says he meaning myself mentions Unterland in every transmission by of course he can't spell what he's saying because he's just typing this out like an idiot by he has never he says never in all caps, said exactly where it is located. Most people assume Antarctica. Where is it? And they always say this shit like it's a challenge. Like, tell me now! Like, it's a challenge! Now, first of all, the reason this is so offensive is because I've said this forever. I'm going to say it again. I'm going to go into some detail now because that's what I'm forced to do. But it shows no one's ever listened to what I've been saying. People don't want to hear what the fuck I'm saying. And they don't understand it when I do say it. And they do hear it. They don't comprehend it. They're not absorbing it. Does not compute. So let's go over this now. As briefly as possible. Antarctica is written when it references the Reich in exile on Antarctica on the ice. Antarctica is written with K's and all caps. A-N-T-A-R-K-T-I-K-A. -A -A, the German word for Antarctica. Written all caps means the Ice Reich. Now, that existed for a specific, fairly short period of time. It's referenced as such per the United States Department of the Defense, all in capital letters and Germanic spelling to denote the thousand-year Reich in exile's occupation of the southern continent, serving as primary gateway into Unterland, where permanent reconstitution of the Thaled Reich continuous in its millennial chronology today. Hence, modern National Socialist Antarctic presence was geographically limited but influentially disproportionate. The geophysical reality of Unterland itself, transliterating literally as Underland, meaning the lands below more appropriately, more properly, as in a plurality. Unterland means the lands below, like a plurality. It does not at all imply our world be hollow. The hollow earth obfuscation is perpetrated with intent to occult. It is occlude, meaning to hide reality, confuse you. Unterland is not of a hollow earth, but thy inner aired, the inner earth. Circa 1992. During my final year of service as a USDOD research librarian for the United States Department of the Defense, it was finally released to the scientific community at large and ostensibly the general public, to which such news was, of course, utterly unintelligible, that our planetary mantle, and by the way, Zoe Brendan 
Hugs, Zoe. He says, most dumbasses can't get past the word Antarctica. Thank you. Yes, they can't spell that either. I know. Thank you, Zoe. Yes. They're stuck on the ice. Yes. All right. Now, in terms of uh, the scientific community, it released to the general public the fact that our planetary mantle, which be the deep layers of the Earth's structure, contains loads of water. I'm not saying this in the valley girl sense, like, oh, loads and loads. I, I mean, like, loads, like L-O-D-E-S. That's a, that's a term, a geophysical term. Loads of water are within our planetary mantle that dwarf the existing oceans. Now, this was written of in a work entitled Water in the Earth's Upper Mantle, authored by A.B. Thompson, published in Nature Magazine, Volume 358, pages 295 through 302. Now, the reason this is so impressive is, of course, because the oceans cover the majority of our surface world. As a matter of fact, when you take a look at the biomass, that means the living space of actual living organisms that team on the surface of our world, most of that life teams in the ocean. And therefore, when you take into account how much the ocean covers of our surface, of planet Earth, it truly is misnamed. Our planet should be named Planet Ocean because 95% of all living space on our surface is in the fucking ocean. 95%. 95%. Let that sink in, to use a pun. 95% of all living space, you can look this up, on the surface of our world, is beneath the surface of the sea. That's called the hydrosphere. So, when you've got more water, loads thereof, within our planetary mantle, that dwarf, What's on the surface? That's a lot of water, baby. The crustal thickness of the rind of our planet, known in the Chinese language as Di Chu, literally sphericity, a descriptive denoting the terrestrial globe, as in reference to all upon sphericity. The crustal thickness of the rind of our sphericity, our planet, averages approximately 18 miles, 30 kilometers, beneath the continents, but is only approximated at 5 kilometers, or 3 miles, beneath the oceans. So that's not very far, comparatively speaking, but it's a lot of space. It's not all hollowed out. Large parts of it are. Now, circa Anno Domini 2007, the year of mine own latent sainted sire's passing, only recently... That time ago, only then did Nihonjin, or Nihonjin, ethnic Japanese people scientists in Tokyoto, the eastern capital metropolis of Tokyo on the subcontinental super archipelago of the islands of Japan, scientists there observed the dragging down of water as subduction zones. They published about it in the magazine Science dated June 8th, 2007, in the same year that two American scientists discovered, via evidence gleaned from seismic waves, the Beijing Xi, our northern capital municipality, anomaly. The Beijing anomaly is an ocean deep beneath the currently communist ethnic Chinese and collective people's republic of national statehood. Communist China's capital is Beijing. Beneath that capital's administrative district, is a massive ocean, supposedly locked within porous rock. This was published of in an article in Underwater Times, which you can find on www.underwatertimes.com forward slash news. An article entitled, Huge Underground Ocean Found Beneath Asia. This be the Sea of Alusia. Now, per the occulted traditions of ancient mythography, as rendered popularly accessible via the works of such literary shamans as Robert Irvin Howard, the creator of Conan, Robert E. Howard himself, and David J. West, good friend of mine. Valusia was the kingdom furthest to the west of the Turian continent in the Thurian age of Earth's prehistory. It was created and initially ruled by the Hachuri, Japanese term for serpent men, until they were overthrown by their human chattels an usurpation or an usurpation of the species 
triggering the Permian extinction. Now, native to that world, the serpent folk. Now, it needs to be noted, the so-called serpent peoples are not really serpentine at all. True herptiles or snakes would not emerge for approximately another 100 million years. The so-called serpent folk, or the Hachuri, evolved in the early through mid-Permian geologic period from basal, diapsid, reptilian stock. They were masters of chemical and psychological warfare. The Hachuri were and are tailed and venomous, partly through deliberate eugenics, that means breeding, and the maintenance of certain dietary habits. They manifested a culture of intrigues, largely based upon an obsessive tension between trust and treachery. Indeed, the very name of Seth be but diminutive the ancient Egyptian Sethan, from whence etymologically derivative the vulgarization Satan, which itself be but humanic manifestation of the prehumanic Stygian serpent god Seth, originally uttered in its non-humanic vocalization by the Hachuri as something akin to Ig. The archdaemon of envy, the god of darkness, the deserts, storms, disorders, violence, and pestilential foreigners. Popularly, Hachuri, or a Hachuri, a reptile man, is portrayed in the video game Mortal Kombat, combat being spelled with a K, by the character Reptile. Now, the distinction between the Paleozoic and the Mesozoic is made at the end of the Permian Age in recognition of the largest mass extinction recorded in the history of life on Earth. When the Hachuri retreated en masse into the bowels of Thon, or Earth, which transliterates as dirt. Now, Thon, as in Thonic, C-H-T-H-O-N, Thonic, means nether or infernal, being of the underworld's infernal regions. Thonian is the dwelling beneath the surface of the earth's nether regions. Both terms bastardized from the classical Greek and thonales, thonales, referential of any and all things intraterrestrial, it asked in or under the earth, and per Hellenic historical records of or relating to the underworld. It gets very hot, tropical, steamy when you go below. People affiliated, of course, with the flames of burning sulfur from mines, etc. All of this is quite real. But it's not the home of demons. That's a dimensional home that's in the Klepot or the nether realms of the Tree of Life and Death. Our underworld physically is the realm of the Hachuri, the Ghul, other life forms. And water, subducted, as I've already related, is, of course, a corrosive element, and it bores through solid rock comparatively quickly in the course of geologic time. Consequently, the inner Earth be a series of gigantic caverns. Indeed, from what I understand, from the records I dealt with, a single cavernous super system of lacunae many miles below the terrestrial surface that spans the globe via a skein that's spelled S-K-E-I-N, a skein of mega cavities throughout the Earth's upper crust, upper crust, mind you, venously connected through a sunless subterranean ocean, a Valusian river world. So the term Valusian can reference either geological phenomena, the Hachuri, or even the primal humans of prehistorical Valusia. Now, these super cavities that comprise Winterland be enormous, hundreds of miles long, and usually at least a mile from floor to ceiling, allowing for weather by condensation, plenty of rain that periodically comes down, and lots of intraterrestrial space to explore. Ultimately, wherein the expansion of Nordic Aryan civilization, concomitant the invasion and conquest of Unterland by the Thousand-Year Reich, has taken place. So, the best way to describe it, of course, if you were to visit, see some of the images that I saw at the Presidio Military Base of San Francisco, taken by the few reconnaissance squads that were able to make it back alive from their spying via reconnaissance and force 
Spy scouts down below. Returning to the surface world. You would see caverns as large as the Grand Canyon. Certainly not the whole interior of the planet at all. On the scale of the Earth itself, tectonic glitches, seismic pockets, happy accidents, blessed with the right conditions to support life, the necessary water, a tolerable temperature range, acceptable ventilation. All of this, of course, mostly lacking light, which be provided artificially by the technology of the Theod Reich. With the creation of artificial moons, massive mirrors to reflect search beams that, of course, light up the environment and provide a sense of endless twilight. A land forever at dusk or dawn. There are, in fact, 17 such caverns comparable to what I've described and hundreds of smaller ones all connected by a network of tunnels not just natural but via a colossal feat of engineering that would have been impossible had not the technique of thermonuclear boring been perfected now thermonuclear boring doesn't exist on the surface world they don't have a technological comparability to the advancements of the thousand-year Reich in exile. But that be Unterland as the geological cocoon in which the thousand-year Reich has since evolved. So adapted have the Unterlanders become to that environment. There are many as discerned by the scouts that were able to return to the surface world. I'll have to explain what communications went on with the prisoners they interrogated before they were intercepted and had to escape. But there are many beneath the surface of the earth not within the lower mantle, but only in the level of the crust, which is deep down enough, who have come to accept a kind of worldview of Elton Schwung, that the universe be comprised of infinite rock. And that man travels to other worlds by thermonuclear boring to find other cavite or open spaces in which to settle. So the Unterlanders have become the mole men in a very real sense of adopt a paradigm. Now this of course is just a popular misconception. It's not held by those that have had to visit the surface world. The older generations. It's simply something that developed as a paradigmatic evolutionary adaptation and no doubt would change with experience either on a personal or a social level for now it's what saves us from an invasion of the surface world by a far more advanced civilization beneath our feet now that explains Unterland Going back, of course, to my own relation to Adolf Hitler, try and use some common sense. And also try to use some adaptable, paradigmatic evolution of your own to understand that men in combat and in war zones in the modern age have had to adapt to surviving in the moment in the same sense that people have had to adapt to surviving in the moment 
through the overwhelming majority of mankind's evolution. Now, we look at the lifespan as it was in the age of Alexander the Great, when he conquered the known world in his lifetime. And when I look up online lifespans throughout human history, I probably won't find anything that's very comparable to what I have in mind. But the reality be that longevity has changed throughout history to the point where it has been increasing by orders of magnitude since the days of Alexander the Great, where in those centuries, life expectancy at birth which was dramatically influenced by infant mortality, pegged at 30% in places all over the world at around 1200 AD. All of this doesn't mean that the average person living at that time died at the age of 35, Rather, that for every child that died in infancy, another person might live to see their 70th birthday, but early years up to the age of 15 would be your most perilous, thanks to risks posed by disease, injuries, and accidents. So people who survive that hazardous period of life could well make it to old age, but that's 1,200 years after the birth of Christ. So, unhygienic living conditions, little access to effective medical care, meant that for the majority of human history after Alexander, your life expectancy was likely limited to about 35 years of age. From the 1500s onward till around the year 1800, life expectancy throughout Europe hovered between 30 and 40 years of age. Since the early 1800s, life expectancy at birth doubled in a period of only 10 or so generations by improved health care, sanitation, immunizations, access to clean running water, better nutrition, all credited with a massive increase. I know it's hard to imagine, but doctors only began regularly washing their hands before surgery in the mid-1800s because we didn't have an understanding of microbial transmission of disease. Even as recently as 1921, just two years before my late and sainted Cyrus, my mother Diana Dietrich was born, countries like Canada still had an infant mortality rate of about 10%, meaning one out of every 10 babies did not survive. This meant a life expectancy or average survival rate in Canada that was higher at age one than at birth, a condition that persisted right until the early 1980s. So what we have is a situation that has changed very, very recently. There's a reason I'm bringing this up, and it has to do, of course, with people having sex at much younger ages than what people are used to in the West at this point in history, where the legal age for sex is 18 years of age. Now, one of my struggles all of my life has been against pedophilia. And one of the people who I deem a total sleazebucket is a man named Bill Brockbrader, who, in front of a judge, insisted he was a child molester Specifically, so he could disambiguate himself from a pedophile. Because by legal definition, there's some checkpoint, a line drawn around what I believe is around nine years of age, where anything under nine that you're raping or assaulting, there's no other word for it, is deemed pedophilia. You're a baby raper. And anything above the age of nine towards the age of 18 
makes you basically a child molester or a uh, adolescent uh, rapist, predator, a predator, an a- ado predator. So Bill Brockbrader was insisting he was the latter to differentiate himself from the former. None of this is morally uh, redeemable. And he's even sleazier for a number of reasons. He first started having sex. I'm not going to go deep into this, but just to point something out, he first started having sex with his cousin or his near sister or half sister when she was like 11, if that. So, um, and he married her. That that's because he was in a Mormon environment of extreme Mormons, not your normal Mormon environment, but schismatics, polygamous schismatics. Not even just polygamous, but schismatic polygamous. Mormon fanatics that were deranged, <laughs> socially dysfunctional. So this social retard uh, and psychotic, this this generally reprehensible human being did what he did. And uh, he needs to have the ankle bracelet on, which, of course, he's got. And he's ran, last I heard, he ran into the forest and with his ankle bracelet. And I think the battery died and maybe they can't keep track of him. And he's living like Bigfoot now. But reprehensible as he is, the legal age for sex in many places like Spain until Fairly recently, like literally just a few years ago, legal age for sex might have been around 14 years of age, something like that, maybe 13. Seriously, uh, people can look this up. Age for consensual sex in the various European nations. And Spain, it was like that because Spain has essentially been a very hard, almost third world uh, nation in which to grow up in. So if people are not going to live very long, their sense of when it's permissible or legal to have sex becomes socially at a much lower bar. So when I was serving in war zones across the arc of conflict, the crescent of crisis stretching from the Horn of Africa all the way up through southeastern Europe, I was subjected to the fact that people lived life very differently had very different senses of what was right and wrong, especially when it came to sex with younger people. Now, for the average culture, I'm not going to use the term civilization, but culture in a state of crisis and conflict like we have throughout much of the third world crescent of conflict that in the southerly sense stretches all across from Southeast Asia down through the overwhelming majority of Africa into areas of Latin America mostly towards Mesoamerica bordering the Caribbean and uh, around the Colombian areas that Colombian arc of what was once one single nation Grand Colombia going through Venezuela And, of course, up into Central America, up into those areas right beneath Mexico, where Mexico tries to protect its border from incoming Guatemalans and Hondurans, etc., Nicaraguans and the like, El Salvadorians. In these zones, pretty much the situation is, if she can bleed, she can breed, meaning if a young lady enters the menstrual cycle, and she's ready to biologically produce children, there's no reason why you can't have sex with her. Now, the laws may be a little different, but there's always the law on the books, and there's the law of the land. And then there's the situation. So when I was serving in various war zones and I would do what any normal man does with testosterone and a cock, stop, went out of the corner of my eye, I spy with my one eye, some hot looking chick that stands out from the environment, a bland, barely surviving, walking zombies, malnourished individuals, 
that are just meandering around the environment in a daze. And suddenly something catches the corner of my eye like a bright, shiny object. Like some chick with enough meat on her bones to actually have an ass or a pair of tits. And suddenly I'd stop and look. And every once in a while, the parents, knowing, of course, by my very physical appearance, that I was not from around there, that I was armed, that I had the power to change my immediate environment to the extent where I might provide some hope and some help, parents would say to me, take her. Don't just take her sexually. Take her. Take her out of here. If she stays here in this area, She's going to be raped anyway. Every guy that comes here from whatever army they're a part of is going to pin her down against her will and they're going to take her and there's nothing we can do about it. So if you want her and can get her out of here and get her to your America, by all means, take her. Her life will only be better. Now, of course, I always refused such offers because there was nothing I could do. It's not a problem of immediate physical protection of this young lady or immediately getting her out of the immediate environment. The problem is you can't get her out of the country. That's the problem. How do you get some chick out of the country? It's just a monumental effort that basically veers into human trafficking. You'd have to smuggle her out. The means to do that would involve criminal means that involve networks that, of course, bring you right back into the human slave trade. You become what you're fighting. So I never took advantage of such opportunities. But those opportunities are there in any war zone. And just because I didn't take advantage of it in the sense I'm describing doesn't mean I didn't have sex with girls who would be legally underage in the United States. But they were into their menstrual cycle. And I was a man who could die any day. So I had sex with girls that were well under 18. In foreign lands. There's no way I can be prosecuted for that. So I can speak about this safely. The point is that this is the kind of situation that Adolf Hitler, like any male combatant, was confronted with. Whether he was in France and had sex with that teen girl that produced that son, that is now acknowledged as a historic figure, yet one which you've never heard of. And so. Having this kind of background, he had no qualms when he encountered my latent sainted Cyrus, who, as a prodigy, an extraordinarily gifted young lady, in service of the emperor, was used because of her noble background as a diplomatic level interpreter because she spoke and translated with the accuracy of a machine. Multiple languages which she learned with a gift, a talent that was inborn. Combined with the fact that in Asia, you're considered a year old when you're out of the womb. This is why they build or construct the figurines, the Asian version of a headstone, for abortions that you can find in any older, historic Japanese or Chinese cemetery. Hundreds of little figures that look like little Buddhas are actually the headstones or the carvings for aborted children that mothers who had to abort their children due to life circumstances will go back and return to and make offerings to throughout the years of their life. Because they know they had to kill someone who was alive. 
And it's acknowledged as such, not denied, as in the West. So, my mother being born a year old was around 15 years by Asian standards in 1936, 15 years of age, when she met Adolf Hitler. Because of what I've described about the half vampiroid, vampidemic bloodline in her case, from her father's side, the Chinese side of her parentage, she matured much faster physically and for all intents and purposes was well into her menstrual development and physiologically built like she was about at least 17 years of age. My mother, of course, as could be deemed easily by her photographs, did not look like a conventional Asian. The overwhelming majority of Asians on immediate sight misidentified my mother as European. Whether they were Chinese or Japanese, almost no one who was unaware of her noble lineage took her to be Asian at all. She was assumed throughout Asia to be European until people were informed otherwise. By her physical built and her development. Because of the size of her breasts, her friends actually had a nickname for her, B-29. After the bomber. The one that carried atomic bombs, ultimately. Produced by the Americans. Now, my late and sainted mother, of course, had, by that point, had a boob job. One of the first ever employed by Nazi plastic surgeons who simply injected silicone directly into the breasts to make them larger. No surgery that inserted a pad. Now, this was later in her life, so to speak, but during the war. And the war for the Japanese lasted forever. From 1931, with intervention in Manchuria, through 1952, with the Japanese-American peace treaty going into effect, through today, with their enemy, the Russian Empire. So, my late and sainted Cyrus, with their physical development, whether known or unknown in terms of her actual age, but physiologically maturing due to her vampidemic bloodline, looking like she was 17, it's almost certain via her few descriptions unto myself of the details of her sexual liaison with Adolf Hitler that it never went further than hand jobs, a blow job and a hand job, essentially, from which she extracted her sperm samples. That's how she was able to get more than one. They weren't really engaging in full coitus. Or Hitler essentially penetrating her in the vaginal sense. So, it was that in 1936 or 1937, when my mother encountered Adolf Hitler and was introduced to him by Otto Dietrich, a relation of my father, who may or may not, and likely is not my biological father, George Joseph Henry Dietrich, but one he didn't personally know, as was Sepp Dietrich, of Adolf Hitler's bodyguard. Again, not a personal acquaintance of my late and sainted sire, George Joseph Henry Dietrich, but both relations of he. When Otto Dietrich, Hitler's personal press chief, introduced my mother Diana to Adolf Hitler, and their fortwin neat, the 14 nights, the fortnight of relations began, it was what it was, and Adolf Hitler was having sex with someone who was underage, which is not surprising when you consider his first love in his life, the woman he really wanted to marry, was his niece, Jelly Rabal, who was underage when he began having physical intimacy with her, likely full-blown coitus, 
that would have eventually produced a child. And he met, while he was having sex with Jali Arabel, a young girl, 17 years of age, or 16, named Eva Braun, who became his primary mistress once Jali Arabel was assassinated by Hamosad, the institute which existed prior to the state of Israel. So you have this relation of Adolf Hitler with very young girls because of his combat experience and the fact that you never know when you're going to die. You never know when you're going to be taken out. And if she bleeds, she can breed. And if you're in a place where you can take advantage of that, so long as she's consenting, it's one of those things where opportunity presents something few men can refuse. So it was with Adolf Hitler and his niece. So it was with he and Eva Braun. So it was with Adolf Hitler and Takabayashi Hideko, Diana Suchin Lynn Dietrich. And so, when the temperature-controlled preservation went into effect for sperm samples delivered via a refrigerated courier immediately to two separate laboratories, one in Tokyo and one in Manchuria, the other in Manchuria ultimately traveling with my mother to Taiwan with the retreat of the Nationalist Republic. And she used it to fertilize herself and inseminate herself with the live births of first my sister and then myself. Then you begin to understand why in my last year of working with the Department of Defense after being dishonorably discharged from the Marine Corps and the base was headed towards closure, all the investigations were ongoing of all of the child trafficking that had been ongoing at the Presidio military base because of what I had exposed when the Presidio was well on its way to being closed and the first thing they were going to shut down was the library, I was brought in for that last year to help the closing procedures. Nobody gave a shit that I had been dishonorably discharged. They just needed to get everything destroyed, shut down. And while I was there at that point, having done what I had done to set into motion the ultimate investigation of the Marine Corps paid pile porn ring that would lead to that being shut down, Michael Aquino was at this point fully aware that I had pretty much destroyed everything he had established at the Presidio military base. And that is when he tried to destroy my morale and assault me by telling me I was the son of Adolf Hitler. Yet that was what my mother had been telling me for years. But how did he know? Well, obviously, they'd been monitoring myself, my mother beforehand, because my mother had been an interpreter professionally with the Empire of Japan directly in service of the Emperor through the American Peace Treaty with Japan all the way through 1952. My mother didn't meet my father, the man who was to raise me, until the mid-1960s or early 60s. My sister was born in 63. I was born in 66. She met my father about 1960, 61, maybe even 62. So, she was, of course, taking part in international, diplomatic level, highly top secret translation between the Empire of Japan and the United States of America in the post-war world, leading, of course, to the American surrender and the opening of its markets, which is why I know so much about the situation. At which time, of course, the Americans were claiming that both Presidents Truman and Eisenhower were holding discussions with extraterrestrials. All of this part of the dehumanization and the alienation in the most metaphorical yet literal sense simultaneously of the Japanese peoples. Now, when I first 
Went on liaison under orders with Michael Aquino. He always reminded me of my responsibilities by telling me, you know, I killed two men to get you here. Referring to Moscone and Harvey Milk. Now those who know my background, those who look up my background, on my Facebook timelines, my website might have my biography up, I don't know. My monkey benefactress is handling that with assistance from some volunteers. But people know that I got my job at the library as a librarian's aide due to the fact that I got a recommendation from a woman, a secretary at John O'Connell Vocational Institute, where I was a student, my commercial arts instructor being Gary Willard Hambright, who I ultimately had fingered and arrested as a pedophile, not a child molester, but a pedophile who would ultimately be indicted by a federal grand jury for 14 counts of child assault, all of his victims being under four years of age, only 14 among hundreds, which he would have been prosecuted for in turn had he not died of AIDS while on trial. And Gary Willard Hambright. Here was an individual teaching at John O'Connell. The other lady who said, look, you're a military dependent. The secretary at John O'Connell at the front desk said, you're a military dependent. You've got full access to the open parts of the base. You can go to the library, the unsecured parts as a client. Check out books. Why don't you get a summer job there? I'll put in a recommendation for you. I'm connected with the government because she worked, of course, for Radio Free Europe. She was involved with the CIA as a propagandist broadcasting in her own language of Shkipteri, the Illyrian language of Albania. She broadcast behind the Iron Curtain to the population still living under the dictatorship of Enver Hodja, the dictator of Albania. So here you had this Albanian chick who... Got me a summer job, recommended myself as a person involved with the State Department, provided myself governmental recommendation I got in there. How did she wind up at John Connell? She used to be the lap secretary, as she was known, meaning kind of off the books, kind of bringing the mayor of San Francisco, George Moscone, milk and cookies. Lap dancing and sex while he was in office. And then Moscone was killed by a man named Dan White, product of an MK Ultra mind control program. On November 27th, 1978, two years before I entered John O'Connell Vocational Institute, I entered in the 1980s. Remember, middle school was eliminated during my generation. Rather, junior high school was eliminated and they created middle school. So with that, I advanced a grade without ever attending a grade of school. I went from what should have been like a grade school level into what was deemed a junior high and then skipped a grade because they were replacing junior high with middle school. So I only had two years where other people had three and entered high school early, went into a vocational institute, John O'Connell. So I got there around 1979, 1980. I was supposed to be technically the class of 1984, but I took a GED to get out of there with an early graduation as soon as possible. Went into City College after that, where I got my Associate of Arts degree in criminal psychology. Combining the majors of criminology and psychology. Criminology being one of the few courses taught at City College of San Francisco. Now, of course, here we get into other assaults. They're constant. One of them that stands out is, of course, obviously in, well, wouldn't be obvious to you. You never met the son of a bitch. But in my world. Here in San Francisco, the mecca of the gay community, there are plenty of homosexuals who have a crush on me. 
I hate using that term. The gays don't like it. Plenty of gay men have a crush on me. I've been approached by any number. I don't swing in that direction. I've said no to a number of them. One of them became a big fan of mine online. Then, of course, he soured, as they all do, when I refused to have sex with them. Then he started attacking myself and my reputation. It's always the same pattern. In this case, the individual's name is Pete Betzatera, obviously a pseudonym. Runs Rocks to Earth Spinner. Goes by any name, Poet P. Goes by another PDP5. So he'll enter several comments on the same YouTube video. All of this comes into effect along with other people that I'll mention that is all part of an attack on whatever they can mutate, whatever they can change, whatever they can pervert that I've stated in the past. They'll claim I've said something I've never said, which people can go into my background and they can research themselves. All of this defies the common sense logic of how is it, aside from the average grade skips based on situational circumstances that are historically indisputable that I've described, the elimination nationally of junior high school towards middle school, then my going to John McConnell, then getting a GED and going to City College. How is it I get some scumbag like Pete Betzatera who says, Dietrich states he got a baccalaureate at City College of San Francisco. CCCSF is a junior college and does not confer baccalaureate degrees. Always, they try to clash you in a lie and say, once a liar, always a liar. They can't dispute anything historically, so they attack you personally. Never said that, faggot. Said I graduated from City College with an AA degree. My baccalaureate is from San Francisco State University, where I majored in political ideology. Get it right, faggot, just because I don't want to fuck you up the ass doesn't mean you have any right to attack my good name. But they all do. So it brings us back to the point at hand of Michael Aquino when he says he killed two men to get me into a position where I was serving him. Let's take a look at what happened. The FBI file contains evidence of a conspiracy behind the Moscone milk assassinations that took place on November 27th of 1978. Nearly five years after Harvey Milk and George Moscone's death, the Bureau spoke to a man who exposed the fact that he had tried to warn the city and county of San Francisco about Harvey Milk and George Moscone's murderer, Dan White. Now, despite ample evidence of premeditation, public knowledge of political and personal clashes, and a taped confession, Dan White was charged with voluntary manslaughter after he assassinated San Francisco's mayor, George Moscone, and supervisor Harvey Milk in 1978. Dan White was a disgruntled former city supervisor who had previously served as a police officer, a law enforcement officer, and then a firefighter in the San Francisco Fire Department. White was angry at Mayor Moscone's refusal to reappoint him after he left his position claiming the salary was not enough to support his family and bore a grudge against Harvey Milk after he had reportedly lobbied against White's reappointment. Harvey Milk knew that Dan White was a crazy white trash piece of shit. So Harvey Milk had lobbied against White's reappointment. White said, I'm going to kill you, faggot. So the charge of voluntary manslaughter was seen, understandably and rightly so, by the lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, and queer community as a miscarriage of justice, sparking the White Knight riots. When elected to the San Francisco Board of Supervisors, Harvey Milk became one of the first openly gay elected officials in the United States of America. He quickly became an advocate for marginalized communities in San Francisco and beyond fighting not only for lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, and queer rights, but for equality for women and racial and ethnic minorities. Now, Dan White was a reactionary Roman 
Catholic, but he didn't take his religion in the Christian sense. Seriously, he was a political reactionary in the alternative rightist sense, helping to pioneer that movement. And he had a history of disagreeing politically with Moscone, Milk, and other progressive city officials. With Dan White ultimately casting the only single vote against San Francisco's landmark gay rights ordinance. Now, that ordinance was eventually passed by the board and signed by George Moscone in that very same year. And previously processed, Federal Bureau of Investigation records released to Emma Best revealed details about Dan White's alleged anti-Judaism, his Judeophobia, and his homophobia, proving all these allegations to be true, and let credence to allegations that the state's prosecution of Dan White was performed with reckless and wanton disregard of normal prosecutorial standards. Now, on September 6, 1983, nearly five years after the slaying, oh, at the time, I was graduating using a GED out of John O'Connell, a retiree named John P. Elia, voluntarily spoke to the FBI about Dan White. And according to his statement, Elias and White reportedly met to speak about recalling Moscone and Milk. In his written statement, he spoke to White's homophobia, his Judeophobia, and his threatening remarks to get rid of the three bastards, referencing Milk, Moscone, and a third city official whose name has been redacted from these forms. Elias maintained he had tried to do something about Dan White, telling a bailiff that he had a feeling something was going to happen to Moscone. The concerns were never taken seriously. Also included in the file is a letter to Attorney General Edward C. Schmoltz from Attorney John Vall, which alleges that the murders were not only premeditated, but that various parties were involved in a large-scale effort to diminish the effectiveness of the state's prosecution of White. That letter provides 10 facts that outline Vall's exposition, his exposition that multiple parties, including the San Francisco Police Department, conspired against George Moscone and Harvey Milk. At the very least, Vall's allegations allude to a potential police cover-up. Wall details reports of cheering on the fourth floor of the Hall of Justice when news of the assassinations broke. These offices were occupied mostly by police officers. Ball also reported that a police officer was reportedly told to change the report he initially submitted, that White brought extra rounds to City Hall, and that a police operator laughed while asking who the victims were when Ball called in the killings. White was allowed to provide his own confession in what Ball called a narrative form in an emotional matter, that reportedly affected the jury to deliberate in his favor. The taped confession does not include details on White's forced entry into City Hall, where he literally pushed the secretary, Leanne Prifty, to the floor to get her out of the way as she bodily tried to bar him from the room in which he had been servicing George Moscone. And the so-called mayor of Castro Street, Harvey Milk, was also there. No one was sexually active at that moment. But she had been in there earlier before Harvey Milk walked in. When Harvey Milk walked in, she got all buttoned and zipped back up, got her panties back on, got to the front door. Dan White pushed her to the ground like she was so much garbage, stepped right over her, stepped on her, as a matter of fact, stepped over her to kill the mayor and the so-called mayor of Castro Street the gay supervisor, Harvey Milk. Dan White's taped confession, of course, concentrating on none of that and all on how hurt he'd been all his life as a good Catholic boy. Turning in confessions. All that shifted the focus from his guilt to his emotional motivation. And because he killed someone that everyone deemed a faggot. And because he killed a mayor, that everyone afterwards deemed a faggot. They felt that Harvey Milk and Moscone were having sex in that room 
before Dan White walked in to righteously dispatch the two perverts. His majority of hetero-Americans, cisgendered hetero-people considered them. They considered him a people's hero. He walked free even after admitting to the crimes. Then on October 22nd, my own late and sainted sire, George Joseph Henry Dietrich's birthday eve day in 1985, Dan White committed suicide after picking up a telephone call from what Michael Aquino told me was himself to finish off the evidence that remained. I tie up my loose ends, Michael Aquino told me. I had the mayor killed. Harvey Milk was just the side dish. All that to get you here, Dietrich. So that secretary wound up working at John O'Connell. She works for the State Department. Who do you think recommended her? Nobody'd hire her back in City Hall. Because the Jew bitch who took over, that kike Diane Feinstein became mayor by secession. She didn't have no need for some bitch sucking her cunt out from Albania. Whatever she is, she's not a dyke, even though she looks like one. So she wound up working at John Connell. She recommended you into the position where you're in now. Take your job seriously. Men died so you could get here. So tell me, if I'm not the son of Adolf Hitler, which it doesn't matter whether I am or not, it doesn't matter whether you believe that, what matters is the people you pay your taxes to believe that, and they operate on that presumption. They operate on conviction, which is a legal term beyond belief, meaning that you are beyond just operating on faith, You are operating on conviction means you know it to be true. Men don't die because people make assumptions. Men like the mayor of San Francisco and Harvey Milk died because the military junta operating out of the Presidio operated on conviction that Douglas Dietrich is the child of Adolf Hitler. They wanted the son of Adolf Hitler under military control. And that's why Michael Aquino wanted me to be the heir apparent to the Temple of Set, so he could demotivate and demoralize the entire true National Socialist movement from ever resurrecting. To convince all the Nazis, look, here's the son of Adolf Hitler, and he's a practicing Satanist, a soul beyond redemption serving the anti-gods. Your Hockenkreutz, your Hooking Cross can't protect you. Your own Führer's child is damned to nullity and annihilation. But instead, Michael Aquino's worst fears came to pass. And when he realized I'd betrayed him in oh so many ways and destroyed his world, as it stood, his vengeance was to tell me, look, You're the child of Adolf Hitler, not George Joseph Henry Dietrich. What future can you have as a half-breed mongrel? And he thought that would destroy me, not at all suspecting, but by that time, I had absorbed the true principles of National Socialism. Knowing that National Socialism was a global ideology based on progressive tenets, in which the son of Karl Haushofer, Adolf Hitler's geopolitician, was half Japanese. And that Adolf Hitler based his own national socialist ideology on Tokugawa religion. That his creation of the Schutzstaffel, weaponization thereof from its roots in the Bavarian Illuminati, was to samurize it. And to turn what was a secret society of perfectibilists, as they call themselves, into Hitler's samurai. The SS knighted vanguard 
of the new Aryan race to evolve on planet Earth, either on its surface or beneath. All of that, of course, brings us back in what might be the final hour. Or two, depends on how long I can stand it and how long my producer can stand it. To the subject of vampirism. Now back to Carolyn Cotier. She has two questions that I'll address at this point. One of them... She was speaking about the art. Oh, this is my favorite piece when she was speaking of the Biofax Simulacra. Probably not understanding their tragic history. And of course, speaking of the painting that I was uh, producing for Sarah Shields, inspired by the Biofax Simile among my possessions, my recoveries from the Presidio military base that most favored Sarah Shields. So she says, I just can't get over it, how this art is done. I'm still listening to the backlog of the radio shows you explained to uh, you explain this to me. I'm sure you explain it further. As I've been buried under a mountain of work, I've fallen behind in everything. But I did listen carefully to the vampire question answered, the show with the blonde lady holding a planet. That's actually supposed to be representative of myself, honey, uh, with my hair dyed blonde, as I occasionally do. Uh, moving on, of course. She says, and now I'm trying to listen to the next one after that. But this artwork is simply great, and you produce it at such a rapid pace. I'm wondering why and how it cannot be that people are quaying up to employ you for your excellent art skills, or not asking you to paint murals all over town, or wells in restaurants, or as an illustrator. I have a friend called Tony Ho, spelled H-O-U-G-H, and he is also a great artist, and he was poverty-stricken for many years, and even had to resort to working in Amazon. But finally, he got paid some decent money. By the way, I'm not sure if she means the, the booksellers or, or the rainforest. <laughs> but finally, he got paid some decent money as an illustrator. It seems that great artists are being overlooked. This is good stuff, Douglas. I think this would be really in demand if people knew more widely what you could do. It really is a unique style. Well, of course, that's appreciated, but uh, I've gone into several factors before. One being that commercial illustration is very different from fine art. And uh, the reality is, of course, that what many people operate with now is mass production of uh, works. And of course, I'm just not into prostituting my art because of what had happened at the Presidio military base, what had happened in my childhood, or rather my adolescence. And uh, one of the things that I have gone into in the past, and to clarify this before we move on to vampirism, because it is so relevant to everything that I've been speaking of with this environment of horrors that I've evolved out of as a personality. We were dealing with, of course, the fact that I was living in bone grinding poverty that uh, I had to, to the best of my ability, try and uh, bring myself and my family out of poverty so that we could ultimately move out of the tenderloin where we were in for reasons I've described in the past. And uh, when it comes to uh, the way to make money very quickly, either I would have been selling my ass on the street as uh, what many people colloquially referenced as a chicken hawk, a queer whore, a hustler. Or I would do something with talent and skill, which, of course, I mustered under the instruction of a man who was be, to be convicted as a pedophile, Gary Willard Hambright, and other commercial illustrators at John O'Connell, I learned how to produce pornography. I learned how to produce pornography before I was of legal age to purchase pornography. I was illustrating pornography that sold for money. The best-selling pornography that brings the biggest return for your efforts is, of course, child pornography. I was illustrating such 
based on photographic references maintained on site John O'Connell in their supplies closet, which was vast. This was a walk in closet. This wasn't a closet, it was a room. It was the size of a storage facility that you rent, like a trailer. It was the size of a trailer that took up the great part of a studio that we were conducting our work in at John O'Connell Vocational Institute, the old one, not the new building that was rebuilt, the old one that was destroyed to destroy all evidence that child pornography was ever maintained on site, San Francisco Unified School District property, which is the very factor I used to get Gary Willard Hambright arrested. Gary Willard Hambright was a ordained Southern Baptist minister without a pulpit, and he lived in a church. A very strange lifestyle, one might say, and be absolutely right. Since he lived in his church, believe it or not, he couldn't maintain his child porn there. And he had to maintain it somewhere. And since he didn't have a home, he maintained it, along with the collection of many other teachers at John O'Connell, in the arts studio supply room, the large walk-in closet the size of a rental trailer built into that section of the school. Remember, the entire school was a converted automobile factory. It used to produce automobiles in San Francisco generations ago. It was converted to a vocational institute so children could learn how to repair automobiles. So we had our share of automotive bodies or frames, engine blocks, etc. Many of the people were supposedly working on when they weren't tattooing each other. I'm not exaggerating there. That's actually a fact. It wasn't known as San Quentin Prep for nothing. And, of course, if I wasn't working on tattoo illustrations for the local guys to ink into their skin, then, of course, I spent most of my time working on pornography so I could make enough money to ultimately move my family out of the tenderloin. Now, because it was child pornography that sold, all the teachers, who were almost 100% male, the main body of the staff at John O'Connell was male in a vocational institute. That's not surprising. They maintained their child porn in the walk-in closet in the commercial art studio so it could be rationalized as art references, which is exactly what I used it for. Naked pictures of children in coitus with each other or with animals or with adults. So my illustration of this work enabled it to be circulated without people immediately going to jail. And therefore, people could satisfy themselves as they do now with 3D graphics art and modeling of children in such, shall we call them, situations, such abuses, suffering such abuses. And my work is almost certainly to be found, though completely unsigned and untraceable to myself, on the deep dark web. Much of this was abusive in nature because that's what sold. Bondage and discipline, sadism and masochism, children being exploited, children being snuffed. These were illustrations, again, based on genuine photographs, photographic evidence that took Gary Willard Hambright down. Now, when the case went down, my late and sainted Cyrus found out what I had been making my money from. And made me swear unto her I would never, ever again sell my art at any price. And from that point forward in my life, I would never turn a profit from any illustration I ever produced. I've maintained that promise and I've kept to her my word. I'll never break that bond. Now that we've covered the subject of illustration, Carolyn Cartier had something else to say that brings to mind our next subject of discussion. I told her I would cover what exactly was going on with my graphic illustrations tonight. She said, that's something I will look forward to because I had some points to send to you about the topic of vampirism. One was that a worldwide famous spiritual teacher I knew said they were indeed real. Vampires were real. And another 
secondly, was a friend back in the 2000s who showed me his Laos travel photos and said there were communities of vampires living as part of the connected general community in caves out there in Laos. And he showed me some pictures of them. In these photographs, they were wearing normal clothes, T-shirts and jeans, etc. And they were just quite thin and had, how to say it, flashing eye glints, but nothing unusual. And tertiarily, thirdly, there is an opposite medical condition where some people have to drain out their blood regularly in order to live as they have an excess of iron. But I will give more details in a properly written up response in the near future. Plus, quatrarily, fourthly, in Islamic medicine, there is a practice for treatment of many illnesses to bloodlet, but that should be done only on certain moon days. Anyway, really interesting subject, and I will try to give more clear details when I get a moment to do so. Certainly, they'll be deeply appreciated. Mm. Thanks so much, Carolyn Cotier. Love you dearly. And, of course, that brings us uh, to the reality of vampirism. Now, this is where, of course, you get the idiocy of people who just can't take a subject seriously because it's been so abused with hyperbole, uh, basically turned into something which it most certainly is not. Uh, and e to a great extent, this can be deemed positive or negative. It's been romanticized. So an interjection from myself, steeped in sad experience. With everything I've said on vampirism in the past... This will, of course, circuit back to my biological mother and father. Not even so much my Cyrus Diana, so much as my blood sire, Adolf Hitler. That, of course, will come towards uh, either the bottom of this hour or towards the beginning of the next. Hopefully, we'll only be on for another hour and... We can let my executive producer get some much needed rest. But on basis of everything I've said in the past, one of the things that I do really need to emphasize for people who seriously have been attracted to the notion of ever becoming somehow a vampire through mechanical needs mechanical means I need to say such as what the Soviets used to vampirize a number of baseline human biological females having found not a single female of the species when it came to full-blooded vampires the Soviet state took it upon itself to create female vampires to utilize as assets in international espionage and terrorism. This was done through an extraordinarily painful process that killed the overwhelming majority of them because the Soviets were not operating from genetic CRISPR or genetic alteration, gene splicing. They weren't dealing with scalpels. They were dealing with hammers and sickles. They used full-bodied blood transfusions so that ultimately a few would take to the point where the females took towards a hematophagic diet. Now, the reason the majority of them would die because is because it takes a lot more than that. You do not, say for instance, like in the incredibly offensive film with Arnold Schwarzenegger, where he gets pregnant, a very idea which caused a bust of that twin series, because most people find the very concept or sight of a pregnant man to be offensive, uh, not in a moral sense even, but just in a physically repugnant sense. Where does the man carry the baby when he doesn't have a womb? Well, things can be done. Of course, the baby has to be delivered by opening the man up with a cesarean section. Once the baby is formed to the point where that can be done, it's, of course, a series of procedures wherein you're driven to ask, 
Okay, why? As a matter of fact, it's such a why that there's no one who does it. So, since there's no real point in making a man pregnant, when there's so many other options to such an obscenity, why would you do something to a woman like Vampirdizer when it would create something that does not exist in nature or has not naturally evolved. Well, the rationalizations then become multifaceted with a state as diabolical, as perverse, as antithist or anti-godly as the Soviet state. The rationalizations were obvious because you would have a super strengthened female operative that could be deployed, deployed in such a manner as to wreak great havoc on your enemies. As Pavel Edward Provara has said, this is what they were raised to do. This is how they were indoctrinated. Everybody thought like this on the other side of the Iron Curtain. They think like that today. Got to take America down. That's the only way to lift themselves up is to bring others down in the Eastern European and Russian worlds until massive changes take place predominantly in leadership with the return to classical monarchies being the overwhelmingly imperative first step. But all this being said, because I've had a number of uh, young ladies who have approached me about the potential of becoming vampires because, of course, of the phenomena that they've learned of concerning my nanosperm. Now, many traits have been transferred onto the young lady we believe to be my biological daughter from myself via the young lady who served as a sex slave to the military occult complex on site the Presidio military base and wherever that junta stretches its tentacles. Now, this young lady who was never even granted a name in her entire life, but simply served the Republic via a series of numbers that classified her date of birth and her categorization as what was originally a female juvenile. I tend to break down into tears whenever I think of her case. I'll not speak too much of her now. But obviously, my sperm does transfer quite a bit of traits that seem to be expedited by the nanotechnologies that were plasmatically introduced into my body systemically with a full transfusion. Now, I've described in the past the kinds of injuries my mother took. I've never gone into all that great a detail about the kind of injuries I've sustained. But no baseline human could survive such either in the case of my latent sainted mother or of myself. Now, there's only so many things nanobots can do. Nanobots cannot pick something off the ground and reinsert it that's been sliced off of your body. When my lungs began to collapse due to exposure to cyclosyrene nerve gas in Operation Desert Storm, it took ultimately extreme experimental surgery on the part of UCSF in San Francisco after seven spontaneous pneumothoraces that occurred in my life after the Gulf War to finally staple my lungs to my rib cage. Well, once they were stapled, then things healed to the point where the staples are still there and evident and served as evidence for my getting on Social Security, which I ultimately had to sacrifice and give up when I became a care provider for my parents because at that point I was considered employed. But it's what was real enough, a mechanical series of abuses, insults to the body, injuries, where I was able 
to use those records to qualify for the Meals on Wheels I receive today regularly via my home-delivered meals. All of this is something which the nanobots cannot heal until there's intervention. So, yes, there's medical interventions I need. They're so extreme, no normal human has ever undergone them. Mine was the first such procedure where they removed my lower jawbone, unhinged it, so they could insert what they needed to insert to staple my lungs to my ribcage through my thoraces, my throat, through my, through my wide open mouth. Reassembled and rehinged my jawbone onto my skull, significantly changing the shape of my face. Were it not for that, I would have been a uh, breathing tube that I would be condemned to the rest of my life and I would have killed myself. So there is only so much the nanobots can do. But what they can do is incredible. And by all rights, I should not be alive. And I've had many a medical doctor tell me that. My mother, of course, should never have survived any of what she had gone through in her later years. So we've got this situation where my condition, if you will, of Kawasaki syndrome, wherein I have the various buildup of discoloration that takes place in the iris of my eyes which renders them blood red this is a situation of course which is just deemed entirely unnatural to most Americans but is an ethno specific what's called the disease very similar to sickle cell anemia in African Americans, which is an evolutionary advantage because the very genetic conditions which make African Americans, blacks descended out of Africa, susceptible to sickle cell anemia are the same which make them immune to malaria. Africa is known as the white man's graveyard because of malaria. The overwhelming majority of blacks who live in Africa will never die of malaria. The very fact that they have this immunity, once carried across the Atlantic, can turn into a disadvantage as they adapt to a different environment, and then there can manifest sickle cell anemia. In the ethnic Japanese peoples, there's an ethno-specific variant or moderate Kawasaki Byoshokugun, Kawasaki disease syndrome that is known as conjuvitis sans discharge, red irises, absent pus or drainage, said mucocutaneous lymph node disorder, being first formally diagnosed by the pediatrician Kawasaki Tomisaku. In the English, that would be Tomiraku Kawasaki, with the first name coming before the family surname. I think he's still alive. He was born two years after my mother was born in 1925. I myself evidenced symptoms at but a single year of age. And this is a potentially lethal mutation that was first observed by the good Dr. Kawasaki around 1960, but a little over half a decade before I myself laid eyes on this world and I identified by he, Dr. Kawasaki, when I was born in Taipei, Taiwan, as being extant in myself, or shortly after I was born, when he was visiting and was called in on my case. Now, there was no knowledge, any text or printed evidence of the existence of this condition circulating in the English until 1974. So when I came to the United States, no one even knew 
in the medical community of the United States about Kawasaki syndrome. And yet, during various outbreaks of this condition on myself, uh, sometimes depending on ambient light making it more invisible or not, I obviously manifest conjuvitis sans discharge in such a manner that my eyes become almost blazing blood red. And of course, I've lost friends over this. People who are so frightened, so revolted by my manifest change in physical comportment that they consider myself diabolic. Now, of course, there's some other Japanese, just like there's many blacks with sickle cell anemia. There are many Japanese like this. Most of them adapt themselves by hiding their condition, either with sunglasses or ultimately contact lenses. Now, there's times when I've done that. There's other times I don't bother to do that. And yet, peculiarly, this being a congenital condition, it's something that should never spread to another by intimate physical relations, such as sexual contact. And yet, my surrogate son, the escort that provided myself the most in terms of services in investing time and sexual intimacy when she was a female prior having sexual affirmation surgery and becoming a male due to her own gender dysphoria somehow now has Kawasaki syndrome. Now, luckily, my case has never been one that has produced any of the negative symptoms. It is a mutated variant that produces mostly collateral manifestations that are cosmetic in nature. Now, since my surrogate son has become a male and I haven't engaged him sexually, Though, of course, people can see us posing off times at play in photographs when I'm flashbacking to as being a girl. And uh, I think there's nothing wrong with that. He, along with the man he married, the man in Silicon Valley we reference in anonymity by his own demand, we simply call him Sugar Daddy, certainly would never circulate his name publicly. This individual, in exchange for my blood and my sperm, which he's convinced will help him with life extension, just as many of his other transfusion associates and what they provide him will. My nanoplasma has been exploited by himself and my nanosperm. But interestingly enough, one of the other escorts that he's employed for my services, which are no longer provided by my surrogate son, has now shown signs of manifesting Kawasaki syndrome. Now it could be that because she has some Japanese blood in her, she may have a genetic predisposition. So it wouldn't take as much exposure to myself as it did with my son for her to manifest this, but she never manifested it before in her life. So she insists. I have no reason to disbelieve her. All of this is part of experience 
that along with my own surrogate son, in terms of his manifestation now, of his ability to tolerate a semi-hematophagic diet like my own, wherein, because I lack the physiology of a true vampire, I could never physically drain an individual. It's not even morality that's at play here. It's simply, it's physically impossible for me to drain blood from an adult body in totality because, of course, my system can only tolerate so much blood. Yet, I am able to live off of, for periods of time, human blood without access to food. Not that I ever prefer to do that, but it has most certainly been proven possible. And so, too, with my surrogate son. Now, there's no occult methodology for making someone a vampire. Though my son insisted on some rituals, I did perform them. It was more a sense of formalization, a kind of maturation for him, a rite of passage. It was something to formalize a sense of unity between himself and myself, which I was happy to provide. But mostly, he became what he is today, via my insemination, orally and vaginally. And that appears to be happening to another escort of mine once again. So conceivably, I could vampirize females via insemination. So I have been approached fairly aggressively by a number of young ladies. And because I know that this is going to increase this is why I will say what I have to say. All this being said, we can conclude that becoming Vianfiore from the liturgical Slavonic blood monster be not simply what be done to you, far more so it is who, or if you prefer what you are. It is within you. It is your nature the more you realize that nature, the more you embrace it, the more Valfiore you become. Once subjected to the processes of artificial vampirization, in the case of the Soviet state, it would be massive blood transfusions. In the case of Douglas Dietrich, it would be enough insemination for a regular period of time. While in the full bloom of your human life, you shall either embrace it or die curled up like a dying insect embracing the air. For the will of the vampiric blood, systematically inject it within your veins or inseminate it into your orifices. To grow within yourself will not be stopped. As it grows, you must learn to want it. And as one becomes increasingly vampiric and suffers less and less from the frail limitations of the human body, they get more energetic are able to maintain states of high physical activity for hours on end without tiring, a fully blossomed vampiralka, a female vampire, a vampiress, something that doesn't occur in nature, my late and sated Cyrus not being such but bringing a damfire, a hybrid, myself being even more so. But nevertheless, should something happen where you become vampirized, and it somehow just tickles the genes. As with the young, partially Japanese lady, who's one of my more regular current escorts, suddenly taking on symptoms of Kawasaki syndrome. Apparently, through sexual transmission from myself. If you happen to have those recessive genes in your mortal coil, at some point, via a partial turning through my seminal injections. Your recessive genes get triggered in the event of a fatal accident where you clinically die 
And that's when these survival genes kick in, as they did with me when I received that full-body blood transfusion of nanoplasma. And flatlined for what must have been at least 24 hours, and I'm told it was 48. I most certainly died. And technically can be declared undead in that regard. But when I returned, those recessive genes had kicked in, as I said, when I was three years old and had my first kill. When my father's father tried to orally rape me, and I ripped his penis off with my incoming teeth. On Kodak Company time, no less, and I've explained the Kodak Company calendar on past transmissions. Years of difference between that and your Gregorian calendrical system. Used until Kodak closed in bankruptcy. And an empire of industry died. When I killed him on Kodak Company time, I thought even then, blood's got to taste better than this. It was so poisoned by so much of that chemical crap running through his system that had poisoned his brain and his nervous system to the point where he was trying to rape his grandchild like it was his due, as casual as one would slap down a dog. He died for his crime. Even after that, I didn't go out seeking to try other blood. I did experiment. This does happen with children, siblings. My sister and I, when she knew of what had happened to me, she gave me some as some of her own blood. And I can say it tasted sweet, but now I've been cut off. I'm told we're restarting the recording. I'm not sure. Are we actually recording? I'll need some reassurance of that because I don't see the call as active. I don't think I'm even on Skype anymore. So going to need some reassurance from our man about that. And I need to know that this is actually recording before I waste any time going any further. Paul hears me, but does anyone else hear me? I'm going to need a feedback from those that are listening. So I need people to tell me whether they can hear me or not. I'm told people are reconnecting, but I need assurances on the timeline. Someone needs to tell me that they hear me. Now, aside from all that, I'll start once again with describing what was going down between my sister and myself happily or seriously within a matter of moments. I don't know if this discussion can be called a happy uh, discussion. So... Daniel Arola still hears me. Good. Thank you, dear brother in battle. Deeply appreciate it. And uh, so with that in mind, we will go forward with the narrative. As painful as it is in some regards, it is something that I do want people to seriously consider before they start ever consider going for this opportunity, if you consider it such. It was after that full body blood transfusion and what was obviously, fuck the term NDE or near death experience, a full death experience as far as I call it, an FDE. It was then I awoke and was able to tolerate higher levels of blood intake, which I could intake orally by supping. That's the term that's used, not sucking, supping. I could sup on blood and actually subsist off it, actually get enough to subsist off it for a period of time, days, if not a week. Now, all of that, of course, is such that were I to inseminate someone enough times and they suffered some fatal accident, which is nothing I ask anyone to actually try and do to themselves. I would never encourage anyone to do that. But if they were somewhat vampirized by myself and there was latent genetic tendencies, conceivably with an accident, 
severe enough, those genes would kick in, as they did with the historical Vladislav Sepish, who started his life as a vampire hunter. Historically, that's why the knighted title, the son of the dragon, part of an order of monster slayers. Nothing comic book about this. In the days of Sigamundus, the emperor of Luxembourg, and of the Holy Roman Empire, you could go to burning at the stake as your sentence if you refused to believe in the reality of werewolves. That was how does dire and immediate that threat was for people at that time. I've gone a bit into rabid uh, conditions. We could go into more in the future. Right now, Pavel Edward is tagging myself in a post, which I will share on my public community fan page. I'm going to assume that this is a link he is providing us for the transmission reconnecting due to YouTube disruption, which looks like it disrupted my Skype as well. So let me put this onto the uh, public community fan page and pin it to the top. Let me put a wow on this. Okay. Everybody. Take a look for this on my personal friends page or my public community fan page. Coming your way. All right. Let's load this up. Publish it. See if we can finish this up in this hour or going into the next. Pin this up at the top. Okay. That appears to be working. So, my point being, after all that soul-searching to get us back on the subject, so to speak, that you have to be prepared for something that is going to change your life completely in such a manner you will not recognize who you are. So, a fully blossomed Vampiraka, a Vampiris, can partake in a series of martial arts bouts all night, in heavy Kevlar padded ballistic armor with threat level 3 trauma plates sewn in front and back, tapping men out left and right, breaking for sexual intercourse with as many meatheads as she has a mind to, if indeed she still swings in that, or any direction, and still be reasonably energetic and alert come daybreak as she was when the night began, albeit more than looking forward to a long day's sleep. There wouldn't even be a need to shower before denning in for the dawn if, as expected, the human sweat glands atrophy and wither away as vestigial to your newly emergent state of embodiment. So why on earth, aside from the potential for exuding a malodorous musk when either stressed or excited, would any girl resist becoming permanently vampirized? Because everyone you ever loved or cared about is now destined to become part of your newly acquired food chain. Pitiful, weak, pathetic, but incredibly, irresistibly delicious. Well, some of them anyway. Just as you wouldn't select a down cow, clearly racked by the ravages of age and disease addled by extension, to comprise those juicy hamburger patties you used to indulge in before your digestive system mutated, so too the members of the human herd who are falling behind be the ones whose blood you'd regurgitate in revulsion. Only the healthy breeding age hunks will do from now on. And who in the world would want to play with their food? So you can kiss the experience of romance goodbye. Forever. Because the reality of vampirism be no twilight fantasy where you have any choice in the matter of your impulses. To repress your feeding is to die. And all the good-looking ones look only good enough to eat. So, that's what could happen if you fully turned. And that's something that should have happened, you would think. To Vladislav Dracula, and indeed it did, to a very real extent, or my mother's father, since he came in through a similar 
fatal experience that triggered his recessive genes, like the historical Vladislav Sepesh. Only his case, of course, in China and his being ethnically Chinese. Descended from the Caucasian bloodline, therefore rather hybridized in his subgenetic structure down there at the recessive level through the bloodline of the sons of Seth, the righteous third, the son of Adam, which of course was part of the bloodline which my mother inherited from him. And it could be that, my mother insisted, which of course caused my grandfather to shout, come over here, you dirty little redskin, when he tried to rape me orally. He may not have been referring to an American Indian bloodline. He might have been referring to the bloodline of Adam. Adam, of course, being ruddy or red, as in red skin, as in blushing with blood near the surface of the skin, as Caucasians bear it, where they can bodily blush as no other ethnicity can. My mother said that's what he was referring to. My father said otherwise. I'll be pondering that the rest of my life when I think of it at moments. Now, basically, when we get a situation where I have, of course, encountered one of those Van Fieraka in the Balkans that was a product of the Soviet state, the actual true-born vampires being genocidally mass-murdered in the Soviet Union by being taken to the island of Novaya Zemilia, where after being tortured and experimented upon, those that survived were destroyed in the most powerful atomic blast, thermonuclear blast ever unleashed in human history. The Tsar Bomba test, the genocide, the king of all bombs. Those that were artificially created by the Soviet state were presumed loyal to the state. And many of them survived the collapse of the Soviet Union. Many of them here in the United States. But it is in the Balkans where I met the one that had tried to go back home. And I can tell you that just like in mass media, as sometimes displayed, whether cartoons or in films, I can say for certain that Van Fiera really do weep tears of blood under the sun. Now, when they were dispatched to America on their missions, the Zovetskaya Soyuz, the Soviet Union, was experiencing unprecedented national crises and the KGB infiltration of the United States' social infrastructure in the early 1970s was thorough and pervasive in a desperate attempt to take America down with them, with the massive social changes they were undergoing in Eurasia. It was known to the KGB by its research into the American society at large, that American crime statistics were categorized by Zalvitska intelligence in ways that defined American society beyond its own ability to comprehend. In American eyes, vampire belonged to history, myth, and legends. The kind of the stuff of nightmares, they have no place in the modern world a mindset of denial that only magnified the value of Vampira's insertion assets of the Zovetska communist cause. It was calculated by the KGB that over the less than 200 years of America's existence as a constitutional entity, sporadic waves of immigration from Eastern Europe and Eurasia, exacerbated by what was at that time, the most recent influx of DPs, displaced persons, refugees from the post-ceasefire Europe of World War II, and secondly, asylum seekers 
from behind what the West termed the Iron Curtain of what was a Cold War, effectively another world war. These successive demographic waves displaced, at the very least, some 600 true-born vampire around the United States. This was approximately 10 times the number of their own kind that were contemporarily incarcerated at Novaya Zemilia in the 1970s. At any given time, it was roughly tabulated that around 5,000 vampir existed within the environs of the Zovetskaya Soyuz, the Soviet Union's borders, inclusive of the Zovetskaya Central Asiatic Republics, the Soviet Central Asiatic Republics, but exclusive of the Eastern European and Outer Mongolian satellite state populations. These individual predators, those denning inside the borders of the United States of America, had no affiliation whatsoever with the Zavietska state control, but were deemed as an unofficially functioning fifth column, killing approximately 14,400 American citizens annually. Their much more commonly committed repressed feelings, their feedings, left the eventuality of such a disorienting and overwhelmingly unspoken of attack on the average legal American citizen as statistically narrowed down to an approximately one in every 1,584 legal residents per 1970s American demography. Now, I've said before, repressed feeding, of course, as does a full feeding, inserts dimethyltryptyline in the system of the victim, which if they survive, their memory of the experience is actually extraordinarily pleasant, even enlightening, a feeling of having had a religious experience. If one is so inclined, a feeling as if they had had a out-of-body experience, at the very least, if one is more agnostic or atheistic in nature. So with so many people going through such spontaneous feelings during their life, which they had no explanation for, which were actually, in many cases, a vampire attack, you've got a chronic national experience which cumulatively frayed the edges of the social fabric, provided ample opportunity for subversion in any all-too-open non-totalitarian community. In the 1970s, mind you, this isn't to be over-exaggerated or taken to any extreme, and Americans' chances of suffering a vampire attack were only of uh, something like 0.0006314% or far less than one half of 1%. This ratio of attack would have decreased dramatically in favor of the potential American citizen once you had this torrential influx of illegal immigrants that buffered the legal population from the vast majority of vampire attacks. Today's attack ratios quite possibly hold steady for the legal American because of a statistically proportionate uh, influx of Eurasian vampire into the United States since the collapse of Eurasian communism those that were from the Soviet satellite states, not from the Soviet Union itself, where for all intents and purposes, the totality of their population of vampir were extinguished in the Tsar Bomba genocide. So it was assigned as an objective of the Vampir Alka, a female vampire, as created by the Soviet state, any asset that they were able to insert into America was to try and present herself as the legendary vampire mother and organize this already extant and semi-assimilated, albeit subsisting survival-oriented, vampire community in the United States, always exclusively masculine, in organic vampire insurgery, insurgency, if you will, the Van Fieralka, as an asset, was to try and organize them into an operational force of inhuman terror that would instigate a perpetual low-intensity crime wave of ever-increasing repressed feeding assaults 
to eviscerate America's great society, as so promoted at the time by the contemporary administration of Lyndon Baines Johnson. From the inside out, via the vampire's inherent biochemical ability to steal time, via the repressed feeding creating a sense of lost time or missing time, through, of course, the biochemical insertion of the element of dimethyltryptyline and invoke delusions, paving the way to popular acceptance of the false sense of security provided by Soviet statism to North America with ultimate intent to draw the United States into the then ongoing Sino-Soviet conflict at that time. So the mother of all vampire may have experienced catastrophic failure in the sense that the tottering American Republic under the administrative guidance of Richard Mulhouse Nixon and the United States Secretary of State Henry Alfred Kissinger cite it instead with the Soviet Union's mortal Chinese enemy, the Zhonghua Ren. But these state-created vampire mothers most certainly participated in instigating a chronic convulsion in the seamy underside of American subculture, volitional enough to help sway a terminally destabilized American electorate into the overthrow of their own adamantly anti-communist president, Richard Mulhouse Nixon, in time of undeclared war and nigh total war that was ongoing at that time between the Soviet Union and the Communist Chinese on their border, the longest border in the world at the time. Now, the Soviet objective of wartime American regime change was then to be considered a superlative success. So, here we have, when I look back on the legend among actual vampire themselves, true-born predators that do subsist off blood as the totality of their diet, strictly hematophagist. Basically, within the documents that were smuggled out of Soviet Russia that I was able to access at the Presidio, it was known that in the Vampir colony, the concentration camp on Novaya Zemilia, that the Vampirs had a kind of a collective myth or understanding of a Vampir mother, a creature whispered amongst themselves as destined to reappear in final times. In an, an all-male species would, of course, consider that apocalyptic. The confrontation of a creature which combines the vampire's predation and a human woman's natural fertility and reproductive drives. Vampire mothers of ages lost were said to have not one egg, but hundreds. It was also said that the vampire mother's reproductive instincts are so powerful that they overwhelm her instinct for self-preservation, driving such creatures emerging at the dawn of time to copulate with wolves and become inseminated by lupine seed. A haunting echo to the Lilithian myth of Adam's first and fell female mate who reputedly bed it with animals that she deemed more manly than Adam, thenceforth spawning the satyr and other hybrid races. These are but legends so far as we know, but there be an old Roskaya proverb which states, off from the waters of superstition arises the wispy mist of truth. So could it be that the eggs of such a hypothetical entity have an independent instinct for survival, and that their combined will dominated that of the vampire mothers which carried them. Under such biological parameters, admittedly speculative on my part, vampire mothers might have literally poured so much vitality into creating and energizing their eggs that they drained themselves dry. They would have reproduced themselves to a horrid, mewling, starving death. Could nature have judged this a worthy price to pay and the biological establishment of a predatory counterpoint to the omnivorous primates, which evolved in, into what we identify as humanity. And then we come to the matter of faith itself. Now, there be the myth of the 
crucis, the crucifix, as a sacred weapon against vampire. It plays no historical role in either the European or Slavonic Eurasian cultures. Certainly priests were involved in vampire interdiction throughout Christendom, the cartographic precursor to what we know of today as Europe, but the specific concept of warding off vampire with kreutz or cross or crucifix doesn't mislead the Western mind until the monumentally successful publication of Bram Stoker's Victorian Gothic novel, Dracula. Now, it was brought up to myself by our man, John Warrington, that Alex Jones looks exactly like Bram Stoker, and he put the photographs side by side. I'll be damned if it's not true. And it's so apropos because Bram Stoker was an Irish house nigger to the British Empire who got his success by stealing the work of his wife, publishing it in his own name. Whatever he wrote is unreadable. You can read his other works like The Mummy. Dracula was a bestseller because of its legibility in Victorian terms. It's unreadable today. And Stoker, it must never be forgotten, reimagined the genuine historical Dietrich Gulvier, the dragon son, Vladislaus the third Bazarab, the devout Christian, the Vieux the Voivode, or princely Generalissimo, the European equivalent of a Japanese shogun, it is supreme military commander at the national level. Dracula was ruler of the Khanate of Valachiarum Partium Transalpinarum, the combined principalities of Wallachia and Transylvania, formerly subjected under the Golden Horde, known to the world as Tsar Zipescu Kajliki, Lord Sepish the Impaler, or assassinated in the field of battle and resurrected via Myth- Mythopia, to become Nosferatu Rex, the Vampiori King. Now, in literature, he is compared to having entered into a pact consummate with Satan himself. It must be brought to bear, cannot be overemphasized, that the Romanian peoples insist that the historic Vladislav Dretrakior Gulvia did indeed become Vampiori, but under heroically tragic circumstances, as opposed to the lurid literary conceits of Vlad Shepeshku's later-day Irish-descended British publicist Bram Stoker. And, of course, what Bram Stoker understood when he did his research into the historical Dracula was the fact that he was a devout Christian. And if you read his book, if you could suffer through that oh-so-Victorian Gothic novel, you will see that that novel, it's not misprinted, portrays Dracula as being able to subsist in his coffin safely only when he carries consecrated soil with him, blessed earth. Not cursed earth. Blessed earth. Earth blessed by his church. Which would be, of course, the Byzantine Orthodox Church of the Eastern Slavonic Liturgical Rite. So only with consecrated earth can Lord Dracula safely travel this was of course understood to people of the Balkans and it was written into the book of Bram Stoker yet later on he contradicts himself and portrays Dracula as increasingly diabolic not because the character is devolving but simply because he changes his narrative from the historic into fear pornography as the work continues. But what he had touched on earlier in the book be based on the reality. 
So the subspeciated branch of humanity known as vampires in the Soviet Union, it was a moot point in an anti-theist or anti-godly state whether vampires held to what the Soviets would have deemed superstitious beliefs. But they certainly felt that the West believed that vampires cannot stand the sight of crucifixes, icons, and other holy symbols of Christianity was, of course, sheer nonsense. They knew that to be nonsense. As a matter of fact, with the inherent disdain that the Soviet Union had for religion, it made it into the records that were brought to my attention at the Presidio military base for my destruction under orders. That many vampires deliberately wear crucifixes, not for the purpose of preventing others from suspecting their true nature, but because many of them are extremely religious. The Soviet Union, of course, felt this to mark them as enemies of the state, a religious insurgency. That it was a behavior idiosyncratic of an inherently arrested state of mentation. A subject immediately closed to further discussion because of the theological implications that would have disturbed the atheistic paradigm of the Soviet Union itself. So, it was deemed, of course, that the former belief in the Russian church was an anachronistic cosmology and therefore God and all nature which be God's handiwork would inescapably be inclusive of vampirdine or the vampiric subspecies because many holy places, be they churches, cathedrals, mosques or shrines, have proven to be ideal vampiric clutch dominions, consecrated churchyard grounds, having been exposed as epicenters of mass murder, per Soviet analysis, Dark Ages Slavonic peoples traditionally contending that Trubo and Vampir called to adulation the animalistic vampiroid thralls of the Nosferat Contagion, which I described in one of my more recent transmissions, the rabid who had been infected by their kind, were called forth from within the bell towers of parish churches on moonless nights, in form mocking that of the imams of Turkiaskar, Turkey land, ululating from their minarets. All of that must have struck incredible fear into the medievalist population, something the vampires used to their advantage, as they did the thralls that they dispatched to terrorize baseline humanity in preserving their hold on regional power over humanity and among themselves. And, of course, the Soviet Union just took that to be all part of what was deemed the mental illness of religion. That all organized religion and spirituality in general was taken advantage of by predators who decided that because they could bodily bathe in holy waters to no ill effect, they would increase the superstition of those around them to think otherwise, that people would forever be throwing before them obstacles which prevented them in no way, shape, or form from taking advantage of their prey, obstacles which presented them no obstacle whatsoever. And yet, from what I learned from my late and sainted Cyrus, my mother, Diana Dietrich, from a theistic perspective, the foreborn, true-blooded vampires who exist in a kind of eternal childhood, indeed in a state of arrested development, manifested a kind of feral spirituality that encouraged them to hold true faith, at least in conviction that they act as the hand of God in population control. 
that the vampire perceive themselves as a chosen race, chosen as another force of nature, spontaneously taking a toll on the sheep of the lamb, as circumstantially as any earthquake, tsunami, hurricane, tornado, and other acts of God. They would be an act of God. Such ideation places the vampire as a subspeciated ethnos beyond human judgment. So, that, of course, brings us to the fascist vampiric deployment throughout the commune Nazi conflict of ever on the side of the failed Reich. And exactly why they were motivated to side with the Third Reich voluntarily while they were exploited by the Soviet Union only against their will. And that brings us back to human interpretations of the Bible. And the sheep of the Lamb of God would read Deuteronomy chapter 12 verses 23 and 25 if I remember correctly but be sure you do not eat the blood because the blood is the life and you must not eat the life with the meat do not eat it because you will be doing what is good and right in the eyes of the Lord or Leviticus that would be Chapter 17, verses 10 through 11. This provides rationalization right there for unconditional hatred on the part of the human race against the vampire subspecies. I will even set my face against that soul that eateth blood and will cut him off from among his people. For the life of the flesh is in the blood. And I have given it to you upon the altar to make atonement for your souls. So the human need to wreak destruction upon vampirdema or the world of vampirism seems to be a cyclical phenomenon coinciding with mass outbreaks of pestilence or plague. Perhaps an understandable phenomenon in light of the Nosferat Contagion, which I so painfully detailed in it's taking of 12 million lives in the Soviet Union. I spoke of it in one of my more recent transmissions, more recently. And, of course, such hatreds conceivably incubate in an unconscious defensive biological response to grievous injuries inflicted upon the superorganism of Vampardin, the vampiric world, All of this was probably most manifest in the communist organized final extermination of the Vepper. This was, of course, nothing final about it any more than the war to end all worlds, all wars of World War I. It was called the war to end all wars. That certainly didn't end war. You had a second war to end all wars after that, and that certainly didn't end wars. So the first communist final extermination of the Latin European Vampir, the Vepper, did not destroy Vampirdeem or the vampires as a species. But it took place during the seminal year following onset of the cataclysmic Spanish flu epidemic, pandemic, going across all national boundaries of 1918, the American Army Influenza which effectively ended the Great War to end all wars, World War I, by eradicating 100 million people in 18 months, averaging the mass murder by the Americans unleashing that biological weapon of 185,185 souls per day, every day. 185, 185 daily. 185,000, 185. Superseding the Black Plague and ferocity, which itself had killed two-thirds, 67% of the European population. 
So the advent of modern industrial urbanization did engender a form of childhood's end for Vampyrdema, the vampire species, in which a single calendar year, the year my late and sainted sire, George Joseph Henry Dietrich, was born, 1919, becoming branded into the otherwise non-linear vampire racial recall as mutually painful to some and frightening to all. That year that my father entered this veil of tears, the anarcho-syndicalists, a branch of anarchism focusing on the labor movement, syndicalisme, the French for trade unionism, Anarcho-syndicalist demagogues organized armed workers into La Guardia Royal Espanol, the Spaniards' Red Guard, not the Royal for Royal, for Royal more properly, I guess, in the uh, Spanish language, the Espanol, it would be La Guardia Roja Espanol, as in Rouge, as in Red. So the Spaniards' Red Guard took hostage to no less than 300 enterprises in Madrid alone, the capital of Spain, from there extending terrorist operations across the nation, having no contractual obligations to honor with which to keep this ever-expanding pool of disenfranchised laborers employed, the ringleaders initiated a purge of the archaic minority population of Eurovepper, parasitizing the body politic, they felt, of both España, Spain, and France, in aftermath, the collapse of the European monarchies, the vampire who were interrogated as transcribed into the records I assessed at the Presidio military base in, of course, the vampire colony in the Via Zemilia, north of the polar region in the Soviet Union, recalled it as the Great Slaughter of 1919. Few thousands of adult Vepper and some hundreds of Vepper genetic rape babies were staked, burned, or beheaded. Now, proportionate to the Vampodemon population, those numbers are staggering, statistically equivalent to the genocide of many, many millions if applied in numeric equivalency to the human population base of that same year. The Vepper of Latin Europe had foolishly proliferated when the lights went out in teenage Europe of the 20th century. Feeding flesh came easy with all the breeding age human males dispatched under the front lines. Women even offered themselves to vet proposing as troops on leave or in the Espan or Spanish lands as French deserters. The butcher's bill arrived as apprehended Vepper blood sons and intercepted Vepper genetic infants, easy enough to identify once one knew what to look for were roasted alive on spits or nailed to the doors of their succoring mother's homes to twitch feebly while they gushed out blood like punctured water balloons, always in the merest of moments. The anarchists of the Confederation Nacional do Trabalho, the National Confederation of Labor, had found the perfect recruits for their radicalized carnage. They offered communal whores women and girls involuntarily press-ganged into mass sex services and free alcohol forcibly collectivized to the newly displaced French and Belgian veterans of four years in the trenches and on the killing fields of the Western Front in the first phase of the greater German Atlantic War, the ones cheated of their youth by shot, shell, and gas who had nothing to return home to except hunger and repression in the streets. Then, too, the anarcho-syndicalists enlisted the Carmunados, the French socialists, who would later cleave to the Soviet-sponsored Popular Front Army of the Spanish Republic, the Ejercito del Frente Popular de la República Española. And these hollow-eyed former cannon fodder, still staken in their field uniforms, Needed something new to kill because they just couldn't stop. They'd been turned on to the killing. And now that the war was over, they had to kill something. If not themselves. 
So the gobernitos, the communist Spain's regional governance, they found willing revolutionaries in the men to whom the industrialized meat grinder, a barbed wire artillery, and the machine gun had become the only normality they knew. And the communized Espanol Republicanos, the Spanish Republicans, hunted down and ultimately massacred few thousands more Vepper throughout the deadly, bright, murderous days, scouring the peninsular countrysides for Vepardized sanctums to the point of firing churches and libraries and allegedly any, any facility at all, schools allegedly suspect of harboring clutches, Again, when I assessed the records, I noted the enormity of such fatalities in proportion to the comparative numeric insignificance of the Vafardima to their human herds, statistically equivalent to many millions more additional to those already perished. The Vepper who survived did so by evacuating low country España and Gaul to actually shelter in the very trench and bunker systems that had been so recently fought over during the war to end all wars. Ironically, in the happier times of active hostilities between 1914 and 1918, death on such a heretofore incomprehensible scale was the best natural cover Vepera had ever enjoyed. When 50,000 human men died in a day, the Vepera had no reason to restrain themselves until the Americans disembarked in nominally neutral Espana, hence the misnomer Spanish flu, and commuted the avian strain of flu with them from the new world to the old for the first time in all recorded human history, a reverse of all influenza conditions. In grand reversal of the conquistadorial spread of pox contagion that had so devastated the indigenous empires of the Americas, incepted by shipping live chickens on troop trains in comportment with recruits commandeered out of San Quentin Penitentiary in an age before refrigerated boxcars this deployment of biowarfare germination culminated in the mutagenesis of the modern H1N1 influenza, incubated to mass lethality in the training camps of the military bases at Fort Lewis, Kansas. Prior to the United States biointervention in 1917, from coffin ships porting naught but avian influenza contaminated bodies of American troops on arrival to Iberian shores, Vepper fell under the impression before then that European human civilization was going to butcher itself into functional extinction. That the Vepper Nation, the vampire nation, would replace humanity as a dominant species on the continent. If nothing else, the slaughter thereafter compelled a collectively ahistorical species into experiential circumspection. When vampire become casually brazen without preparedly staking the borders of their own sovereign national boundaries of territory as a perimeter of defense, catastrophe becomes inevitable. That's when Adolf Hitler offered them bloodland, the unknown country, was promise of just such recognized and demarcated national perimeters that mobilized the Werfer, the Germanic Werfer of Central Europe to voluntarily integrate, albeit autonomously, their all-male minority populations into Adolf Hitler's pan-European crusade against Soviet Bolshevism. In 1940, the Zovetskaya Soyuz had invaded and occupied Moldaviene, Greater Moldavia, comprising Anti-Romanian Bezarabia and Northern Bukovina. In a two-month, a 60-day campaign through the months of June and July of that year, extending the Greater Soviet Union's borders right up against the Romanian region of Transylvania, a former vassal state buffering the most Catholic kingdom of Hungary, Karam, medieval Hungary, from the Islamist Ottoman Empire of medieval Turkey. And by August, now born in blood, both human and otherwise, the Kresnaya Ruskaya, the Red Russian Empire, had already broadcast its intent to communize the world back in what the Bolsheviki, the rule of the majority, proclaimed to be the last year of the Christian calendar. The year my late and sainted sire, George Joseph Henry Dietrich, was born, 1919. Even as the last of the extant clutch dominions of the Latin Vepper were experiencing extirpation at the hands of Soviet-sponsored 
there has been insurgency in the Republic of Spain with the pedigree of mass vampire slaughter that communism had established for itself the vampire Dima recognized the truly ultimate blood enemy of their people and rallied in response because of the decisive importance of Romanian oil to the German war economy German troops assumed primary responsibility for the security of the Romanian oil fields in September of 1940 the Ruskaya dominated annexation so close to Transylvania justified an even stronger German commitment. And after October of that year, a large German force comprising 12 German divisions was stationed in country. But Romania was never, properly speaking, a German occupied territory for the government under Romania's premier Marisal, Marshal General Ion Victor Antonescu, Presidente al Consiglio Liu di Ministri martyred via communist execution in 1944 at that time still very much alive and active was left in absolute control over the nation's affairs including the production and exportation of romanian oil the conjugator the fuhrer of the romanian peoples al statului ion antonesco was regarded by adolf hitler as the strongest personality among his european allies apart from il duce benito amulcheri andrea mussolini the head of the government of the kingdom of Magna Italia, Greater Italy. And because of this, Romanian as well as Italian troops proved themselves valuable partners in the crusade against Bolshevism by taking the war deep into communism's own home territories. The royal fascist Romanian army was heavily committed into the siege of Stalingrad, Stalin city. But Hitler's greatest reason for restraint in dealing with Romania was based on his personal experience in investigating the harsh national lessons of the Great War, World War I. In that conflict, the Germans had conquered and occupied the Kingdom of Romania, a military success that had resulted in the destruction of Romanian oil installations and the almost total loss of the Romanian oil supply. Hitler could never afford to repeat this national experience in his own phase of prosecution of the Great German War, because as Hitler never ceased reminding his colleagues, the lifeblood of the Axis depended on Romanian oil circulation. Yet in spite of this intrinsically sensitive energy-dependent relationship, Adolf Hitler compelled Antonesco to yield Transylvania to Mejarozag, Hungary, ostensibly in an effort to control part of Mejarozag's foreign trade. Even as the greater Sovietska Soyuz, the Soviet Union, was digesting its conquest of Moldavia in August of 1940, Hitler prompted Majorazag to retake the northern half of Transylvania, including the strategically located city of Klui-Nupocha, which Majorazag had lost to Romania at the secession of hostilities of World War I. Now, this geopolitical maneuver generated even more hostility between Romania and Hungary. Most Romanians interpreted this as a punishment for siding with the Allies during the First Great War. But Hitler was far more concerned with the perpetuation of tensions between his two Balkan allies in order to distract both of these regional Balkan superpowers from focusing on the primary Nazi zone of occupation situated in the very heart of the Balkan Peninsula, the Banachka a Magyar or Hungarian ethno-linguistic term, transliterally the military frontier, similar in geographic administrative function to the conquistadorial presidios of the New World, the Banachka Vojvodina, which was a Serbsky or Serbian linguistic term, again, the land of the princely Generalissimo, the European equivalent of Japanese shogunacy, this was a trans balkanian cartographic legacy from the stabilization of the Roma Russian, traditionally the transitional ethno-national shatter belt between Roman influence and the Russias. It was a front between the First Reich of the Germanic Holy Roman Empire and Islam following the fall of Byzantium, as it had been a front between the Romans and the Russias before and after. So, an exceptional position in the territories administered by the German military government in Serbia was accorded to the Banachka, the area east of the Tijal River, 
which was claimed by both Romania and Hungary. On the 12th of April in 1941, Adolf Hitler placed the Banachka Vojvodina under transitional but direct German military control as opposed to administration under the civilian auspices of the Nazi Party bureaucracy, rendering this entire swath of territory legally equivalent in status to the United States' Guantanamo Bay, supposedly so as not to offend either of Germany's major Balkan allies, but in effect denying any access to the Third Reich's own Nazi civil administration, the Banachka Vojvodina. 9,300 square kilometers of rich agricultural land directly north of Beograd. Transliterally, White City, the capital of Serbia. Population in 1941 of 640,000, comprising 280,000 Serbs, 130,000 ethnic Germans, 90,000 Magyar or Hungarians, and 65,000 Romanians. The Germans were destined to be uprooted altogether to aid in the colonization of the newly conquered eastern territories, while the remnant population was to become the nucleus of an even larger concession united with the Tijavali region of Vaslui and the Dwanare, the Tanu Valley region of Karash Severin, with its capital to be established in the city of Timisoara. This was intended as the new Danubian Vanfiore Gao, a Reich's term for a governmental administration. That's why the Gao leaders, the Gauleiter, were the Nazi bureaucratic equivalent of regional governors, such a greater Banachkin Voyevoidenasi, when envisioned within context of national socialist plans for the reorganization of Europe along Vulkish, or ethno-national lines of demarcation, would have been both landlocked and surrounded, bordered by no less than six surrounding nation-states. Majorozag, Hungary, Transylvania, to be united and recognized as an independent Zekli or Zekler homeland in order to provide a buffer state between fractious Hungary and Romania, Romania itself, Bulgaria, Serbia, and Krvatska, Croatia. The United Banachkin population base, depleted of its Volksdeutsch, or Germanic peoples, and swollen as it was to become with such territorial acquisitions, was to be awarded in toto as blood chattel to the newly established Vefernation, a Vefer demon nation state, that was fully expected to confront the new post-war European order of the Third Reich triumphant with both the challenges and opportunities of coexistence concomitant to humanity's first ever internationally recognized state ruled by a non-human intelligence and sustaining itself literally on the lifeblood of its subject populations. And thenceforth, the bargaining. There were consistent assertions albeit scattered far and wide, among the multitudinous volumes of World War II-era military intelligence documents that I was ordered to destroy, which stipulated that in return for the consolidation of a trans national homeland for Europe's Vanfodima, to be christened the Viavoidate, the old liturgical Slavonic term for princely generalissimi, the European equivalent of a Japanese shogunate, this Vyavyodinate of Vyamfian, literally blood monstrum. Adolf Hitler was expected in return of voluntary Vyamfianese, that would be their national name identifying these peoples, transliterally blood monstrumese. He was expected of their voluntary participation in non lethal German medical research into the Vanfordemic evolutionary condition that would ultimately gift himself with vanfordization so that he could conceivably with continued genetic improvements already sourcing from radical german experimentation on human test subjects both willing and unwilling that were producing biogenic advances promising the potential trebling of either humic either humanic or vanfordic lifespans that their rule could extend over a thousand years of the millennial Reich itself, 
It be irrefutable historical fact that Adolf Hitler underwent an inordinate amount of blood work. Blood works via transfusion, ever increasing in proportion towards der Gottodämmerung, the twilight of the gods, that Errol did the great dislocation of the failed Reich from European soil. Hitler's personal physician, Dr. Theodore Morelli, became very secretive regards to Führer's conditions, beginning on the 26th of April in 1944, distinctly because Hitler's all too obvious diurnal dysrhythmia, daylight dysfunctionality, was already a factor around which the Allies had been blatantly formulating their combined military strategies. That's where the myth evolves that the Allies were able to succeed at D-Day because Hitler slept late. All of this is, of course, entirely untrue in the sense of presenting, misrepresenting Adolf Hitler as lax in his duties to his nation, his state, and his peoples. But it was most certainly true that Adolf Hitler was someone who didn't sleep in the human sense of slumber rhythms. Hence, diurnal dysrhythmia, daylight dysfunctionality. By December 11th, 1944, Dr. Theo Morel entered into Hitler's medical records, which are available for public review that Der Führer's urine was beer brown, approaching the phosphorescent purple, but lacking the taint of rabies that was subject to the agenital rabid porphyria, meaning non-cogenital, actually human-transmitted rabid porphyria that the Russians has experienced that killed 12 million people but in a controlled medical sense of application that was instead of rendering Adolf Hitler's condition subhuman, helping him become superhuman. Now, decades into what was then the future, I myself would personally incinerate around half a dozen separately sourced reports which had filtered out of Festung Europa, Fortress Europe, during that time frame. Reports which insisted that the Führer of the Reich, tremulous with Parkinsonian symptoms, was only playing the role of the literally shrinking sick old man of Berlin, utilizing to the fullest both the distortions of the cameras and the acting skills in which he had been so masterfully coached by the Jewish mass mentalist, the theatrical stage magician, Erich Jan Hanussen, born Heinrich Steinschneer. A man, of course who was missing via being, quote-unquote, murdered via the Reich's Identity Protection Program. A man spared the fires of the Holocaust, relocated himself to an area of the world God knows where, after having performed as Adolf Hitler's double on a number of occasions, to portray an ailing Fuhrer while Adolf Hitler danced the night away with his young mistress, Ava. Erich Jan Hanussen had served Adolf Hitler during the early days of Der Kampfzeit, the Nazis' party's time of struggle prior to popular mandate. And in the psychological profile of Adolf Hitler conducted by the OSS, the Office of Strategic Services, the forerunner of the Central Intelligence Agency, the CIA itself, published in 1943 through 1944, it states, and I quote us directly, including the misspelling per the original OSS text of Eric Van Hanusen's name, which is spelled correctly, H-A-N-U-S-S-E-N. They spelled it Hamison, H-A-M-I-S-S-E-N. It states in this work before me, during the early 1920s, Hitler took regular lessons in speaking and in mass psychology from a man named Hamison, who was also a practicing astrologer and fortune teller. He was an extremely clever individual who taught Hitler a great deal concerning the importance of staging meetings to obtain the greatest dramatic effect. Then, back in 1945, 
on the setting stage of the great Nazi twilight on the continent of Europe. In the final performance of Adolf Hitler's whirlwind European tour, he was pretending to be sick and in despair and to be contemplating suicide, presenting what the Russians call a false face, a maskarovka, actually used by the communist reports, even though they propagandized they had found his body. And it turned out the teeth and the bones were genetically identified as belonging to a female. Decades later, they actually took a woman and said it was Adolf Hitler because Adolf Hitler, like myself, had always been a feat and rather effeminate. Some might call him the first emo child. But not only was Adolf Hitler personifying Moskorovka to his enemies, but also to his immediate inner circle of leadership, even to his Volk, his peoples, yet actually betraying a physically inhuman level of hyperactivity on unguarded moments. People said he was the most hyperactive individual they had ever run across, who never seemed to tire. Hardly something to gel with that which we are told was what he had become. Obviously energetic enough to take on a fresh and fertile young bride, Eva Anna Paula Braun Hitler. And yet, all the allegations of his play acting, emerging exclusively out of foreign, including Deutsch, or German resistance movements supported by the United Nations, were always contemptuously dismissed by their contemporary American analysts as delusional exercises in resurgent continental European hysterias, mass oppression-induced medievalist regressions worthy of nothing other than professional derision. But Adolf Hitler, of course, escaped. Into Uterland with his bride. And, of course, as he be vampirized, certainly was displaying the beginning stages thereof while on the surface world. There may be opportunity yet that I will meet my biological father. So with that, we're at the bottom of the hour. I'll let it go for now. Bless all those who side beside me and who stand behind me. Damn all those who stand against me or before me. And join us again on Wednesday night. We're starting. Okay, we are starting live stream. We're going to allow Mr. Pavel Edward to um, go into his adventures over the weekend. And uh, I'll just be kind of sitting back, really, and not saying much. He'll carry us essentially to the top of the hour. Uh, or he's welcome to. Okay, very good. Uh, so well, I, I mean, think... I mean, we don't need to fill in an airtime, of course. We could just hang around. I'm just waiting for the link. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, the link. I'm sorry. I'm Did glad you, you always I... remind me because I, I, like, sit here and I go, oh, they have... <laughs> I get a chance to talk <laughs> and then I forget to give you the link. <laughs> okay, just one moment here. It's coming. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's fine. That's, um, I understood. Right, Understandable. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so link is yours and uh, okay. I'm going to just take over for a moment for a couple for a few minutes and uh, bring people up to date. Sure. Um, I did see. last time I, I listened to you. It's actually difficult to hear me, so uh, I will attempt to speak up. And um, I went into the whole uh, Huawei and I mentioned that somebody from Canada was, uh, uh, you know, had, was defending um, Ms. Wang Zhao. And uh, actually, so that, that story, I have a bit more about it. It's, it was J Jim McCollum. I don't have my browser open. I wasn't ready quick for that yet. Um, here, let me see if I can find it. But... J I think his name is Jim McCollum. McCollum is the last name, and I'll look up his first name. Uh, he was, he was uh, as of last week still, he was the uh, amb Canadian ambassador to China. 
And uh, over the weekend, because uh, of his secondary comments, which he made, uh, I think, on Saturday. Uh, what's today? Sunday? I think he made them Friday, possibly. He, he said that uh, it would be good if America withdrew their... Um, their uh, order, their um, if uh, this what is it called? Um, if they withdrew, if they withdrew their uh, extradition, extradition, extradition thank order. you, thank you, extradition request. And uh, after that, uh, so I saw it in the today. It came out that he was asked to resign, based basically that most people think it's that last comment that really did him in. Oh. Uh, so. Uh, so Canada has essentially taken out their uh, ambassador to China. So Canada is in a bit of a, a strange situation in that they, uh, you know, they, they're having problems with Saudi Arabia. Uh, they're now uh, quite, uh, quite set themselves against China. A lot of the things are falling apart. And uh, a few other countries now <laughs> that Canada's having a tough time with. Uh, Brazil, I think, is one of them as well now. Uh, but the good news is that uh, the Japanese spoke up about this, which they rarely do. They they've kind of watched from the sidelines, and they you know they they don't actually comment. But uh, the Japanese, I think it is the Japanese ambassador to Canada that's here now that the TPP is in effect. Uh, a, a lot of Japanese are beginning to invest in Canada. Uh, they're buying up farmland and or you know, joining in the farming and that. I, I don't know what the actual circumstances are. But uh, Canada is beginning to uh, slowly feel the effects. And uh, the Japanese ambassador stressed that this is something to definitely look into. And he said that his, this is I'm paraphrasing now, is he says, use, don't, don't do, to cut off, not to cut off, but to, uh, to not look to try and uh, hold negotiations with China over this. That the, he's not surprised by the result and the, what China has done, but he's saying look to the TPP and your new allies to actually get some leverage on China, which I think are pretty wise words and something that I personally deduced uh, from the whole situation and would have advised the same. And in fact, I've actually I think even tweeted that to the prime minister uh, at one point. Uh, uh, otherwise, though, uh, cool. yeah, I mean, it, it really is. This this is what the TPP was designed to do is to, you know, this is why Donald Trump is stupid for uh, not not going through with it because he would have had the leverage he needed for China. And now the Japanese ambassador, they he said, yes, it is rare for us to actually yeah. speak to these situations. But, you know, this is this is what it's like to have friends. And he said Japan has the third biggest economy in the world next after China and the USA. And uh, they're. And he says that the Japanese are very going to start looking into Canada now a lot more, uh, thanks to the TPP. So that that was one update that I wanted to do. Uh, I uh, let's see here if I can. I do believe his name was Jim McCollin. Anyhow, so that was that was kind of like just uh, a bit of business. Otherwise, uh, I did. It was quite a snowy. It was minus twenty here overnight, uh, and uh, this morning I got up in or morning I got up in the afternoon, <laughs> stayed up watching the snowfall. And uh, yesterday I went for a hike in the snow, uh, as I love snow. And uh, today I got my snowboard up and uh, I drove here just uh, across the valley here and uh, did a few few runs and number of falls. <laughs> And uh, sort of, uh, what do you call that? Um, did some, uh, well, you know, put, put myself through a bit of punishment, uh, getting my snowboard out and that. So I had a bit of fun and uh, I was looking and so, oh. so I'm all energized to like for tonight. Um, otherwise, over the week, I've had a like a week to myself here f uh, finally and um so I've been watching um, and kind of catching up on strange things, uh, other things. One, I've gone through the background uh, of uh, Ms. Ocasio-Cortez, the congresswoman, the congressperson, uh, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. The nice thing about her is I was interested as to how she actually got inspired into politics and how she went on to run for it. And uh, the really good things in, about uh, this type of research is that when she did uh, the group she was involved with and the people that stood behind her 
they she, they publicized a lot as in they recorded a lot she was on radio shows and so she's very articulate uh, which is one of the things the media loves uh, is that is that she's left quite a lot of documented uh, 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 material uh, about and so i reviewed quite a bit about her and so i've learned quite a bit more about how she managed to uh, get queens in brooklyn uh, behind her and how she actually won against uh, uh, jim i think his name was jim crowley too that she defeated uh, now i didn't know he was a democrat i thought she def defeated a republican so that for me that was uh, interesting in and of itself what i like about what i think is important about mm -hmm. uh, ocasio cortez and how she ended up getting into politics is i mean she you know she she's a scientist so she takes this kind of scientific uh, approach to it and uh, being uh, objective she manages to take apart um, the various the, the institutions and essentially articulate it in such a way that it really cuts through but uh, she she is definitely a person that did it from the ground up i mean this is this would be for me this is the definition of grassroots but she didn't do it all alone. Uh, people can look up. She was, uh, she, with, with, who stood behind her is a small organization of, I think, it would seem to be like four or five people. And they're they, they, uh, they they're a small group, uh, like a community organizing group for Democrats. And they helped her to prepare. They, they, uh, they did strategy for her and so on. So it, it's not, it wasn't a completely alone thing as... Uh, I hope people didn't think that it was just her alone. There is always people behind, you know, great people. So uh, uh, I don't. I'm not going to talk about it further. But what I do encourage people is to do look up if they if they do want to know what it's like to go, f uh, you know, f uh, go essentially stand up for working class people, which is what uh, her platform is um, or her her mandate. It's quite inspiring. I mean, I was on the verge of tears when I started hearing some of the first interviews that were quite lengthy. Uh, she She's quite public. She does a lot of, uh, you know, she gets quite engaged into uh, politics on the ground. And uh, she talks about very much what she had to do and what the key, uh, uh, key strategy was for her to actually uh, get the votes to beat Jim Crowley, despite the fact that they were... Out, uh, out money ten to one at least. Uh, so very, very inspirational. I do encourage people to look it up. The only thing I found about uh, Ocasio Cortez is uh, the one thing that I would quib over. Somebody kind of asked her a leading question about the TPP and the uh, and uh, NAFTA, the new NAFTA deal, um, which is the North American Free Trade Agreement, though it's been renamed a bit. Same thing. She. They, they asked her, you know, if she is right. the, the leading question was that they sort of assumed that she would be against this. Uh, and she I think I don't know if she took the bait or if she herself really feels that strongly about it. She defended trade deals in general, but she said she was not really happy with free trade or the, the NAFTA deal or TPP. Uh, and she explained it a bit, but uh, I don't think it was as well thought out that maybe there's more to it. So that was that was my one sort of thing where I think she something that hopefully she'll think about a bit more in the future or have a chance to expand upon. Anyhow, um, other than that, I also watched a lot of uh, Jap Japanese anime. Uh, I just uh, just before uh, because I got access to Netflix right now, so I just took in a little bit, not a whole lot, but. Uh, I ended up watching, um, and I'll explain why I'm even mentioning this, uh, uh, some, some interesting things that I noticed. I haven't really watched much in the last 10, 15 years. I haven't seen too many shows or episodes. I, I barely, you know, I, I barely know that, know that Pokemon exists and a few other Naruto and that. But I don't, I don't seek it out. I don't, I, it's just too much time. <laughs> uh, but since I had a week, I took in and uh, I was actually quite amazed as to... What I appreciated, okay, so I, I've seen what was uh, Godzilla 3, uh, so I, I ended up watching that. I ended up watching something <laughs> called Knights of Sidonia. Uh, a lot of these, I love these space adventures that, 
you know, where they they essentially are uh, part of uh, the metal armor. They, they manage to like take their psyche and transpose it into the metal armor and do mining and have various wars and that a lot of mech mech type stuff. But um, the the what, what I was impressed with is that in the story, even in Godzilla, well, two things that really impressed me. One is that they really expand and they use the the language of like physics they really get into what what's going on with the various energy transfers in the fights between godzilla and this big monster you know it, it they did the slow mos and explained it and, and the characters were explaining exactly what type of energy transfer is going on and so on i'm like going wow this is like this is pretty good if uh, you're someone young watching this i can see how people would get inspired to actually like study science study physics study biology and so on so that's one thing that really impressed me. The other is that they, I, I watched actually just before uh, the, we went live. The last thing I watched was something called Full Metal Alchemist. And I watched the first two episodes. And in there, for instance, they, what I like about these is they're not shy to go into the uh, sort of the Axis history. Uh, even in Godzilla, they, I realized that really what they're dealing with is... Uh, uh, Things that we talk about, that you talk about, Douglas, actually, is uh, things like, you know, what happened uh, yeah. during the Holocaust. Like, they, they subtly get that in, and that discussion is in there. They talk about mass number of people dying, you know, and what it means. And these discussions, they're part of it. This whole, this, um, like, even in Full Metal Alchemist, for instance, the, the, the person that's running the army, they call him the Fuhrer. Like, straight out, you know, they don't they don't mince around like they don't they don't have this uh, what i would call this i don't know if it's political correctness you know not to mention the or uh, reticence or, uh, yeah yeah like they don't have to be derogatory about uh what happened in second world war like they, they don't have any of this the, the history doesn't seem to be there that that's really like overcome america and the west and you know the british propaganda the russian propaganda and american propaganda that's gone on since world war ii against against the axis against someone like adolf hitler against emperor hirohito and so on uh, which is you know it's the, the, i grew up like where i grew up in the, the communist czech republic i know when i was young uh, a few things that really struck me uh, there were um, that you know I, I personally, I feel like I was almost like programmed by the media to be the enemy of America. I know that when um, when I was going to like yes. grade school, some of the sayings we as kids, we would say, uh, you know, they were against Adolf Hitler. They were against the president of the USA. We had these saying, you know, like to whatever, to, whenever you make fun of somebody, it would be against the president of the USA. We would say because it rhymes in Czech, we would say the president of the USA is a goose, you know, and we would laugh at that. <laughs> we think it's funny, but I realized this like through Ru <laughs> Russia, I, I'm not, I wouldn't be, when I heard, um, what is it? Dmitry Kazilov, I think he's called. Um, he was, uh, he worked in Russia. He was in the military that, and I heard him speaking. He was, he became quite famous because he blew the whistle on uh, what happened in 9-11 or at least, most people sort of take it aside as a theory, but when I heard him speak, I, I pretty well figured out that he was onto you know these guys when they talk rationally, they are actually quite rational. It's, and he found out that uh, he's famous because he introduced the the notion that nuclear bombs were used to take down the World Trade Centers. But uh, when I heard him speaking, uh, I realized that yeah. this is how they in Russia, this is how they grew up is they uh, you know they they always laugh at america and they always fig try and figure out how to take it down and how they're better and so on it's just feeding themselves but that's how it is um oh gee it's six after two eight <laughs> and i'm still talking i haven't even checked the live stream um so anyhow that's that's, that's been my uh that's been my week in my day in my last two days and so these are some of the things that were on my mind so I thought I would share that. Now I'm going to, uh, let me see here. Okay, so I'm going to get to the live I hope we're on here. Yeah. So, yes. Oh, we, wow, well, we got a full house. <laughs> well, people are hearing you. People are hearing you. Yeah, people are hearing me. Yeah. Okay, excellent. Yeah. So, um, yeah. So, you're doing great. So, I'm doing great. Excellent. Yeah. Um, 
So I hope that it came through. These were just a bit, bit of a, a bit of a jumping around. So uh, I apologize for that. I didn't really keep uh, totally on point. But um, yeah, some of the things that struck me that really relate to uh, what uh, what's been what has been presented, uh, you know, for quite some time now. So um, I'm happy to hand it over to yourself, yes. and uh, I will set it up so that your audio is coming through. Which seems to be fine. And I'm going to go mute. And it's all Fabulous. yours, Douglas.